good afternoon everyone we will be starting in another 5 to 10 minutes thank you ठीक है
Good afternoon, everyone. I welcome you all on behalf of Medanta to our two-day national conference endorsed by SGEI, New Paradigm in Third Space Endoscopy. I now invite Dr. Rajesh Puri, our Senior Director, Hepatobiliary Institute, Medanta, and our course director to welcome our dignitaries. Uh, thank you, Dr. Asta. Uh, welcome to all faculty and the delegates. And the entire program for two days we have planned in such a way that there should be a dedicated teaching rather than showing the strength. The plan is to demonstrate the technique. So we start like before doing third space endoscopy, what is needed in the form of NBI, manometry, and then we will show the live demonstration. And tomorrow we have how I do it, each procedures, and we kept a significant long time for the discussion also. So it is not the run-run conference. Uh, all delegates feel free to ask any question if they want. I apologize for the delay in the rooms because of the COVID, they have to sanitize and it takes two to three hours, but you all will get the room. Those who have still not got the room, in between they can go and they can uh, go to their rooms. And I would like to invite Dr. Sooth to say a few words. And then after that, we will start our program. And the faculty for the live demonstration, I think after the Dr. Sood uh, uh, words, we can move to the medicity and Dr. Mohan will come after his lecture. Dr. Sood, please. Thanks Rajesh and welcome to you all. And particularly my friends sitting in the front row who have come all the way from busy schedules to you know, give lectures or do demonstrations and do the teaching program tomorrow. I really appreciate uh, your involvement and I, uh, I want to tell you that this meeting is solely organized and uh, uh, with the efforts of uh, Rajesh Puri. I'm just uh, standing here in front of you. He's now the, the person who has organized it and he, I am sure he has done a wonderful job and uh, he has uh, gone, uh, taken great pains to ensure that the program is well run and uh, you people are comfortable. So uh, the third space endoscopy, I have a very little role to play. So I'll uh, hand it over to the learned colleagues and uh, I think the opening batsman is Naresh Bhatt. <laughs> so it's, it's a descending order from eight. <laughs> so Rajesh. Who is comparing? Thank you, Dr. Puri. Thank you, Dr. Sood. Moving on to the first component of the day, we begin with a series of lectures and discussions on prerequisites concepts required before deep diving into third space endoscopy. I now invite Dr. Naresh Bhatt, Chief of Gastroenterology and Hepatology at Astra CMI Hospital, Bangalore, to start us off with narrowband imaging in the GI tract. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. And at the outset, I'd like to thank uh, Rajesh and Radhir for having me here. Uh, and to kick off the meeting with, as I said, the, know the basics. So I'm going to talk to you about NBI and its role uh, before you start resection. So if I were to do a resection, what are the, what are the information that one would need? One, of course, is you have to detect a lesion. So is there a lesion? Is it epithelial or subepithelial? Is it neoplastic or non-neoplastic? Because obviously if it is non-neoplastic, you may not be keen on resecting it, doesn't need resection. Is there deep submucosal invasion? And finally, can I, when I resect it, can I get an R0 resection in terms of the horizontal margin as well? So lesion detection, uh, if you look at just plain white light endoscopy, 
it's not easy to pick up where the lesion is. It takes some effort, and here you can find the lesions here hiding there. There's subtle changes in the texture, color that you have to pick up. And so the first message is lesion detection is not something that NBI is going to play a role. Lesion detection has to be by white light endoscopy, good quality endoscopy, good quality endoscopes and monitors, and a lot of patients with a clean field. So lesion detection requires patience. Now, which of these are you going to resect? Are you going to resect this? Are you going to resect this, this, or this? Now, all of you would say that, yes, all of them look resectable. But certainly, this one is sub-epithelium. And you're not going to go and treat it like a routine kind of polyp or try and do an ESD or something there. So to recognize whether it is a resectable lesion or not, Again, you need good white light endoscopy, some amount of experience, and NBI does help. Because if it is subepithelial, the surrounding epithelium looks the same as what is covering. So if it's an epithelial lesion, you generally have a change in that. So there's a line of demarcation. So when we talk about line of demarcation, we are trying to emphasize that is an epithelial lesion. Now, again, does do all of these lesions merit resection and can they be safely done? Yes, here you look at the lesion and I'm sure all of you are experienced enough to tell me that this looks an advanced lesion. I'm not going to resect it. While this, yes, may be something that I can get rid of. This looks flat and maybe this can be resected. But no, this is an esophageal lesion. While it looks flat, you find that there's almost no vascularity over it. Now, this is a sign of deep submucosal invasion. While here, this is much bigger, more bumpy. But if you look at the pattern here, to me, this is epithelial and suggests possibly just low-grade dysplasia. So we have a lot of decision-making to be done before we just go ahead and put our knives or our snares. And for this, we need to understand what the epithelium looks like, what does it look like normally, what does it look like in the lesion, and then take decisions. Again, this is a flat lesion, but here, if you look at the vascularity between here and here, there's a difference. So while these look almost the same initially to the untrained eye, here, if you look at these vessels, this clearly tells me that this is an esophageal lesion, but this is advanced. This is what we call a B3 lesion with deep submucosal invasion. And this is something that you send for surgery or uh, curative RT. They're likely to have lymph node metastasis. So one must familiarize ourselves with how the lesions look. So is it epithelial? Is it neoplastic? Is there this submucosal invasion? So those are the questions that we need to answer. So in the esophagus, we realize that the IPCLs, these are almost normal looking. Here they are a little more prominent, but these are called the type A IPCLs, which is benign disease, which can be normal or with some inflammation. Now, the same IPCLs, here there are two things happening. One is that there is a kind of a line of demarcation between the lesion and the surrounding mucosa. And those same IPCLs are looking a little plumper, bigger, darker. So there's a little change in shape, and this is called B1 which is a still that loop-like appearance is still there. And this suggests that there may be a superficial mucosal disease itself. So there's a neoplastic lesion 
involving the superficial layers. And this is B2, where those loops are no longer there, and they are more looking longer, larger, darker. And so these are B2, which is means that it's deeper or involving the superficial submucosal layer. So this is still a lesion that you can try and do an ESD. While a B3, which I showed you previously, you can see these thick vessels. Now these are very revealing and tell us that uh, tell us that uh, we are dealing with a deeper lesion, and hence they should not be attempted to try and do an EST. So by NBI, these are all NBI pictures. What are you able to make out? You're able to make out the horizontal margin. You're able to predict what is the depth of involvement. And you obviously know that this is a neoplasm. And therefore, you can use this classification very effectively in your practice. I'm sorry. Is that if it's type A, you don't do anything. If it's a type B1, there's an absolute indication for endoscopic resection. B2 is a relative indication, but B3 is an absolute contraindication. So this is something that you have to familiarize yourself before you attempt endoscopic therapy. Now, these are the so-called avascular areas. Now, if you look at these areas, there are no vessels here. There's a much larger avascular area. And this is the same lesion that I showed you earlier, which is almost totally avascular. The bigger the avascular area, the likelihood that the lesion is involving the submucosa or deeper. So a more aggressive lesion would have more avascular areas. So apart from the IPCLs, the avascular areas also are important. This, just to recapitulate what it shows. So we have a kind of classification available, the Japanese A and B. A, B1, B2, B3, and the avascular areas. That is for the squamous um, cancers in the esophagus. Now, what about the lateral margin assessment? Uh, a lot of times, the Japanese people have told us the usefulness of Lugol's. Very useful when we did not have these advanced endoscopes and Lugol's, you would have this Lugol wide lesion, which tells you that there's a suspicious lesion and you could interrogate it. If we want to resect, you could easily make your marking around here and resect it well. So if there's just one lesion, you can use that to mark your boundaries. But sometimes you find multiple local void lesions, and there's a whole lot of confusion, in which case you depend on NBI to predict your margin of resection. So we know the vertical depth, we know when to stop, and we know what is the horizontal margin if you can take a margin here, you'll be fairly comfortable in doing a complete resection. Coming to Barrett's again, this is a classification called the Nottingham classification. It tells you just by looking at it, these are the round uh, kind of surface pattern. These are the villiform or gyriform pattern. These are non-neoplastic, but this is the classical specialized intestinal mucosa. Here, you're not seeing the surface pattern, just seeing the vessels. This is indeterminate. A lot of this is actually intestinal metaplasia. But here, you have definite neoplastic, irregular vessels, irregular mucosa, uh, surface pattern. So even in Barrett's, NBI can tell you whether, yes, is there Barrett's? Two, is it likely to be neoplastic or not? Is there intestinal metaplasia? And if it's neoplastic, you can make a fair assessment uh, of the lesion. And a combination of good white light endoscopy and the Paris kind of classification, if you have a very nodular, larger lesion, you know that it is more aggressive and going deeper down. But if it's a more type 2A or 02B lesion, flat lesion, uh, with this kind of morphology, you can go ahead with the endoscopic resection. Again, if you look at the Barrett's mucosa, you can see how high definition and magnification endoscopy with the NBI 
as you look at the lovely pattern that you see of these diriform, like this is specialized intercellular metaplasia. And here you can appreciate these irregular vessels. This is very early, uh, you know, sort of dysplastic lesion. This may be low grade to high grade, high grade, definitely high grade uh, dysplasia and Barrett's. And you can make out the lateral margins. So you can clearly just do a, a resection using um, a kind of band ligation and resection of that area. Coming to the stomach, yes, you have a lot of lesions. You know, they can be as tiny as these, can be a little more obvious. And as I said, detection is still a job that you have to do with white light endoscopy. NBI does not do a great job of picking up lesions. The reason is that the field becomes much darker. So it's like going into a dark room with a torch and trying to search for something you have dropped. You can't find it unless you know that you've dropped it just near the podium and you search there. So if you have an idea where you have to look for, then you can use NBI. Therefore, NBI does not substitute for good white light endoscopy for lesion detection. So look at this lesion. This is a little lobulated lesion there. I mean, a lot of us would say, yes, this looks red, maybe an hyperplastic lesion. But when you use NBIC, what happens? There's a line of demarcation. This is different from this. So you know that this is an epithelial lesion. Something in the epithelium, which is a little polypoidal, and then when you put NBI and magnification, you can find out these abnormal vessels and clearly say this is something beyond an adenoma. So this is a kind of polypoidal variety of early gastric cancer. So maybe a high-grade dysplasia or even cancer, an early niche, of course. So this is the classical uh, uh, sort of algorithm that they use. Look at, see, see if there's a demarcation line. If it's present, see if there's abnormal vascular pattern or surface pattern. If anything is there, then you call it cancer. If not, it is non-cancer. So fairly easy algorithm when you use to integrate a lesion. But this is actually one of Mohan's uh, pictures that is kind enough to lend it to me because he used these fancy scopes. And see how beautiful you can see the lesion. You can make out the line of demarcation. You can make out that these vessels are definitely abnormal. And the margin also is very clear. I'm sure Mohan would have resected, just put markings all around here and resected it quite easily. The video which is there, but I, I think I'll skip that. So when you see a lesion in the stomach, you want to know where to put your margins, how are you going to resect it? Do I put the margin here, here, here? Here it may be a little more obvious, but when you use NBI, you can see that the margin is much more obvious. So to look at the lateral margins or the horizontal extent of the lesion, NBI does come in useful. However, traditionally, even in Japan, they use dye-based chromoendoscopy to look at these lesions especially with the previous generation of endoscopes. But recent uh, study showed that there's no great difference between chroma endoscopy and magnificent NBI. And you could use them to either of these techniques to decide the margin for resection. So here, as I said, again, detection, white light, characterization, and understanding the horizontal margin NBI is useful. Coming to the colon, we have now three lesions here, all three polyps. What are you going to resect? Are you going to resect all of them, leave some of them? And if you're trained, you'd realize that this, it looks like a nice one or a hyperplastic polyp. This looks again, doesn't have too many vessels, but these is a typical serrated polyp. And this is a classical nice two or an adenomatous polyp. All flat lesions, but you can use NBI 
to predict what the histology is. This you may leave alone if it's in the rectum. This you'll definitely may do a cold snare polypectomy, but this again, you may do a, some kind of an EMR to have the complete resection. Now, this is a lesion that picked up in the sigmoid 15 mm flat lesion. One has uh, not really flat, it's a sign. And you find these abnormal vessels. So what are you going to do? Is this cancer? Is it deep submucous invasion? Send for surgery, dissect? What are we going to do? This is the problem with JNA2B, and this is one of the limitations of NBI, is that when you have a JNA2B, where the vessels are a little irregular, you can be have low grade dysplasia, you can have high grade dysplasia, you can have superficial submucosal invasion or even frank cancer with deep invasion. So this is a very dicey group of lesions and the histology may be very variable. And hence, you still need to use chromoendoscopy to find out the surface pattern, whether regular or irregular, to predict whether you can go ahead with an ESD or the patient needs surgery. But if you look at the factors that are associated with subucous invasion, the biggest odds ratio is looking at the kudo pit pattern. So you have to be familiar with kudo pit pattern, in the, even if you use NBI routine, especially in these difficult cases. So finally, what are the limitations of NBI in our practice in the stomach, the undifferentiated early gastric cancers look pale. They are slightly below the surface and spread below the surface. So you can have a lot of problems in looking at the margins. You have some other histological types. In the esophagus, if they have a lot of keratinization, the vessels may not be seen very well. The brownish coloration, discoloration that you see may not be well appreciated and you can miss lesions or misinterpret the margins. And as I said, in uh, JNA2B, you can have a problem of diagnostic accuracy. So just to summarize, if you put white light is, as our basic kind of modality, NBI detection, no great help, but tremendous difference in characterization. You can characterize a lesion and have a lot of confidence in predicting what the lesion is. Depth, it is reasonably good. Margin assessment, pretty good. But chromo is some, if you do not have access to great quality endoscopes, you can make do with chromo for detection. There's some benefit, especially in the colon. Characterization as well as margins are very well made out. So therefore, if you have NBI, use it well. If you don't have NBI with great quality, scopes that you will have to still invest in time to do chromo endoscopy. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fett, for a uh, great talk. Uh, one of the problem in patients with malignancy, if they have recurrence, if they have uh, prior radiotherapy, Will this uh, NBI uh, system work in such cases prior to uh, re resection? Because many times we are referred patients with a small recurrence who had a radiation done in that area. And then how do we decide? We get a MRI done. Is there any role of uh, NBI in that yeah, situation? See, in, when you have recurrences, there are two or three kinds of recurrences. One of them is a recurrence in a scar. You've done a polypectomy and you're following that patient. In a scar recurrence, there's definitely a role of NBI and you can pick up those small lesions as they recur. But when you have radiation, the problem, the biggest problem of NBI is this relative lack of uh, you know, usefulness when you have inflammation and ulceration. Because radiation also gives rise to some amount of angiogenesis. And there's inflammation, radiation, uh, related inflammation is there. So it would not be a very good modality post radiotherapy. So those are the kind of challenges. Thank you. Someone more question? 
in uh, for the ordinary regions what do you think sir role of nbi and when you will complement it with eus in which type of regions nbi see the question is us is uh, certainly useful to assess what is the depth of the lesion as a complementary therapy but a lot of times we don't use us because it's difficult to use you need to use a mini probe if you have to use and surface assessment is almost as good as us so most experienced endoscopists across the world use uh, eus in a sort of as a additional modality when they have difficult but not as a routine in duodenum you can make out the same thing you can assess almost similar rules that we use for the colon you can make out the margins where well. you can predict the uh, degree of uh, you know invasiveness on uh, nbi and magnification endoscopy it's almost the same as colon. Thank you, Dr. Bhatt. Line B. Next in line, we have uh, motility testing for third space intervention, implication methods, and beyond. To deliver this talk, we have Dr. Jubin Dev Sharma, who is from uh, Medanta Institute and who is master of motility and uh, doing this, uh, working in this field for a long time. Dr. Jubin, please. Thank you, ma'am. And I thank all the moderators for uh, being here with us. So uh, before we start about motility, you know, we are here, we talk about space and third space. So let me take you to a journey where we all love our space missions like our scientists. But like any space missions, you know, we need to have our, our testing and our preparation well done. So why do we need motility? So motility is a roadmap for you, particularly when we talk about spastic esophagus disorders, uh, gastroparesis, and other similar conditions. It's a physiology behind the anatomy. It's a science behind the art. And it's a method behind the madness that we all want to be when we talk about third space interventions. So what are the indications where we can use motility in our third space work? Primarily used for the spastic disorders of the esophagus. There are some gastric interventions, and now even PREM or the rectal interventions. So for esophagus, we have the manometry, both high resolution and high definition. And we also have the endoflip, which has come up. For gastric interventions, you know, classically we had the gastric emptying time, but also now electrogastrography or EGG has come up a lot. And finally, we also have the anterodurinal manometry. And obviously if we can do in rectal manometry if we have to look into the picture for a ultra short Hirschsprung. This is for the diagnostic part. Even when you talk about post interventions, you again have to come back and rely on your motility testing if you really want to see the outcomes. It's not just that we do the procedure and that work is done. You have to come back, assess them at three months, six months, maybe a year, because ecclesia is not a one time job. The disease will eventually progress. And obviously, you have to look for complications like reflux disease, again, which you have to rely on motility or uh, pH metry. So let's talk about esophagus a bit. We all have this beautiful, colorful diagrams we see in our world, but to get this picture done, you need to have an accurately done esophageal manometry with correctly aligned equipment. And why I say so, because it is very, very sensitive. If your system is not working well, if you are not skilled enough, you will not get good, meaningful clinical goals. So in my practice, I make sure all my manometers are done ourselves and not relying on somebody else's uh, values. So, Manometry is a legacy by Dr. Ray Klaus. He very clearly you know, saw all those Himalayas from way up in the flights, and he used those topographic plots and the color coding that we see for heights and tried to apply it onto our esophageal re readings. And that's why we got this kind of a picture where warm colors show you a higher pressures and the cooler colors show you a lower pressures. And this is what we all see when we do a manometry, all these values, they may be confusing in the beginning, but let me tell you, once we start understanding them, it's not that complicated. This is the outline of Chicago. And for everybody who works in neurogastroenterology, Chicago means a lot because we begin with this, we begin with Chicago classification, and now it is into its fourth iteration. And in the fourth iteration, there are a few modifications. I'm not going to go into the details of every algorithm, but I'll just touch on a few points. So we have all seen this in various articles, in various books. Uh, we all diagnose using this Chicago. But what I want to really 
tell you is once we see all these beautiful diagrams of high resolution or high definition of normal or a type three or a type one, what we have to understand is that it's not just the value that we see in Chicago. It has to be much more than that. You can, it's a whole spectrum of motility. When we talk about IRP of 15, that is not an absolute value that we should be looking into. We have to see the whole reading, the whole picture together. So what are the changes? The changes are primarily in the methodology that you have to do both supine and upright swallows, particularly when there is a doubt of an EGG of low obstruction. There's a lot of role coming up now for provocative testing like MRS or RDS, where you need to see what happens when you give a challenge to the esophagus. But as I said, what is the biggest problem with Chicago is reading it in an absolute way. You can have ecclesia with low IRP, you can have a normal esophagus with high IRPs. You just need to correctly align and reassess the patient. So let me take you a bit beyond Chicago. We all are, we have read Chicago, but there are a few things that you need to know beyond. Jackhammer or a hypercontractile esophagus, we all have seen. It is, you know, given just a value of DCI more than 8,000 in our Chicago classification, but it's not just that. When you do manometrics, you can see a single peak, a multiple peak, or a prolonged uh, contraction. And when we see them, clinically, they mean a bit different. In young patients, you can have more chest pain with a single peak uh, hypercontractile. In elderly, you can have more of dysphagia with a multiple peak contraction. In last of our 35 cases, we have seen these kind of various spectrum when we, talk, when we test for hypercontractile esophagus. So it's not a single, just a DCI value when we talk about when we diagnose jackhammer. Further, we talk about DES. So DES and all these spastic disorder is a spectrum. They are not an isolation diagnosis. So this particular patient who came to me with progressive dysphagia and was normal, first doubt was of a DES, six months apart, he had progressed into full flow, EGG outflow obstruction. So disease progresses and on manometry, you can pick this up. These findings are not in Chicago. We will just see a diagnosis, but you can't see a progression. Then you should always go back and talk to your person who does your manometries. Why? Because if you don't understand the basic physiology behind and particularly cases like this, who was a type three ecclesia, and you will miss on few points because this patient came back to us with a, you know, from an outside poem and said that he now had dysphagia. We did his manometry. We found this thin band of muscle, which was still there, possibly not cut during the initial poem, or it had regrown back. Even on barium, it could be seen. So he was not okay for a redo poem. And we gave him PD5 inhibitors. The pressure zones were lost. For a short time, he actually did well, but eventually he would again need uh, a poem. Then every absent peristalsis, when you see in your practice, is may not be ecclesia. So why I'm showing this slide is because it was labeled as type one ecclesia, but with LDS not that being you know, hypertensive, you will pick up a lot of cases of scleroderma. So keep a lookout when you see a type one ecclesia. Now, what more can we tell you? We all know about LES and it is relatively easy to do LDS. When we talk about UES and you will see a lot of your practice in advanced third, uh, third space endoscopy practice, you will have a lot of patients who have dysphagia at the level of critical pharyngeus, and we keep on picking them. This is a UES manometry, and you can see there's an incomplete relaxation of the UES. There's a poor, poor uh, you know, wave coming down the pharynx. So this was a case of a cricopharyngeal ecclesia, and initially he was planned with dilatations. He did well, and now he is being offered a myotomy. It's one of the commonest causes you'll find in elderly. Let me show you a new you know, uh, term or new diagnosis called as a retrograde UES dysfunction syndrome. This only around case series have been shown and around 10 or 15 cases. So you have an inability to belch. It's a retrograde UES dysfunction. You can have chest pain or gurgling sound in the chest. And it again, is, UES is not opening for a, a reflux that is coming down from up from the stomach. And again, you can be solved by a Botox injection, dupricopharyngeus, or even a myotomy. Finally, a slide on the provocative measures. You can have normal endoscopy, normal manometry, and the moment you give them a challenge, they will show you a PEP-like picture. So these patients, you need to follow them up. They might require a poem later in the course after six or seven months. Again, position of a patient, supine, you may not suspect, you will see a normal swallow. As soon as you make them upright, 
you will see that they are fitting into EJG outflow. And these provocative positions and provocative measures are more important when it's not a clear cut case of ecclesia. And we, since we don't have endoflip as of now, we have to rely on our positioning and provocative testing. So talking about endoflip now, it still was trialed at AIG, so we would, we would know about it, but uh, it's still not yet in India. It's very costly as of now in the current values. So it's a system which has a three millimeter outer diameter. It's a basically a balloon which is attached with the sensors within, uh, which is in, in, infinitely compliant. You can pass this off around any LES or a pyloric opening or even any anastomosis. And what do you do with it? This is how you look into the various, this is the protocol. You pass the balloon across, you gradually increase the volume and you look into the distensibility index and the anti-grade contractions. I'll just show you a slide. There's something called the rule of six. A rule of six is if you have six consecutive anti-grade contractions, six centimeter in length and six cycles regular per minute, that is normal. And this in a study it was shown that almost always seen in, in normal controls and never in ecclesia. So when the end of flip comes, it will be expensive, but if you can use it, it is very a good tool in particularly in cases where things are not crystal clear. This is, these are the various patterns you can see while you are doing endoflip for ecclesia patients. So just a one slide on what, how they are different. A flip uh, penometry is a response to distension. So you're looking at secondary peristalsis, whereas a manometry is looking at primary peristalsis. So they are complementary. They are not competitive. They're not going to come as a replacement for it. So coming down, down the GI tract, we come to our stomach. What we have, we have gastric emptying time, we have electrogastrography, and we have enterodurnal manometry now available. So this just came, you know, I think one week ago. This was the first pilot randomized sham control trial for gastroparesis using GPOM. And what they used was only gastric emptying time. The problem with gastric emptying time is 15 to 20% of your functional dyspepsia patient may still have a delayed gastric emptying time. And that is not a diagnosis, still not a gold standard for that. But yes, they did show a good results with GPOM, which was sustained over a period of time. So what more, since we can't only rely on GES, what more we can do? We can do electrogastrography, and it's actually a good tool to identify cases which will do well with GPOM. There are believers and non-believers with EGG. There are a lot of you know, issues that people say it's not a very good tool. But I'm a believer in that, and I think there are enough studies now which say it correlates with your full thickness biopsy and the number of ICC cells in the mucosa. And it's actually an old, uh, very old technology that just been again come up. So who is a good candidate? Let me show you only two cases. This first case, 33 year old male who had symptoms of reflux and abdominal bloating. And uh, you know, he underwent three fundoplications and all of, all of them failed. And then he was referred to us for evaluation of uh, uh, gastroparesis. We did this EGG, which was hyper normal. So the amount of contractions was much more in the three CPM cycles. These patients are one which respond well to GPOM. So we did, just to be sure, we did a dilatation. And once we did dilatation, there was some significant response. We repeated EGG. You could see those hyper normal responses on the uh, EGG came into the normal range. And ultimately now he's being offered uh, a GPOM. So this patient is a good candidate for gastric myotomy. Who is not when you have a hypo normal 3 CPM response on EGG. These patients will have definitely a deficiency of ICCs. If these will not respond to your gastric poem, so they will have more diffuse disease, possibly a myopathy, neuropathy, maybe even an autoimmune process. This particular patient was from Nepal and he had diffuse dilatation across the GI tract. EGG showed a hyponormal response. All of his autoimmune markers were positive. We did a full thickness biopsy. There was a lot of inflammation around the nerves. We gave him a trial of steroids. He did respond partially. He's still on a close follow-up. So these patients are not a good candidate for GPOM. So you can use these tools. And still, if you have doubt, you can do enterodurnal manometry. It is a difficult test to do. It takes six to eight hours. Passing a catheter down is not very easy. So this young male had recurrent abdominal, almost an explosive distension of stomach. Remarkable x-ray completely filled with you know, air. 
he had failed multiple you know peg insertions and multiple fjs he was being offered gastrectomy and he was sent to me to uh, look into the duodenum when we saw this particular graphs bang normal graphs coming from stomach 3 cpm cycles into duodenum 11 to 12 cpm cycles this patient did not really have uh, abnormality in the antrum or in the duodenum we did his hrim and he was significantly swallowing air continuously it was a case of aerophagia and not really a case which required a surgical intervention is still under a behavioral therapy so rectal we all are aware what we can really offer you is to diagnose ultra short hirschsprung and absent rare is almost a mandatory diagnosis and you can add up with various ancillary test so finally to conclude motility testing is if used appropriately is the backbone for any gastroenterology practice it has an important role in the world particularly for third space for all of you and all all poem starts with the words all space missions should start with testing and if you want to land your third space mission onto the moon you really need to do your preparation well and your testing well thank you this is my lab and you are welcome to have a look at it uh, thank you zubin that was wonderful uh, any questions from the house anything yeah sir so yes sir so so as i said the still the major randomized control that i just come up still use gastric scintigraphy as the gold standard their, their limitations was that did not use ecg or entorhinal manometry so we had a discussion with sumit amin who was one of the authors he said that since that is the most easily available and still the one is most frequently used they still use that as a diagnostic marker for gastroparesis the problem with that is if you see a value let's say 60% at 4 hours that is that is fine that is absolutely no problem but when you see the values of 15% 20% that's where the doubts come and i think more than 10% retention is abnormal but lot of functional dyspepsia patient almost 25% of them will show value of 15 20 25% so those values should not be taken as a something abnormal in particular in india and but when you have values of scintigraphy showing 60% retention 70% retention those are definitely abnormal and can be taken at face value yeah yeah yes so there are two options for it uh, i don't have wire guided catheters but and i do have a problem that you know when there is a very tight ligus you sometimes may not be able to pass the catheters down in that case you can do you can use fluoroscopy there are markers available on the catheter to pass it down that might some sometimes help you rarely you do have to use endoscopy if like nothing fails you but these are usually the cases where things are pretty clear you will have a hugely dilated esophagus you will have a tight ileus bilium will be very clear so you actually may not even need to do a manometry to really really give you an idea the manometry uh although it's important to type particularly in type 3 but these patients are usually not type 3 to really merit a long myotomy so in there will be always 10% 5% cases where you might not be able to uh, put it across zubin yes sir excellent presentation uh, i have two questions so uh, there are the norm normative pressure values so uvs are not defined uh, across the world you should be using a solid state catheter ideally speaking but it is not very easily available very expensive to maintain for a water perfused catheter you have to use a pull back technique that we currently use you have to decrease the flow value flow value uh, volume of the catheter normally around 5 to less than 2 the, the same way that we use for kids and after that you have to just see the opening on the either the line diagram or on the color diagram so there is no normative value there is no irp levels at which you can say the uvs is abnormal Yes, sir. You were saying no, no. I wanted to ask what are the norm, what are your normal values for upper esophageal? There are no. So the second thing, yeah. EGG availability is not uh, very common. Yeah. So how do you uh, suggest that a person can decide on GPOM cases? So, sir, in that case, uh, the only real easily available is gastric scintigraphy, and endoduodenal manometry is can only be it's help much you. More it's much more limited. Much more is. is much more limited it is more time consuming it's more difficult for the person who is doing as well as for the uh, you know patient but ultimately you have to rely only on the yes if, if that is the case but egg should pick up with some time 
once the once the end of flip comes, you might be you know much easier to uh, test these cases. Doctor Jupin, uh, can we use only rare to uh, send the patient from prem, or do we need a biopsy? Because so, this is a very uh, practical problem we had uh, twice. Uh, Ma'am, I'll tell you one case which was last month only. So we had one patient who was classic, looked like a young kid who looked like uh, first sprung. And uh, I did his there and I actually found their in him. And I was told very confidently that no, he, he doesn't have first sprung. But later on, he underwent full thickness biopsies and there was no ganglion sense. So I again came back to me, we repeated it. So yes, there will be cases where absent rare, uh, you know, or even rare might be slightly positive, but there will be less amount of cells. So, so we I need a combination. Not, it used to be, it, in all motility testing, whether you do esophagus or rectum, it ideally should be a combination. combination. Nothing is gold standard here in VI motility because the test can vary even if your catheter is not standardized well enough. Even that can vary your test at that particular day. So mm -hmm. always use a combination, either something else. Uh, the, uh, can I comment on when the, it's difficult to pass catheter across G junction, sometimes sipping a liquid through so a are, straw. Yeah, can... So there are a few maneuvers which can do actually. Uh, you can, uh, you know, bend the uh, uh, chin. Sometimes you can ask them to sit up, you know, it will actually pass through. Sometimes you can ask them, as ma'am said, you rightly, you have to ask them to sip along. So there are certain maneuvers you can do, but still there will be some cases where nothing will go across. And those are ones which are pretty clear. At least, yeah, you might not mm. even need to do the manometry. Should not pick up with the biopsy forceps. Somebody um, damaged in another center. Either. They picked up the uh, yes. catcher with the biopsy forceps to pass across the G junction. The catcher was gone. Yeah, four lakh, five lakh. Four lakh. Uh, any question from the house? If there are none, uh, thank you, Zubin, for a wonderful talk. Um, now, uh, we have a very important topic, and uh, especially for the beginners, once they are starting third space, right patient, right indication, and contraindication. And actually, that will avoid the sleepless nights. And we have a right person also to talk about, Dr. Mohan. Dr. Mohan is a senior consultant uh, at AIG Hyderabad. Dr. Mohan, please. Thank you very much. And at the outset, I thank uh, Team Medanta for uh, giving us this opportunity. Of course, led by Professor Sood and uh, Rajesh Puri. So uh, we are all uh, gathered here to understand the third space endoscopy, and uh, we should go uh, why this is known as third space, and then we'll come back to the uh, indications. So this was the first paper of first space uh, therapeutic intervention. That was way back in 1973. In fact, first polypectomy was done in 69. So that was by convention known as first space. Then Professor Anthony Kalu uh, and their team came up with the idea, why not to perforate the bowel and go into the peritoneum? And this is the first paper which they published uh, and did uh, call them as a notes, natural orifice transluminal endoscopy. And our center was the first uh, to describe uh, this procedure under the leadership of Professor Reddy and Rao. And they shown a uh, first case of uh, appendicectomy done uh, orally. And uh, that was presented in Jaipur uh, ISGCon in 2004. But because of the lot of competition with laparoscopy and no dedication tools available, notes gradually went into uh, uh, not popularized that much, but it gave birth to a very important space and uh, that was the third space. And then gut wall was now considered as a layered architecture. And each layer can perform the barrier function if the layer, a second layer is not available. That means if you can peel off a mucosa from the muscle and then selectively perform the procedure going into a a space which is a submucosal space, which is not a space but can be created. And that is came because of the uh, a paper by Sumiyama, which was uh, published in 2007, I think. And they said that if you keep a gut wall into layered architecture, the problem with notes was that you come 
and you create a whole thickness in opening, then how to close? Because you will require either a suturing devices, which may not be available. But then came this paper by Sumiyama, where they said that, why not to do a flap wall, where you make a mucosal entry at one point, then you create a, a submucosal tunnel, and then you do a procedure, which is maybe either into the peritoneum or the muscle, but once you come back and do this procedure, say, for example, uh, remove the muscle in a case of ecclesia. And once you come back, you, you just approximate the mucosa. You need not to have a fancy closure devices, but yet you can achieve uh, a very strong uh, closure that is known as a full thickness closure with a safety of, of a, a flap or a wall. So that was the paper which brought this paradigm shift in the field of third space endoscopy. And then we are now doing many, many cases using this technique where we separate the mucosa from the muscle. Uh, this is the first step. And then you decide what are you treating. You are treating a disease which is limited to mucosa. That means you are treating early cancers. You remove the mucosa because muscle is there to take care of the barrier function. Well, if you're treating a disease which is related, limited to muscle, and since you have separated mucosa away from the muscle, you can selectively treat the disease limited only to the muscle. In this example, for ecclesia or a, a tumor which is located into the muscle, once you have separated, you can treat this disease orally, which was up till now done laparoscopically or, or surgically, but yet you can come out and just approximate the mucosa because of this flap wall and integrity of mucosa, you can achieve the same results as done by laparoscopy or by surgery. So that was known, this is now known as digestive endoscopy tunnel technique. And with this technique, we are now gradually uh, are able to treat many, many disease, including uh, ecclesias up till Hirschsprung disease. So we'll just see how to select appropriate cases and what are the problems with these uh, diseases and how to treat uh, selectively. Uh, so for a beginner, I'll say that we'll, we shall start with the, uh, the same procedure will remain everywhere, right from the esophagus to the rectum, where you need to create a mucosal incision get into the tunnel and then separate. This is known as separation of the mucosa from the muscle, as I told, and then treat a disease located into this plane where you have now, there is no submucosa here. You are treating the muscle disease and but keeping the mucosa intact. So here, our aim is not to damage mucosa because if you damage the mucosa, that will be perforation. And if you're doing ESD using tunnel technique, you're not supposed to uh, damage the muscle. So separation is important by tunneling. And once you've done the tunneling, you can selectively treat. And once you come back, you can close the mucosal incision and make sure that the mucosal incision is not coinciding with the muscle incision. And here, here you can see bang opposite the mucosal incision, the muscle is remaining intact and you are just approximating the mucosa by the instrument which are available in day-to-day -day clinical practice, say for example, here, hemoclips. So these indications are now expanding and uh, we saw uh, diseases uh, limited to LES. We don't know how much muscle to cut, but shorter is the better in case of ecclesia type one and type two. While in a disease which are, uh, hypercontractile or spastic esophageal disorder, you need to do a long cut uh, extending, say for example, from the 20 centimeter in esophagus, and you may have to cut across the LES. The, the dictum is still uh, uh, not uh, clear whether to cut the LES and go into the stomach, because in these disorders, LES is still functional, why unnecessary to cut LES and go into the stomach and cause unnecessary reflux? But these are the disorders where you need to do a long esophageal myotomy. 
And this length of the esophageal myotomy can be easily decided by the spastic segment seen on the manometry. And you can decide the length of myomectomy or myotomy uh, based on these. And these are very rewarding. These patients are very sick. They are having very severe symptoms. Sometimes they can uh, they, they, they go to cardiologist and they have a severe chest pain. And you can see the time barium solo after poem. And you can see after two minutes also, the barium was not at all emptying. And post poem, it is a complete emptying. So these were some of our papers. But I'll tell you what are the difficulties in third space endoscopy. Always see for healthy mucosa because here you are treating the muscle. So your mucosa, which is going to be ultimate barrier, has to be very healthy. There should not be any esophageal candidiasis uh, because there can be a theoretical chance that you may induce fungal mediastinitis. You are not treating this as happens with a surgical concept that our incision site should be well cleaned. You can assess whether the healthiness of submucosa is okay by seeing the mucosa. We'll come back to this because healthiness of submucosa is important for proper tunneling technique. You have to see for submucosal fibrosis. You have to see for any diverticulas and also assess the barium very well because it's the, the clinical success uh, should be equal to technical success. Suppose you do a good technique of doing myotomy in a very sigmoid esophagus, and then if you do a CT and you saw two lumens in one cut, that means there is a horizontal segment or there is an upgoing segment. So there is no vertical uh, emptying because once you do LES myotomy, you are depending on the gravity for the foot to fall down. But if there is a S shaped or a, a Sigmoid, severe sigmoid esophagus, the gravity may not work and patient may still complain of dysphagia, even if you have done three hours poem and patient is still not symptomatic, not, uh, there is no relief of the symptoms. So these are the places where we have to look for bleeding, mucosal injury, submucosal fibrosis, and there can be technical failures. And then you have to be well versed with how to deal with these complications, including the pneumoperitoneum, the, um, the air into the retroperitoneum, air into the pleura, uh, uh, the CO2, I'm, uh, I, I'm sure everybody is now switched to CO2. Then you have to think about what to do when you are perforated the mucosa, or there can be delayed perforation. Patient may come with abscesses or empyemas. So these are the things which we'll understand. And also, as soon as you see this type of mucosa, you should can assess what is going to be underneath. Like uh, a, a good submucosa is equal to good uh, submucosa in most of the time. It may not be 100% true, but once you are starting to see these striations or sulcus or ulcers or scars in the mucosa, you can be sure that you are going to find these submucosal fibrosis in varying grade. So just by mirroring, looking into the mucosa, you can think that there can be some problems. And the problems can be that the prerequisite of third space endoscopy is that you should be able to separate mucosa from submucosa. If you're not able to do that, the poem provides an opportunity to go into an opposite direction like this. We are going, we are trying to do poem in a patient who's mucosa is not that good and you inject and once you inject you will see there are some blebs formation or there can be a spontaneous water coming out that means there is no space in the submucosa so this is the place where you will not attempt to do that so you will obviously try to do a tunneling in a in a diagonally opposite uh, direction so this is the posterior and once you go anterior at one or two o'clock, you can see nice submucosal deposition. So uh, changing the direction, so submucosal fibrosis is not circumferential. You may have a very good opportunity, bang opposite, that is if you're doing posterior, you can go to anterior, or you can go slightly lower down. And then you will find, as you can see here, uh, still uh, we are searching for good place 
good place to have a good submucosal entry site. And here you can see after a, a 10 millimeter, uh, one centimeter down, we found a very good opportunity and went into the submucosa. Sometimes in these cases, once your mucosa is unhealthy, you may find a dip, uh, you do a mucosal incision, but your mucosal incision is not deep enough. You can see here, this is not muscle. This is submucosal fibrosis and the proper depth is not recognized because there is dense adhesions between muscle and mucosa. So with this, you will uh, see that gradually once you find the proper uh, depth, you can go ahead uh, into the same tunneling, but you have to be very, very cautious to find this blue water or blue uh, dye deposition and not to use uh, a very high coagulation currents like uh, spray coagulation, which can cause collateral damage. You can use pure cut here and gradually you can go down and you will find healthy submucosa afterwards. So this is how you have to deal. You can, you may not be able to do it one place, but if you change direction or keep patience, you will definitely be able to do that. But if you find something like this, you should delay. You can put a Riles tube, put patient on antifungal, proton pump inhibitors, send these patient home with the proper drainage. That means Riles tube feeding, uh, stasis induced ulcer need drainage. And you cannot do these uh, type of third space procedure if you find such type of mucosa, better to wait for some time. And these mucosa, uh, if you are doing it, you may end up uh, into a clip side dehiscence or other problems. Uh, I'll just say that uh, for the beginners, it is better to avoid patients with sigmoid esophagus, dilated esophagus, and those who have undergone prior surgery or balloon dilatation because they are associated with high risk of failure. The failure is defined as after one year, uh, there is a need of retreatment by endoscopy or presence of food. So if these factors are present, you will consider these patients as high risk. I will refer them to a, a center which is more well equipped in treating these patients I will start with low risk group where esophagus is straight, it is not dilated, it is naive patient. And once I gain 10 to 15 cases of experience, I will definitely go into more riskier. I will also be very, very specifically uh, looking for patients who have severe cardiopulmonary diseases, those who are old and have now presented first time. They may have a pseudo ecclesia. I've seen a patient who uh, we did a poem and after six months, he came back with pain abdomen and CT had shown a large pancreatic mass. And in fact, that was a, a, a paraneoplastic syndrome causing ecclesia. Or there can be a cancer of the G junction, which is infiltrating, present is a pseudoecclesia. So always a patient who comes to you in an older age, first time, always rule out pseudoecclesia. Severe submucosal fibrosis and adhesions, I have told you how to deal with this. And also, there can be severe esophagitis because of stasis, ulcer. These are the relative contraindications. Coming to gastroparesis, I think uh, we, we know that the, the golden point here is how to identify a patient with gastroparesis, whether I will do a gastric poem, which is a very easy procedure, whether it will benefit the patient or not. That can be done by three methods. Either you put a, a pyloric stent and see if patient is responding. If pyloric stent patient has responded, your patient with uh, gastroparesis will respond with gastric poem too, but it's too costly. And try a trans pyloric stent to put a stent which is anti migrating is difficult to find. You can inject the botulism toxin, and I've seen uh, recent papers in DDW also, which has shown that if you're Patient with gastroparesis responded well to Botox. They will also respond good to gastric poem. Electrogastrography, Zubin has already touched upon, but these are the uh, patients whom we are looking for a response of around 50 to 60%. It cannot be 100% like poem. The gastric poem is a good technique, but to identify correct patient is a difficult 
And we should always tell our patient that your response rate may not be 100%, around 50 to 60%. You can increase the yield by doing some fancy procedures like uh, uh, Botox or doing such type of uh, gastric myoelectric activity assessment by EGG and saying that uh, on the left side, this is bradygastria. That means your patient's uh, graph is below the normal, ma normal marking. That means stomach is flaccid. Even if you do a good pyloric cutting, patient, there is no pumping action. So there will be no relief. But if your patient's stomach is working well, that means the muscles are working well. That means either they are normal or tachygastria. These are the patients whom you do a pyloric myotomy, there will be a good emptying. So you can do these tests. Uh, I'll not go into the details, but you can choose your patient and minimize the failure rate by these. We can also treat patients with subepithelial tumors. I don't know why time for that or not. But I will say that these subepithelial tumors can be easily uh, treated by uh, EFTRs that is endoscopic full thickness resection. And you can qualify these patients by either doing a tunneling and reaching to the tumor or reaching to the tumor right from the above like ESD or using a, some instrument like FTRD devices. And these tumors can be easily treated, but make sure that the tumor is less than three centimeter in size because if tumor is more than three centimeter in size, there can, they are difficult to retrieve from the submucosal tunnel, or they may leave a very large uh, defect where difficult to close. Piecemeal resection is good for esophageal leomyoma because they are benign tumors. But for gastric gist, it is very, it's not oncological correct. If you have to cut the tumor, it's a capsule rupture. They become a very high risk patients for, um, uh, for recurrences and metastasis. So choose your patient right, and also make sure that you choose the patient for appropriate place for appropriate procedure. This is known as submucosal tunneling and endoscopic resection, possible in esophagus. But EFTR, that means you are excavating a tumor and creating a hole, which is not possible in esophagus. Also, tunneling may not be possible in gastric antrum or into the fundus. So STIR can be uh, good for esophagus, tubular structures, and EFTR is good for gastric body and cardia. So this is the nutshell. Regarding Z poem, the question is how to choose whether to do a, a very easy conventional diverticulotomy. You just cut and you, you, you are okay. But the problem here is up till what length we should cut? If we should cut little too much, there can be perforation. If you cut little less, there can be dysphagia. So why not to cut under a mucosal cover? But if you cut under the mucosal cover like Z poem, you can go very deep into the isomegas. There is no doubt that there will be adequate myotomy and there will be zero perforation. But if you are seeing now, if you are doing Zenkers for more than five centimeter diverticula, this mucosal barrier requires another session because you are not cutting the mucosa and mucosa is a very strong structure that can still form a barrier and you may have to bring. So these both are complementary. You do Z poem, after six months, you may have to do a mucosal cutting. You do a conventional poem, a Z poem, a conventional diverticulotomy, there can, be, there can be a residual muscle, you can cover it by Z poem. So, uh, still, uh, we don't have head-to-head -head randomized trial by which method we should treat Zenkers. I will skip the esophageal diverticulum. And uh, as Dr. Monica was uh, talking about, how to choose patient whom you can offer this uh, per rectal endoscopic myotomy. Yes, manometry is important, but biopsy is important to know up till what length you will cut. And I'll show you this video where you can see there's a scar so this is the biopsy taken during initial. So there are a linear uh, sectional biopsies taken from very low rectum to the part 
where where we are seeing now this esophagus is this uh, sigmoid is now dilated here so here we take another biopsy so there are three or four biopsies to be taken and shown that this is a ganglionic segment and mark each biopsy where you find start finding ganglion and that is the area of where till that myotomy will continue so the so the, to choose this patient, one, we have to, to have a very good barium enema, a very good anorectal manometry, and sex, serial biopsies to decide up till what length we will go and what length is the uh, aganglionic segment. You can see here on barium enema, you can see this is the aganglionic segment. This is not opening up. We have to cut this so that this roomy sigmoid which has accumulated feces can be easily emptied. So to demarcate this area, which is not endoscopically possible, you may have to take multiple biopsies and mark those biopsies to know from where the ganglions are starting. Up till that time, you have to take these biopsies. I think with these, I have covered most of the third space endoscopy indications. And by and large, we can now decide what are the patient whom we have to take for the procedures and what are the specific precautions and what are the contraindications. Thank you very much for your patient. Thank you, Dr. Mohan, for the uh, great uh, lecture. Uh, a simple uh, query. When you said that patients with uh, G deep G poem, we inject Botox. But now uh, we have studies in which post Botox the resection becomes difficult. Yeah, so uh, that's the theoretical possibilities. In fact, I was going through a paper in DDW where they have seen a patient, they just prospectively seen, and those patients uh, who had Botox injection did not have submucosal fibrosis, one, but those who have good re response to Botox also had good response to GPOM. So that can be an indirect, uh, uh, you know, marker to tell us correctly that this patient may respond to G point. Otherwise, you do a such long procedure and you don't have any response. That's a, not a good position. So we are finding some of the method which can tell us who are the patient who will respond to gastric point. Sir, one question. Yes. So uh, all questions are very relevant. One is uh, 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 antifungal. We have seen those patients who are coming from very far away. We admit them. And by third or fourth day, we start seeing the healing. In fact, now we are uh, more courageous. We have not yet found any fungal mediastinitis. We start 48 hours antifungal. And even if there are some flakes, mucosa is healthy, we go ahead. But sometimes this uh, candidiasis is associated with a lot of ulceration or scarring. These are the patients who require any way RILES tube feeding for at least six weeks to one month to uh, allow the healing to happen because mucosa should take clips. It should not like, uh, there should not be like giveaway or uh, there can be like uh, another perforation. So always associated, it's a pure Candidiasis with healthy mucosa, very short antifungal. But candidiasis with severe mucosal ulceration, discharge the patient, send them home, go back one month, come back after that. Regarding RT versus NJ, RT is equal to NJ. And regarding your third question, that was, what was that? Lateral poem. Lateral. So uh, eight o'clock, uh, I have done. But uh, I developed tennis elbow, you know, like this. And then uh, uh, you, you can do that. But at that time, you will uh, come across angle of his. The only advantage is that it is clear demarcation between esophagus and stomach. You, can, you don't have to bother about anything. There's such a good demo demarcation between esophagus and uh, stomach. Eight o'clock is best for that. But you will cut the angle of his. You will cut the sling fiber and you will cause more reflux. So eight o'clock is not good for the performer, 
not good for the patient. So one more question is there. Dr. Mohan, just uh, one note, if someone has done POEM and by chance it has failed, what will be your techniques with same approach? You will go posterior or change the approach? If you go with same approach, what things you should keep in mind? Why it has failed? Maybe incomplete myotomy has been done. Yeah, so in that case, always you should uh, go in opposite direction because uh, you will not get the proper uh, uh, submucosal, healthy submucosa. So that happens with Heller's myotomy. They are always done anteriorly, so we always go posteriorly. And also, in such situation, uh, as Yogesh was talking, I have done one or two eight o'clock position. That was only because both the poems were done, and uh, then uh, we had to choose eight o'clock. With eight o'clock, the chance of esophageal diverticulum also is there later, because we are later while we are doing. No, uh, uh, the diverticulum will happen if you cut the good esophagus muscle, but do not cut the LES and do not cut the stomach. If, if that is that, because you are cutting the circular muscle, the whole aim is to snap it open. So whether it is lateral or anterior or posterior, the function is same. You have to open it. But you have to simultaneously cut the LES, go into the stomach. If you do not cut LES, there is a spastic segment. There will be a ballooning in the esophagus, whether it is anterior, posterior, or lateral, anyway. Problem of sir, submucosal fibrosis is only at the time at the site of in injection, sir. Once we are in tunnel, then you will not encounter submucosal fibrosis. I don't think so. There can be a, once you can have a good injection site, and once you are progressing into the tunnel, there can be areas of submucosal fibrosis. So you inject that, more that time, or you may not be able to go. Then you have to come back, close that tunnel, and go in opposite direction. Thank you, Dr. Mohan. Uh, I think the live session is uh, going to be there. Eh? Thank you. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Dr. Mohan, and I thank our moderators for this session. Next, we move on to our live demonstrations, which will be live by our team of preeminent gastroenterologists. The session will be parts. The moderators for our first session is our Dr. Par Pavan Rawal, Dr. Sudhir Dr. Sudhir 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 Welcome everyone on stage. Thank you. Yes sir, you are on. Sir, you will come with me. You will come with me. Please come. How to say sir? Chik. Am I audible there? Yes sir, yes sir. So, uh, good afternoon everyone. Wait sir, you have not been switched in the hotel. Am I audible? Yeah, yeah, you are. Is am I visible there? Yeah, Dr. Ajish, visible and audible. Okay. Okay. So, uh, uh, welcome to all. And I have a request to all the speakers to stick on the time so we can do the complete program on time. And uh, I think Dr. Khaturia is going to present the first case and Dr. Amit Mahadev, who is the finest person in the India for the poem procedure and he will be with me and he's going to guide me for the procedure tricks and technique as well as to me also and to the audience who is there. And uh, Dr. Khaturia, will you present the first case? Sure, sir. Good afternoon, everyone. The first case is a 14-year-old female who presented with complaints of dysphagia for liquids more than solids, retrosternal pain, regurgitation of food and weight loss for a period of three months. We can see the barium images. And there is a classical bird beak appearance. The endoscopy showed increased salivary secretions and liquid food residue in the esophagus and dilated and tortuous esophagus with increased resistance at lower esophageal sphincter. Manometry was suggestive of type 2 echelasia cardia. The plan is posterior per oral endoscopic myotomy. Over to you, sir. Dr. Khaturia and... Uh... On the another room, Dr. Nile Mehta is there and he's going to show the sickle polypectomy because he has not reached. So I'm starting and within 10 minutes, I will hand over the, uh, change the room to uh, the second room and Dr. Khaturia is going to present. So what I'm using is the new Olympus scope. This is GIF EZ1500. And this is the latest model of the uh, Olympus. And this has three important facilities. One is they have a RDI. And RDI has basically, if you see, the I have fixed it. The, there's a, first is freeze and second I go to the RDI mode. Th this is the TXI mode which I am 
on and TXI mode is mainly for the texture for the better enhancement and it can cover the better area. Then we have got an RDI mode. RDI has two modes, RDI one and RDI two. If during this poem, if patient has bleeding, then we are going to show RDI one, you can pick up the bleeding point and RDI two can visualize the deeper area of the blood vessels. And third, we have a fourth, we have a NBI mode. So we have a NBI mode, which you all of you know, and they have a, then another mode is they have got a, uh, that is called as EDOF, that is extended depth of visualization area, which is blind can be seen very well. And they have got a deeper penetration. Before poem, it is important, those who are learning, it is important you should have a, a scope which has the therapeutic channel of 2.8 with the water jet facilities. Is that right? And the accessories, Bhagwan is, where is Bhagwan? Uh, who is our senior technician who is going to assist? And it is very important you should have a complete checklist. And Bhagwan is the person who is going to arrange. And what you should have is you should have an injector, you should have hybrid knife or the TTJ knife and you have a coag forcep if you can show there the coag forcep should be there then I am generally doing a hybrid knife or the TTJ knife can be used then we have a diluted methylene blue and then you should have the endoclips which can be applied to close the incision site and you should have the earbuds you can clean the, the cap the most important point is this cap has a hole at, which should be capped at six o'clock position. So the, the debris and the blood which come, it can drain. It should not be at 12 o'clock position. Otherwise, you are not able to clean the lens. And the uh, uh, manometry and the uh, uh, barium is mandatory before that. Patient should be nil before at least for 24 to 48 hours. I always prefer to do endoscopy five days before to check for contraindication for poem or for any fungal esophagitis. If it is there, we can take care. So we will start the case. And this is a young lady who has a type two achalasia. And the plan is to- You're on NBI, make it to normal. Yeah, I will make it to normal is, four is NBI. No, we don't need an NBI. No. That's correct. Endo view is not visible here, yeah, now it's better. Now it's visible? Yeah, now it is. So you see a lot of secretions are there. So Rajesh, what do you think is the contraindication for doing poem? Yeah, so the contraindication for doing the poem, if you cannot lift the blab, if patient has a severe fibrosis, if patient has a severe cardiopulmonary disease, which is a contraindication for the anesthesia, or patient has a relative contraindication, if patient has a, has a uh, reflux esophagitis or the cystic esophagitis. What about esophageal then, varices? Portal yeah, hypertension. yeah, portal hypertension is also one of the contraindication. If patient has a varices, then you should not do it. And I see that your patient is in a supine position. You always doing supine? Yeah, the best position is supine. Why yeah. it is important? Because it is suitable for the anesthesia doctor and you should always keep the abdomen open. That is another important thing that the abdomen should remain open. So either your assistant or your anesthesia doctor can keep on visualizing for the capnoperitoneum. So it should be remain open. Okay. And any other reason why you are keeping supine? Because you are going to do posterior yeah. Another reason, another reason is that when you are doing the posterior, when the patient is the left lateral, there is a curvature of the because these patient is a trusty contraction or the left lobe of the liver. They compresses and they can produce the difficulty in doing the poem. Right. So now, to so describe the steps of the poem, and once you enter in the tunnel and start the submucosal dissection, then we will shift to the other room. Okay. So first of all is I will measure the G junction. This so you is have at kept 35. the TXI mode. You are going to use a TXI mode for this? No, I will poem. keep the routine. Routine so because the press new the scope. TXI button. So TXI is second. Now this second. Is. Okay. Yeah. So now it is off. So now this is the normal mode. G junction is at 36 centimeter. Yeah. Okay. So you measure the G junction. What, what else do you see before starting the poem? Like you see the, the tightness at yes. what level the tightness starts. Yes. Because sometimes it can be a long this tube. Is the, this yeah. is the area. Yeah. And it's around 36 centimeters. So around 36 centimeters, 36. your tightness is starting. Yes. And this is a type two. Yes. So I'm planning to do three centimeter proximal and two centimeter distal. Correct. So at least around uh, 36. So and you start at? Uh, I think we can start at 30 centimeter. Yeah. 
Is that, that right? It should be sufficient. Okay. Good enough. So I will tell Bhagwan to put the water because it is important that you should define which is the posterior, posterior. side. So the where the water is stagnant is the posterior side. Yeah, because patient is supine. Yeah. You can and hear me well? Yes, sir, you are audible. Okay, okay. Thank you. Now there is a spine. Can you see here is a spine? Let me just introduce the catheter uh, injection needle I am going to show. So if you look at here, here the water is, can you put a little bit of water? Yeah. Can you see the water is stagnating here? Yeah. So this is the posterior approach. Is that right? Correct. So now where you want to start the incision? Yeah. Suppose the spine is at 6 o'clock. Yeah. So you so should you not, where? you should not, you should not start at 6 o'clock because otherwise it's difficult to enter into the enter. cap. So, so you, you will always start going to the spine. on this side. So 5 o'clock is a better position. Yes. And anteriorly you do at around 12 o'clock. Or at around two o'clock. So what what is important is I'm starting at thirty centimeter, or I can start here also. Yeah. Then it will become a very fast procedure. Yeah. So I will tell my assistant to take out the needle. He will pour a little bit of the water. Yes, and I will inject and I will pull it. Pull back. And he will he will gradually. Until we start seeing the blip. Yeah. Can you see? So he is going to inject around ten cc. Is that okay? Okay. Now, second important thing is I have not given importance otherwise the less vascular area should be injected and you can raise the blab properly. So another very important point, Rajesh, is did you adjust the CO2 flow before yes. starting? Is 1.2 liters. To, is that prevent, right? to prevent capnoperitoneum. Yes, 1.2 liters per minute. 1.2 liters. There's a low flow. Okay. It's only on the liters or you actually see the bubbles coming out? What? You see the bubbles bubbling out in a in a dish because sometimes what happens, even if it is okay. 1.2 liters, the bubbles are coming out very fast. Okay. So what I'm going to use is what is the what is the early so start. and what is the 300? What is the setting? Endocut Q I am using. And what setting are you using? 233? So, uh, 233 and endocut uh, mode. I think that is sufficient. Yeah. So the next question is how long you should make the mucosal cut? So till you are able to see the submucosa. Correct. Then I'm going to do the little bit of the coagulation. The spray is paused. Is there a spray mode? Pardon? What is the mode we have done? Okay. And aim is to clear the side of this. And for that, I will keep my this here. So it should be visualized. Okay. Very good. So unless you do an adequate mucosal incision and ledging below the incision, you will not yeah. be able to enter. So this is the, uh, can you inject a little so bit? So now you have seen how easily he has entered the submucosal space or the third space. And then I will do the, like a scooping. Very good. Can you do a little bit less? You are with this. Okay. So I think we can shift to Nila room. Is that right? Or can we do a little bit uh, out? Go a little bit ahead. Nila is ready there in that room. Can you check? So, for those who are not yet doing poem, one very important point which Rajesh is showing is he's remaining as close to the muscle fibers as possible. And that is the best way you will prevent damage, inadvertent damage to the mucosa. Okay. Okay. Because in achalasia, the muscle is the... And is very, very important thick. is you should not give the traction of your cap to the submucosa. Correct. Otherwise, it's going to torn the there. vessels and the bleeding will be more. Correct. So that is another important thing which you should take care. And you see that he is visualizing the vessels in that areolar tissue. So and I'm just in, in some situations, the... he may use a post coag. And you should make the tunnel wider. So at least the, if there is any injury, if there is a bleeding, at least you will be able to Correct. tackle it. Okay. 
So now any particular that... advantage of this knife over the triangular tip knife? So the only one difference is that you don't require a repeated injection. Here with the paddle, you are going to inject and you can give the mucosal incision. There you require to push with the uh, 10 cc of the syringe as well as for the mucosal incision, you require a uh, injector. Inject. You know, it, this knife sometimes becomes more useful if there is a submucosal fibrosis. So if you are oh. doing a procedure which is oh. a little difficult submucosal tunneling, because this water comes out with a much faster jet, stronger jet, it becomes a little bit easier during submucosal fibrosis. However, once you become a real expert, any knife comes in your hand, you will be able to perform. Yeah, that is not a problem. You can use any knife actually, in fact. You can even do the entire procedure by using a simple ESD knife or DOL knife. So can we shift you to the next even, room? Even you can use a hook knife. If there is a no question, can yeah, we shift so to the next room? So we will shift now to Nilay's room. Is Nilay ready? Ready? Okay. So once we reach to the G junction, another seven or eight minutes, we will be at the G junction. Yeah. Is there spray coagulation? Sir. Number one. So Rajesh, how are you going to, going to monitor your direction in the tunnel? So yeah, it's a very good question. The most important point is if you look at here, the muscle is perpendicular to my scope. Can you see it? Yes, we can appreciate. The muscle is perpendicular to your scope, number one. And number second, you can come out and you can see it. Inject. Untapered cap. This is untapered cap. You can see. So sometimes you use a tapered cap in patients who have some submucosal fibrosis where it's very yeah, difficult some, to enter. Time. But you generally don't require, once you have done the procedure multiple times, then you will be able to, even in the fibrosis or so, in the beginning of your career, yes, it requires. But I think once you have done around 15, 20 poem, then it's not a challenge. Then any any type of the case can be done very safely and very easily. I don't think changing of the cap required at that time. In the beginning of the career, I agree. And theoretically, yes, inject. So the principle is keep on injecting. That is important. Out. Yes. Uh, so in the beginning, it, an up-down movement is always what we are more used to in endoscopy. So even I was uh, using to keep my muscle on the left and keep cutting. But once you get a hang of using the scope as an as a adjunct to your arm, then you make those curls and make those long arches. Then you keep the muscle either anteriorly or posteriorly depending yeah. on your tunnel. We will be, start, uh, we'll be starting the next case. It's a 68-year-old male suffering from ulcerative colitis, the surveillance colonoscopy revealed a polyp in the ascending colon. The polyp was nice 2A. This is the endoscopic image. The plan is to do an underwater endoscopic mucosal resection. Over to room 2. Hello. Are we on? Yes, Nile, we can hear you. Okay, so this is a patient of ulcerative colitis. Patient still has some activity uh, down below. Uh, in, it, he has this colitis right now. And uh, as uh, the history showed, there are some polyps on the right colon. Uh, not just in the cecum, but there are other polyps also. Uh, few of them are actually hyperplastic. If I start NBI, and before I tell you what's NBI, this is an Avis X1 New Olympus 4K system which are, with a 4K resolution. It has two, three advantages. One is the resolution itself is good. Then it has different modes. Uh, it has TXI mode for uh, characterization of this polyp. Uh, and it has also uh, other mode which can tell you about the bleeding. But right now we are going to talk about the polyp. So I'll, uh, there are two modes, TXI1 and TXI2. It also has a zoom function. So whenever in a normal endoscopy, when you do a zoom, uh, the, the field of vision goes down here, even with a great zoom, the field of vision is good. So uh, right now, uh, 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 you can see one polyp that is at the 11 o'clock and it is hyperplastic polyp. 
let's see other uh, polyp uh, let me go back to the white light and uh, there is another polyp over here uh, so let me first start with uh, pxi2 more so you can now see three polyps and if you are seeing a pip along with it over there the other small pip picture is showing endo aid so it's an artificial intelligence by olympus uh, you can see those uh, green squares that is uh, showing abnormal uh, mucosa in the uh, uh, colon and they are the polyps uh, let's characterize uh, what are the polyps and you can see uh, uh, dr nareesh but can you elaborate on the then nbi what you are seeing is a nice type 1 where you are seeing this kind of uh, Doctor Bhatt is not audible. Not audible. Mic is on. Nilay, uh, uh, this patient require any particular preparation? Ah, uh, yes, uh, it was Our a normal preparation. preparation. It was a normal preparation, uh, but there was a lot of stool, so we cleaned the stool when we went in. Um, Am I audible? Is the other mic audible? Can you just uh, tell someone that the other mic should be audible? you can come near and speak i don't know so what we are seeing essentially is multiple polyps and if you look at the first look the one thing that you should look at is look at the color can you just go, go back to the white light sir okay so i have gone back to the white light so when you look at the white light the color can you just see if it is work can you hear me through this microphone Yes, yes, much better. Yes, we okay. can. Okay. Yeah. All right. So what you see is the background color is the same as the mucosa. It's relatively pale. That tends to tell you that yes, possibly that this is not an adenomatous, but maybe a hyperplastic polyp. Next is you go to the NBI, and then you start looking at the vessels. Uh, the problem is with these high quality scopes. Of, here the small vessels look quite prominent, but here we can make out at least here at this. Uh, Two o'clock or three o'clock polyp. That definitely the vessels are much finer. They are not looking like the polyps of uh, endometrial polyps, where you have a regular kind of uh, mesh capillary network. It is there, but not that prominent. Maybe if you see a uh, endometrial polyp, we can compare. Can we show them? Okay. Yeah. So we have multiple uh, small polyps here in the ascending colon. And now, Doctor Nilay is trying to go into the cecum. Do we get a good picture after water immersion technique? We have not yet put water, not yet. But now you can see a polyp lighting up behind that fold, which now yes, can you see that polyp there? Yes, it's visible. Uh, there. Now okay, it's in the square, green square. Yes, we can appreciate. Yeah, now if you put, let's uh, put the NBI. Okay. So this was TXI mode. I'll stop TXI mode, and I'll just show them the TXI mode. Mode. Yeah. So this is TXI two. Now the ascending colon has very vigorous peristalsis. Do you give some anti-motility agents? Yeah, we tried giving. This is hyperplastic polyp over here. Can you see? Very uh, faint vessels. Vessels are not prominent. This is a classical hyperplastic polyp. And I'll show you. Uh, there's one hiding there in the back. Okay. Now uh, this is one. Pakro. Just put on NBI here. Yeah, here you can clearly. I, it's almost a surface pattern, almost looking really form here. This is definitely a, looks like a tubular villus uh, adenoma. It's a Paris two uh, A. It's a flat lesion, or you think it's a little more than that? One uh, S. Yeah, I'll so make it more than S. Yeah, it is a little protuberant, but. Uh, Size. So, one S lesion about uh, one, 1. 1.5 centimeters, you'd say? 
I would okay. say around one centimeter, one point two or something yeah, like that. Yeah. Like that. But is definitely there. And this is certainly, if you look at these vessels there, that you can see some of them at least, they look prominent. So this is an adenomatous polyp. And maybe this is one that you see. Should, uh, if this polyp was in some other part of the colon, just take out with a cold snare and you are good to go. Problem here are one, two, three. One is that it, if you can see, it is not protruding, it's inside a cavitical kind of thing. Second, it's a cecum. Third, it's an ulcerative colitis with an active disease down below. So the, the, we were thinking what should be done. So hot cautery is out of question. Uh, first, it is small. I think we can uh, do it with a, a cold snare. Uh, we don't want to have a late uh, problem. Also, uh, we don't have to have perforation over here. So the uh, cautery is out of question. So uh, choice remains between the cold snaring just like that or uh, just uh, do a water immersion, which is called water uh, uh, EMR, underwater EMR, and then try to bring out the polyp. So what's the principle of underwater EMR is when you put a lot of water into the bowel lumen, mucosa and submucosa pops in because of the buoyancy of the tissue. Uh, so basically the muscular propria stays there, but the mucosa and submucosa comes out into the lumen. And then without submucosal injection, uh, you can uh, uh, just resect it out, either with a cold snore, snare or with a cautery. And uh, this does not require cautery, I think, but let's uh, try to do uh, cold snaring. Many times cold snaring is very effective and now people are uh, going you know, for cold snaring and not cautery and underwater EMR is better than EMR because it, we can take out big, big lesions, even bigger than two centimeter without uh, uh, doing piecemeal EMR. What do you say, sir? Yeah, absolutely right. There are two options here. Because we have the right colon, try to avoid thermal. So you can do a lift. You can put a submucosal insulation of um, saline and then do cold uh, resection. Or you can just instill mm. water and do a... So before, in, yeah, before instil water. instilling water, I'll put a lot of... Uh, 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 we'll first, out, first, I'll take out the air from the cecum. And then, uh, because uh, uh, you have to have deflected bowel, and then keep on putting water. So I'll now put a lot of water. It's mainly saline. And we have to put uh, 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 sometimes even 500 ml of saline. So you virtually drown the lesion? Yes. So once you've done that, then the whole polyp tends to stand up, and you can dissect. Yeah, have you have you switched off the air? Uh, no, I have not switched off, but my finger is not over there. See, the uh, 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 preparation is not great. In fact, there was a lot of stool over here, and we try to clean this much. Uh, without water, it looked okay, but with water, I still think that we ha should have cleaned more. But now it's better. It's looking, it's yeah. looking much better. And you can see that you have flattened out the periphery. Yeah. So, the so sometimes, out. snare, please. Sometimes, uh, say, I always do underwater in cecum because sometimes if the lesion is behind the fold, when you put a lot of water, the flat flattens up. And then you can go beyond and take out as a single. So if you have a polyp is one uh, oh, distally, and that means if the extent is distally and proximally of the fold, it then flattens out and then there is no fold and then you can take out. One centimeter. Yeah. So the two big advantages of underwater EMR is one, you don't have to instill any fluid. Second, the size of the lesion that you can get an on-block resection is a little bigger. The only disadvantage is that if you land up with a bleed or a perf, it takes a little more effort to control it. And uh, theoretically, the stance of spillage into the peritoneum, that's one little disadvantage. That you have. If you use saline, you all the time, you don't get this uh, kind of whitish thing coming up. If you use water, a lot of that whitish thing is there. So it's advisable to open, use saline. Open, 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 completely open. Completely open. Still, there is air there. What type of snare you are using? I'm using a 10 millimeter normal snare. It's a braided snare. Now you can see the air is 
even though i have not put any air the water has gone out of it and there is but now you can see the lesion coming out into the uh, lumen okay don't do anything so my snare is surrounding the mucosa now so what he is doing is depressing it onto the polyp and then gradually he lasts the assistant to tighten it patient is pan colitis this is the yeah can change in the patient position help here nilay ah uh, it can but if you see i am in a dependent position so it's actually good position position yeah. is not a problem while uh, we had got the snare around it but then the uh, the other mucosa also prolapses in close 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 dheere dheere close karo close karo close karo so he is depressed as you see he is depressed yeah yeah he is they done a good job now he will once so you can see this is that it is all right that i think it's it's okay yeah so cold 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 what we do in a cold snare hold it for a while and then when you are convinced then you ask and, and to and here in cold snare you don't have to pull like what you do it in hot snare you have to be remain flat but you can see the entire polyp is there inside my lesion inside my snare and now i'll just cut it you cut it. just gel it and cut it cut it cut it cut it don't worry yeah, very nice you can see it's a very clean cut now i'll put some air and see what's happening we'll be shifting to the other room now okay. over to dr puri close so we have crossed the g junction just few minutes before because just to make the things on time can you see the palisade vessels can you see the spindle vessels yes yes, yes we can appreciate the spindles are visible and this is the first big vessel which has come and i have just coagulated uh, because uh, just to finish the procedure on time so spindle vessels indicate that we are near the g junction according to the mark also we are already at 36 and the first big blood vessel we have cut out out okay any particular precautions you have to take at this stage especially yeah. at the g junction yeah two three things which is important now can you see here the vessel which is penetrating from the muscle can we show the rdi for the audience yes we can show the rdi we will show the rdi this vessel is inside the muscle so i am going to use the coa grasper put the water can you see the bleeding point yes it's visible is coming from inside can you see yes it's visible sir पानी डालो और राजेश हाउ डू यू डिसाइड टू टेक अ कोया ग्रास्पर और यूज अ हाइब्रिड नाइफ इटसेल्फ या बिकॉज़ दिस हैज ओपन दिस हैज कम फ्रॉम द मसल सो अ नाइफ इज नॉट गोइंग टू हेल्प यू हैव टू कैच होल्ड ऑफ द मसल लाइक हियर एंड ओके नाउ आई हैव पुट द वाटर इज दैट राइट सो दैट इंडिकेट दैट ब्लीडिंग इज द वेसल इज कॉट बाय माय co grasper i am using the soft coagulation open is that okay so i will again restart my procedure 
Yes. Close. Close this. And we can keep the second second case in the other room. Just... Rajesh, are you monitoring ETCO2 of this patient? Yes, ETCO2 is how much? 40, out. Do you keep at the upper limit? Inject. Yeah, we keep the upper limit 45. Up to 45, we continue with the procedure. And at, at 45, we try that uh, we should withhold. In this case, the CO2 level has gone up. Dr. Amit has given a good tips. We have kept at a low CO2, but still the uh, CO2 was increasing. So uh, he said you can keep the gauge piece. Inject. Great. Can you elaborate on this technique? What you did actually? So we take out the scope. We waited for five to 10 minutes and the CO2 level comes and the anesthesia people has hyperventilated the patient. Okay. Otherwise you check the it, uh, your uh, CO2 flow. If you find it is not, it is high, then you can put a gauge piece at the tube of this and that is going to help you for inject. Just. So this is the second vessel. Don't you think Dr. Amit? This is the second vessel. Should we use the coagulation or should we co -graspar? So I wanted to use the force coagulation, but Dr. Amit feel that we should use co -graspar and I agree because co -graspar is more important. Otherwise, if the patient bleed, then your entire vision will be going to be in trouble. Yes. So Dr. Amit has given a lead that I should catch the muscle along with the bleeding vessel. And I request the other room should be ready. Open. You can skeletonize the submucosa base Open. of the vessel, and if the big vessel, especially a perforator going across, Open. Which, uh, then you can use the coagulation. If you think the vessel Close. is abutting the muscle, closer to the muscle, okay. I prefer to use my knife uh, <coughs> because I can afford to damage the muscle. Who pata hai unko ek mount ko pata hai. Under side press. Pull the vessel towards the tongue. Open. Okay. 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 Is that okay? Okay. Is that okay? So now, Dr. Mohan, ke liye case lagwa. There is no capnoperative. Oh. Only. Prakurti ko bula. Out. Out. Is that okay? Another thing, we can even use post coag at a very low with a effect of one and a voltage of 38 acts like soft coag. So in Japanese technique where they don't need to change the setting repeatedly. So they, they skeletonize the vessel and they coagulate and they're using almost like a soft coag without changing the battery setting. So you're almost two centimeters below the G junction? Yeah. I think Dr. Amit. Dr. Amit. So, so how you decide the lower limit, Rajesh? So the lower Correct. limit, after the G junction, we do two to three centimeter down. Is that okay? Down three centimeters below the out. height. Out. Question is, how do you check it to transition? Um, do you take out the scope, go in the stomach, or how do you decide? So we we go to the we go to the stomach, and we'll take the U turn. Can you see here? Can you see? We are already quite deep. So this is the one way. Second, you can use the double scope technique, but I think that is cumbersome. Uh, and uh, third is you can measure the distance. The second perforator would be a good guide. Yeah, we have already crossed the second perforator. Inject. Out. Out. Post coag cutting throat. Yeah, data on this 75 to 80 percent. They find both the perforators in the posterior approach. Yeah, but we can do the myotomy. Yeah. How easy it is to go back in the tunnel once you come out? Any particular technique? Sometimes it is very difficult to go back again. No, no, it's not a problem. It's not a problem at all. You just, I will tell you the technique. You can take the reverse turn out. Amit, should we start the myotomy? Sure. So we'll start the myotomy and we'll do from here. 
is that right how many centimeters below the mucosal incision so we have gone significantly to the 35 I have tried both. Distal to proximal, you get more bleeder because you are blind. Yeah. When you are cutting the muscle, distal to proximal, I have tried IT like. Yes, lagwal hai. You are not a blind. Okay. Oh. Which you are not aware. Of. Doctor Amit, what I do in uh, come to do it less. Yeah. Okay. What I do in my practice is, I, I generally do the full thickness myotomy in the beginning. What is your advice? I do all patients full. Yeah, that is going to decrease the procedure time. Just for the beauty of the procedure, yes, you can do it. No, but this is also beautiful. Time hmm. one and two would be anything three centimeters and more than that is a waste. So now it's a we make five to six centimeter tunnels where we extend maybe. Three plus two or four plus two. Four on the esophageal side and two on the gastric side. Type three, you tailor according to the manner. So now we are doing the full thickness myotomy. Is that right? We'll actually, go to the. And so we, we go here. Beyond three centimeter on the esophageal side is not required in type one and two. In type three, you will tailor according to your manner. Yes. In type three, you always tailored. You should never do the uh, three centimeter. It will depend upon the. Length of the spastic segment. Okay, Dr. Amit. Yeah. There must be a blood vessels. Sometimes in a narrow tunnel, we face an issue that the mucosal aspect starts falling upon the muscle while doing a myotomy. What are the tips to prevent mucosal injury at that point? Especially as we go what when we question? when we are doing a myotomy yes. in patients with a uh, relatively narrow tunnel, the mucosal aspect tends to fall towards the muscle yeah, while doing should, the myotomy. The most important thing is you should make sure that your cap and your this this should not be long out if you if you are near your cap is always going to prevent the uh, fall of the above mucosa on the on the you see the mucosa you see the problem i think we have not cut i think we'll be able to do this yeah but there is a sub mucosa you see now you finish the myotomy so this is the one very important once you get the free uh, your your hand should not go very rapidly up Would a backward traction on the knife help to yes, prevent like this? this? Yes, like yes, this. yes. Like Absolutely this. true. Like so, this. sometimes what we do is, if the tunnel is not opening up while doing myotomy, you use a IT knife and start cutting from distal to proximal instead of proximal to distal. So, like this, you can pull the pull so that you the, so that that way you can release the tightness and like then this. everything starts revealing itself. So I think this is okay. No, no, no. You have to cut these fibers. This. A little bit below also. Yeah, see, yeah, yeah. Now, now go below that. Ah, uh, below, below. Ah, uh, and now cut that. Yeah. Now you cut this. I'm using the coagulation current. Yeah. So now he's almost reached the end of the tunnel. Pull back the knife now. Like this. Yeah. Like exactly. This. Okay. Okay. Sometimes what I do is at the end we use a coag grasper to cut it. But is this okay? That should be okay. I think because we are already at around thirty-seven, thirty-eight. Yeah, you're almost reaching forty. Yeah. So now you pull back and put the scope in the lumen and see whether the OG junction is wide open. Yes, this is wide open. Is this okay? Yeah, and we can retroflex it. So very nicely done, Rajesh. Can you see? Excellent, Mayat. Are we ready with the second room? Mohan is ready. Mohan starts the procedure. So we are closing, and Dr. Mohan is going to the second room. We are just applying the clip. Correct. So there was a doubt of the mucosal injury. So what if you find there is a type A injury? Yeah. I think we can very well wait. Yeah, you can need not do anything. Okay. Very nicely demonstrated. So any. Uh, so uh, now we are using the which clip? So for the conference, we are doing the Medora clip, or we can use the. I generally use in my practice the Olympus clip. Easy clip. I actually use Medora for all cases. Okay, I use the easy because clip I find I find that is a very nicely rotatable and very user friendly clip, and it approximates the tissue very well. Yeah. 
So have you faced a problem with such larger clips causing mucosal necrosis? We had a, I had a delayed leak in a case where I'd use a, uh, such a clip when uh, Medora clip. What? And there was mucosal necrosis. It was a delayed little tiny hole at the clip side. Sukrit is just giving the answer, but this is the right right side, Dr. Amit. Any 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 advice? Is this yeah. okay? So the first clip is most important. That has to be applied at the apex, just beyond okay? the cut. Is this okay? Perfect. Perfect. Close. So this is called as the sentinel clip. If you put the first clip properly, then the edges come together and then you can just apply and one after the other. I always say is a calmy sign. It raises and yeah. you can do it. So what was the question from the panel? Uh, that I have seen mucosal necrosis at the clip side using bigger clips. Probably no, 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 no. Uh, clips don't cause mucosal necrosis. There must be some other reason for the mucosal necrosis. Okay. I think it's okay. So now, while applying the clip, you have to apply suction. Okay. Very good. So we can start with the second room. So because I think we are a little bit delayed. So Mon can start. We can shift to the third case. The one which actually open up later. Huh? Are we starting the third case? Yeah, Prakurti. Please start the third case. Now, Bhagwan, what are you doing? Then cut the ball. I will make sure that uh, what should be a difference uh, distance between two clips Rajesh so there should be a complete closer you just see I think the three clips or maximum four clips is going to close the entire defect and what I am doing is so I will apply the to clip the next case, I will make the big knob away there is a 63 year old gentleman who is a known case of diabetes mellitus presented with bleeding per rectum on investigations was found to have iron deficiency anemia. The sigmoidoscopy showed a large fleshy growth of around 5 cm size, seen approximately 4 cm above the anal verge. This is the endoscopic image. This is the endoscopy image. Dr. Rawal, Dr. Praka Bhandari and Dr. Sood. Our second set of moderators, Dr. Mukesh Kalla, Dr. Radhika the Chavani. The plan is to do a Dr. piece Dr. Yogesh Yogesh Please proceed. Thank you. Take over. Two ninety series CFH two ninety ECI, which is an endocytoscope, which magnify the image uh, more than five hundred times. And uh, I'm using a cap. Can we switch off this? So I'm using this X1 scope, which has got many functions. So this X1 platform, we can attach 290 series, 190 series in this. And there are many functions over there. You can have white light imaging with uh, advanced features, which we'll talk about. We have narrowband imaging with more brightness. We have red dichromatic imaging that is to, so NBI is for superficial vessels. When we are uh, doubting a, a lesion, which is early cancer, you want to see uh, neovascularization, you switch to NBI. And then we have a red dichromatic imaging, which has got many modes. Red dichromatic imaging has got two major modes where we uh, especially once we are doing POEM or say, for example, ESD, it is very useful because that allows us to see deep, big vessels. I'll show you. So that is red dichromatic imaging. 
and also the TXI mode. The TXI is new white light with enhanced surface pattern and also the brightness can be imaged. So now I'm using a, a scope. This is the uh, scope with a liver over there. You can see a liver over here. So you can have a gradual magnification. And then I'm using a black cap here. There is a black cap and on the scope, you see there is a lens. So on the lens side, since the magnification endoscopy or endocytoscopy is a touch technique. In, in NBI, you have to remain around five millimeters away from the lesion. And then you do a, a dual focus. But here, you have to touch the scope with the, with the lens. And that is why I'm using a cap, which is protruding from the diametrically opposite end where the lens is not there. So I, I will allow the lens to touch to the lesion, but this cap gives me a more fixity. So the aim of this cap is not to allow the light to disperse, to allow the fixity, but I have attached the cap in such a way it's in slanting position. It's protruding on the top and on the lens side, I am pushing it down so it's like in a slanting position. It's not like a vertical position. So now let's go and see what is there. Okay. Light. Okay. So the endocytoscopy can be done in two methods. One is either by NBI or by, okay. TXI, we call it. Yeah. CO2? CO2. Anybody done the uh, now you can see that the, there is a polyp over there. That is the polyp. And then we are going beyond the polyp. So it's a quite a distal polyp, quite a big polyp. Very clearly villiform structures. Yeah. It's a villous kind of lesion. Uh, and then uh, we go and do retroflexion to see. Like this. And you can see that's quite a big polyp there. So this is the white light uh, observation of the polyp. This polyp is not flat. This is a uh, sessile uh, laterally spreading tumor. So I'll say it is a one S variety. And then you can have a narrow band imaging to see, you can see very nice uh, uh, villiform structures. And then we'll, we'll do the NBI to check. And you can see here, these are, and I'll zoom here and you can see more zoomed structure. You can see very nice. Very regular fine vessels. Yeah. So it's a low grade dysplasia. Yeah, like genet type 2A. So Paris 1S, genet type 2A. And then you can do a, a magnification endoscopy can somebody hold the scope here? Here, just, just hold. Okay, and then I will zoom it and you can see the vessels over there. So these vessels can be, can be picked up by the artificial intelligence in, which is incorporated in the, in the, uh, in the scope. So it will first of all go and take a very good image from the 
here and then i will zoom here like this and you can see these are the vessels and we'll ask our uh, you can see here uh, is the artificial intelligence enabled here nbi no, 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 not they don't have so that idea. that we have to check because if you do uh, endocytoscopy with artificial nbi narrow band imaging picks up vessels so it will not pick up the nucleus so before you stain you can have a narrow band imaging magnification and then artificial intelligence will help you in diagnosing these vessels into neoplastic versus non neoplastic this is more of a villous tumor uh, so now we'll do a uh, uh, staining with methylene blue and see how the nucleus are looking like yeah dr ram can you highlight how uh, how all these modes will help in performing esd pardon how how all these modes will help us in performing esd what decision making we can make endocytoscopy and yes so so this is as dr uh, Naresh has said this is a low grade dysplasia so it's it's still manageable by esd so there are no deeper invasion we are not seeing any nbi classification of genet type 3 even genet type 2 is not there so 2B. that your 2b is 2B, not there 2b is not there so, so i think with a lot of confidence you can say that this is a superficial lesion and any Uh, endoscopic resection should give you an R zero kind of uh, clearance, and you can see nice margins over there, and you can zoom and see whether there are any invasion. So I can't see anything. So narrow band imaging has not shown. So narrow band imaging, the classification is genet type two A, and uh, Paris classification is one S. so this uh, lesion i feel is amenable for esd best because you have to remove this tumor and block if you remove this tumor and block your pathologist will be in a better position to rule out any cancers and also to give us negative margins the second thing which we need to see is in white light or endocytoscopy what is other finding or what else we can do uh, by seeing the real time histopathology so there are many classifications available uh, for endocytoscopy classification so we'll see are you ready how the endocytoscopy is looking like and we'll stain this first of all so we'll stain this with methylene blue we have methylene blue please I, I, i think more the other thing that we need to emphasize when you have a lesion like this is to look at the entire polyp yeah because one area may be showing to yes. a so another area may be showing to b or exactly, 3 exactly exactly so, so that is why bone has gone all around and try to show you the structure of the polyp so you can see here here also we are seeing 2a so that's a huge polyp but there are no areas where we are seeing any deep invasive cancers it is ready with us stain okay so we'll stain yeah uh, dr mohan yes you will supplement this cytoscopy with uh, uh, mri and uh, radial us high frequency radial us before uh, contemplating the procedure yeah that uh, because uh, the image enhanced endoscopy is quite sensitive uh we may not require if there are some uh, indication on image enhanced endoscopy uh, which shows deeper infiltration then uh, before going ahead with the, the uh, because this is very distally and may require apr i will definitely do eus and mri to see if we can remove this tumor uh, with endoscopy or not uh, because if there are some indication on uh say for example on uh, nbi or endocytoscopy showing it's a deeper invasion 
So I'm using methylene blue to stain this, and this stain will be kept for at least a minute till the. So this is, as Dr. Butt said, it's a very large tumor. So I'm using this endocytoscopy to areas which I feel they may have some deeper invasion. So we'll inject more. So this is good for endocytoscopy for smaller lesions, but for this big lesion, it will be almost impossible to study each microscopic area. We can have a rough estimate that, okay, we are not dealing with invasive malignancy and let us do ESD. And once we do ESD, we will have a full N block resection uh, specimen available for uh, study. So I think in this case, uh, for me to make a decision about ESD is enough by doing uh, uh, NBI. I don't find any area of deep invasion, but for demonstration, I will do the endocytoscopy. I think with whatever we have, I think with more than 97% confidence, yeah. you can say that this is Inject. just low grade, maximum some Inject. high grade dysplasia. Uh -huh. But certainly no cancer that we are seeing. Uh -huh. So, uh, just... sir, where do you feel this endocytoscopy will have role in future? Yes, in smaller lesions, yes, it may have. When you have to take those critical, when you have borderline cases, I guess it becomes very important. So, I'll wait for one minute. So, we can go to the some of the very flat place to see what is happening, either whether staining is adequate or not. Not yet. I want more spray. Somebody can. This is very light. This is. End. Oh, oh, this. Where is Sandeep? Give it more full concentration, no dilution. This is not submucosal invasion. In, injection we have to spray on top it should be very dark full concentration full methylene blue <clears throat> this is full dark full full oh. Yeah, now it's slightly better, but still I feel it's diluted. It's more diluted. I don't want dilutation. So staining is important. Okay. Stop. So I would have taken a good small polyp for nice demonstration, but here I think uh, because of total villus uh, adenoma, it's quite classical of total villus adenoma. We'll see how it looks like on endocytoscopy. You can see here there are some nucleus is seen, but still not good staining. The staining is very important. So full concentration of methylene blue has to be taken. No dilution. No. Do you have full concentrated methylene blue? Uh, don't. Full dilute. 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 Maybe your other case is smaller. Yeah. You may be able, the first case yeah. that you may be, they may be able to show. The first case is two. Okay, now we'll, we are touching the scope and now we are zooming in. Again, I am seeing only vessels. There are no staining of the nucleus. The, yeah, we have to wait. For 
So that that is the issue here. We have to well, wait. That's for... the reason they have the. Uh, I mean, uh, the you can see the the no, nice normal the nucleus system. there. This fact, is the normal area. Detective, this uh, is we normal always area. Always get a proper uh, staging so, because so, now. So the you, you can see the here on the right side. The significant role of new adjuvant chemotherapy before subjecting them for surgery. So, so now you can see a normal area. The proper staging Dr. with the MRI and radial US is required. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, please. So, Dr. Kalla, we can see this normal round nuclei. I am focusing on the normal, normal colonic mucosa. You have to see two things. One are the nuclei, which are blue round nuclei. And then there it's is... A not very thing. clear here, no? In, in the hall, at least. Not clear? No. So, I think the picture are very clear here. And we are seeing two things. One is the shape of the nucleus and shape of the orifice. Can you point out? Uh, this is the or or crypt orifice, which is round. And these are the serrated crypt orifice. So these two are benign. And these are blue nucleus. So as the lesion becomes more advanced, this nuclei from the round, they take fusiform elongated shape and this orifice become more irregular. So this is how we diagnose based on, this is known as EC classification. EC is one, one means nuclei are round and the orifice, script orifice are either round or slit-like. But as the lesion becomes more advanced, it becomes, uh, the slit-like opening becomes more irregular and in adenoma, you will find the nucleus more. Uh, I'll try to show if the staining has happened. Uh, again, going back to one of this, this is the most well-stained area. Again, you can see this is the slit-like opening. So that was the most important point to be noted. You have to see not only the nucleus, but also the crypt opening. It depends on the concentration of the methylene blue. Unfortunately, uh, that is not taken up. And this lesion is not an ideal one for this because this is a villiform uh, tumor and we may not have a normal crypt openings here. This is quite classical. This is not the indication of endocytoscopy. You can see now very nice round nucleus and crypt opening. So this crypt opening is slit-like. The nucleus are round. So it's quite a benign disease. So this is a benign uh, low-grade dysplasia tumor, which will be easily resected endoscopically. There are no irregularity in the crypt opening. There are no irregularity in the nucleus. Dr. Bhatt? Yeah, I agree with you. That is only substantiating what we are seeing yeah. on uh, yeah. white light and NBI. Yes. So we'll go ahead with the therapeutic procedure now. I'll just change the scope to more uh, a thinner scope, 190 series. Would you use a gastroscope? Yeah, therapeutic gastroscope. gastroscope. Yes. Can we get uh, a therapeutic sir? gastroscope? Sir, can you hear us? Yes. Yeah, very nice demonstration, sir. Yeah. Uh, in the beginning, you told about the about the R D I modes. R D I R D I red dichromatic imaging. Yes. Yeah. So uh, Radhika, you can see here N B I. What it tells us is superficial vessels. You can see these are the dark blue, and see that this is the brown vessels are superficial vessels, while the cyan color, the green vessels are deeper vessels, uh -huh. and and as you see on the RDI, you will only see the deeper vessels. You can see if I have, if I'm doing a poem, I shift to RDI and I will not inject here because as soon as I inject here, there will be a massive bleeding or for a beginner, it will be, it will be like, a, a, you know, irritating bleeding. So you will not feel good. So if you use RDI, try to see a most avascular zone like here and you can inject. Oh. Okay, so okay, so this is RDI, yes, and this is NBI. Difference between them is 
how you superficial vessels nbi deep vessel rdi mon the size of the scope is same as 190 hq or it's uh, it's same. bigger scope it's same it's same as this is 290 series scope uh, with endocytoscopy there is additional liver for zooming otherwise it is all same and i i used brown cap as i evaluated so now we'll go to the another room and come back once we are ready with the therapeutic procedure क्या नहीं है ठीक है ये माइक लो ना मेरे वाला भी तो चल लगाओ लगाओ पहले ना ना करो तू पॉलीपैक्टमी तो करो ना तू पॉलीपैक्टमी करने में भी घंटा लगे हाँ इसको जितना कर सकते हो फिर रूम चेंज करते हैं आधा घंटे में जिससे डेढ़ घंटा ये करेगा आधा घंटे में जितनी पॉलीपैक्टमी दिखा सकते हो दिखाओ डिग्री दूसरा केस रखा हुआ फंस जाएंगे ना तो डॉक्टर राजेश राजेश so in the meantime till i mean the house has got stuck there so we are not able to communicate and the poem was done pretty well by dr rajesh puri so there were certain things i wanted to add for those people who have just started poem and no they can't hear me no they still with the uh... on oh, Hi there, sir. Okay. You are on screen. Thank you, sir. Over to you, sir. Is somebody listening to us there? Ready, ready. Sir, you're ready. I'm ready. Okay. Yeah, yeah Madhav, sir. You're you're on screen, sir. Oh, I'm on screen. I thought you all were talking something. Yeah. Okay. So, we, so I think by the time uh, the I mean anesthetist gives us the case ready. Hmm. so i mean uh, rajesh had uh, demonstrated poem procedure very well so there were certain things uh, prior to uh, starting the procedure like uh, how to place the cap and uh, how to uh, arrange the uh, co2 insufflation etc to reduce the risk for uh, capnoperitoneum and mediastinum can you please explain us in detail about that sir i think there is a lag in the there is a lag in communication so i'll just take over for that i mean there are certain techniques and there are certain co2 insufflators which are available for controlling the co2 insufflation the uh, our uh, uh, the uh, olympus uh, co2 insufflator doesn't provide us that there are other companies which have mild low and high flows but the small techniques very other people have used is to place a wire knob to let the co2 go leak and if you are using a co2 insufflator you can just unscrew the connection point then when you are applying the covering uh, the uh, tip the cap it has to be a little slanting and you should uh, push the water jet it shouldn't go and strike the cap it should go straight therefore if you place it uh, snugly in then it would hit the wall of the cap here you have to place it little lateral then there is a hole which is made on this cap this hole has to come right opposite to the nozzle there are three small th uh, things we have to be careful about using it as for the uh, electrosurgical probes post coag spray coag soft coag are three modes which most of us are using for doing poem procedure 
So soft quag you use when you have uh -huh. a bigger vessel, coarse quag you use when you have a smaller vessel, and the spray coil uh -huh. is what is this? Using for tunneling. Oh, what? Flushing. Nice. Uh, Doctor Mahadev sir. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I mean the screen is yours sir. We can see the scope in. Okay. Now see, this is a patient of a, a residual Zenker's diverticulum. Now, all of us know that uh, Zenker's diverticulum uh, is nowadays being treated by endoscopy. Traditionally, Zenker's diverticulum, all of you know, is a pseudo diverticulum which arises uh, because of a weakness at the Killian's triangle, which is between the cricopharyngeus and thyropharyngeus muscle of the pharynx. And uh, in this case, the traditional treatment used to be surgery by two ways either a surgical verticulectomy or by using a rigid esophagoscope, they used to do, do a septectomy. But in spite of surgical treatment being uh, very good as far as the efficacy is concerned, it was shown to be associated with a lot of adverse events. For example, mediastinitis and leakage and various issues were there, especially diverticulectomy type of procedures. So endoscopists were always trying to find out a method. And for last two decades or three decades, there was a very simple way of endoscopic treatment where I used to place a Ryles tube. Now see here, when I put the scope inside, uh, you can clearly see why the Zenker's diverticulum causes symptoms. You see on the left side is the diverticulum and the right side, the esophageal inlet is actually compromised. Why? Because of the septum. Now on top of that, when food goes inside the diverticulum, this further gets compromised. And that is the reason why patient has dysphagia. So what endoscopies used to do is to be used to leave a rice tube in the esophagus or we used to use a very nice over tube called diverticuloscope, which was manufactured, which was invented by Jack Devier from Brussels, by which it used to protect the esophageal side, the diverticulum side, and the septum used to jut out in between the diverticuloscope. And then just by using a needle knife, used to just cut the septum. And that's what we have been doing for 15, 20 years. Few years back, after POEM got established as a procedure, Pingong Zhu uh, invented or described the submucosal tunneling septotomy. Why? Because whenever we used to do a complete direct septotomy, even though the procedure was very easy to do, and most of the times nothing used to happen, but they were showed in some studies that there was a recurrence. Why? Because when you do a direct septotomy, we always get scared to cut right till the base. We leave a little bit of the septum and that used to cause symptoms. And if by mistake or if by a little bit enthusiasm, you cut too much at the base, direct septotomy, it used to cause a leak in the pharynx. And that was the reason Ping Wangzhu described the submucosal tunneling septotomy, where he showed that you pull the scope back and somewhere over here, two, three centimeters proximal to the septum, you create a submucosal cushion enter into the submucosal space and keep on dissecting in the submucosa until you come to the, the septum muscles. And the septum muscles are cut from inside through the submucosal tunnel. Now, the idea of this was you will not create a perforation and you can do a complete septotomy. So now actually what happened, I'll tell you. Uh, a simple procedure became complicated. And endoscopist felt that this is the answer. So all of us started doing this. In fact, we published our data on 25 patients of doing submucosal tunneling septotomy, out of which 20 patients were Zenkers, 5 patients were epiphrenic diverticuli in the esophagus. But in almost 70% of these patients, even though we had cut the, cut the septum completely from inside, we realized that these patients came back with some residual dysphagia. And then when we saw, we realized that that was because that even though the muscle was cut inside, the mucosal ledge persisted. Because the mucosa we are not cutting. And that mucosal ledge continued to give a little bit of dysphagia. So in almost all these patients where we had done ZPOM, we had to call them later after a few months and cut that mucosal ledge independently. Of course, it was dangerous. That never caused a leakage because there was already fibrosis at the lower end. So now today, I'm going to show you a further modified technique of ZPOM, uh, which is called as POES, that is peroral endoscopic uh, septal section, you see a P, endoscopic septotomy. Now, this was described by Alexandro Repici just last year, because 
the z poem the traditional z poem is a cumbersome technique trying to do a tunnel in the pharynx is not easy that's a very vascular area and if you start going in by making a tunnel invariably ah uske upar hai and we are likely to miss the septum so i am going to do now is i am going to show you the modified technique of z poem which is called poes where which was described by repichi now here of course fortunately for us the septum is not very big but it is causing a little diverticulum one of the methods i could have done is i would have cut this remaining tissue directly by using a needle knife but i just want to show you this technique let's see whether it is possible because this patient has already undergone a direct septotomy so in case i find that there is a lot of fibrosis then i'll not continue by doing this procedure because for this also i need to create a little bit of a a tunneling नीडल आउट नीडल बैक I need to go on the septum. He is not going on the septum. Hmm. दोनों तरफ से तो देर इज अ पॉसिबिलिटी दैट बिकॉज इफ यू सी द म्यूकोजा इज अटल बिट इनफ्लेम हियर एंड इन केस a small submucosal cushioning is not possible and i may have to do a direct septotomy here why because this patient has already undergone a direct tunneling direct cutting so what i'm going to do is somewhere over here sir if we see the new uh, mucosal classification it falls into eia3 yeah can you see that what i'm doing are you are you yes, are you making a comment yes yes okay yeah sir we can see it quite clearly sir so now i am not dissecting or making a tunnel proximal to the septum i am trying to make a tunnel on the septum itself and then dissect by the side of the muscle and then from inside cut the muscle like digging a well okay give out right knife out. out let's see whether this is possible oh, nba no hey, nba ka uh, i didn't press anything there no submucosal tunneling okay okay what is that what that name cut kare I think and it doesn't go up go on no the issue here is that the patient has already undergone a previous surgery hold the scope please hold the scope yeah, yeah. one minute huh? yeah you can shift माइदेव सर यस वॉट आर द इलेक्ट्रो कॉटरी सेटिंग आर यू यूजिंग एंडोकट टू थ्री थ्री एंडोकट टू थ्री थ्री and we using precise set uh, hold here hold here 55 watts along with endocut 233 okay, okay 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 
the next case is 73 year old male the next case is a 73 year old male who presented to us with bleeding per rectum since one month on in can we have some more time in the dr medev's hall because that's a new technique which he is demonstrating Are we audible in the endoscopy room that side? Was uh, poem for poem electrosurgical settings. I mean, Which we've been machine, yeah. We are using Vio3 Urbi machine and uh, over a period of time we have been discussing and uh, experimenting with various modes but finally we have zeroed down on spray for making a tunnel, endocurt so for, uh, endocurt for uh, creating the entry access. And so you can see here I am taking this. Yes. Yes, Mohan. Yeah, you can see now. So we are making an incision there. So that is the beginning of the incision and then I will just turn to my... So Mohan, you can just tell us what you have used to inject. Uh, Do you prefer saline or you prefer gelofuzin or some viscous solution? So, uh, I usually prefer uh, saline here, but uh, for a beginner I will say that uh, gelofusion is also a good option. Do you do marking before making an incision? For colonic, the marking is not required. You can see now we have made a nice incision there. So we'll make a flap. Now do a trimming. You can see I'm using a force coagulation. Just below the mucosal flap. So idea is to do hybrid APC not to do complete, uh, sorry, hybrid ESG again, again, I'm saying APC because <laughs> you can see now, this is the uh, retroflexed uh, scope. And I have with me uh, 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 expert in ESG, I'll inject here, Dr. Amol, inject. So you can see now we are we have made an incision. So uh, this is the incision. We'll make a circumferential incision and then we'll uh, do a snare polypectomy. To, that is known as uh, hybrid ESD. And that enables us to do more uh, R0 resections, quick procedure, especially those patients who are sick. We prefer to do hybrid ESD rather than the, the conventional ESD. So, Mohan, will you attempt for a plan for a N block resection here, or would you, uh, so you look can, at a, you know, a piecemeal? Uh, because the size this, of the lesion is a little bit on the larger, larger side. side. So, that's why I don't think uh, uh, complete. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, the other thing is, uh, would you prefer to do a um, uh, circumferential because the fluid sometimes dissipates too rapidly yeah that amol here I'm... idea is to do hybrid esd not yes. complete esd so once i'm Actually, doing esd i don't do circumferential incision i do a oral incision like this make a flap and then make i expose the muscle right and then i come back from the opposite end and come out of this tunnel so once you come out of this tunnel then you can go and do the Lateral. Uh, lateral. That is a muscle that we can see now. So no. no, no, I'm just doing the circumference here. Yeah, yeah, you can. We'll just shift to the next room and we'll come back after Mohan has completed the circumferential incision. Inject. 
very good so dr amol the plan is to do a hybrid esd for this yeah, patient no, circumferential incision followed by that i think I'm online yes uh, madhav sir you are online sir so can you see mukesh what i have done gosh. Yeah, I can see, sir. You created a submucosal uh, uh, probably the injection, and, and in the center is the muscle. Yeah, and but what I'm doing is by the side of the muscle. Now I'm trying to make a area. See here, sir. Right. Not so. Inject here. Oh. Can you see that? So now yes. you can see the muscle inside. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Hi, Paul. Sir, you will be creating tunnel on either sides. Yes. Yes. You see now, this is the muscle. We are sitting on the muscle, and now through this, I am going to start cutting the muscle. And for this, I am using a dual knife. This side set. This side set. Fifty odd. So, sir, should I say that there is no tunneling into this? It's only injection and dissecting uh, along the yeah. side of the muscle. The tunneling is by the side of the septum. Yeah, we will not enter inside the, the scope uh, with the, right. the scope. The tunneling is not like the Z poem. Z poem. Not like the Z. Not like the Z poem. Kutla? No, no, no. You have to go by the side. You know. Yes. In that yes, area. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Because in uh, Z poem, you need yeah, to like start from the post recoiled area. Ah, very difficult. Yeah, yeah. And then closer is also quite difficult. Exactly. This is a modification, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So and they, it they easy because are you not what I've done now. A tunnel. On they on are the going to work side. from the outside only. They mm -hmm. only do a ledging along both the sides of the muscle. But they are doing just because mutation underwent already. Yeah. No. 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 This patient probably had a septotomy earlier. Also, yeah, yeah. Mm. Mm. New case also we can do. Yes. So I'm going to go inside mm -hmm. this. Sir, this, uh, I mean, the technique stands good for a uh, nave patient for uh, Zinkers also? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But here, actually, because this patient has been done before, that's why you are finding little difficulty to find the plane. Otherwise, it's very I easy. And if it is not a Zenkers or Kiliamson, then also the technique stays the same, sir. Which one? Which pain? Epiphrenic. Epiphrenic, no. For epiphrenic, we'll have to do a submucosal tunneling technique. Why? Because epiphrenic diverticulum, in case. Yeah. yeah. You got it? Yeah. Okay. Now you are seeing what I'm what I'm doing. But it's like a going inside a tunneling in between in direct inside. What is the end point while you are cutting the muscles? What were you saying? So what is the end point when you are cutting the septum huh? or the muscle? End point is until it reaches the esophagus, esophagus wall. Either side. So there is a okay. Yeah, now we'll cut yeah, this one. There is a question in the house that uh, you think this technique is uh, difficult or Z poem is more difficult? No, no, Z poem is definitely more difficult. This poem is this, this technique is not at all difficult. Here you are finding little difficulty because of the previous procedure. Fibrosis. A little bit of fibrosis, little vascularity. Otherwise, it will be very fast. No, the, the problem in this particular case is because uh, there was a septotomy done on this patient earlier. Yeah, already a septotomy was done. So this is a recurrence. 
so the house wants to know that uh, i mean can you uh, give us some more details about uh, difference between z poem and this procedure yeah i'll just tell oh, you yeah, huh? first let me finish this let me do a complete septotum here and once we have done that <coughs> yeah okay inject here wait huh? let me go out first wait wait first let me go between this muscle and the yeah inject here yeah okay nice new patient is a post procedure patient giving unfair to the technique so because it's a uh, i mean fibrosis is too much there so we are not being fair to the procedure so i mean we need to see this procedure happening in a naves anchors diabetic inject here okay back knife out मसल नहीं कंप्लीट सरकमशियल इंसिजन Yeah, now he is going to under the lesion now. Right. Now he is going to use a snare and Correct. then try and uh, you know get it out in maybe a few so pieces, any, as few pieces as possible. Yeah. Amol, any preference for doing a hybrid? Why not to complete it okay. straight with the ESD? Ah, uh, see, this patient has some comorbidities, so that is the reason it has to be a slightly quicker procedure, and the lesion is. No, yeah, basically, genet two A, so it's the lower risk carcinoma. Open, so open, open. It should not be a problem to do a piece open, meal. Open. If it was a high grade adenoma, then probably suction, suction, suction. It would have not have been oncologically suction. correct to do a piece meal. Close. But here, it's it's not a problem. Uh, Amol sir, our uh, Mohan sir is using five centimeter snare. What is the size of snare here? I think is this is a three or three point five centimeter snare. I think so. Let me just check. 3.5 okay even we we get 5.5 cm so we can use uh, for such kind of lesion for one thing if just by using a large snare that does not mean that you know you open. will be able to get a larger bite open open also if you notice this lesion is on the fold so if you take a large bite there is a risk that you might catch the fold and that can lead to a muscle injury so Okay. I would prefer to use a medium size snare rather than you know as Mohan is using, rather than use a very large snare because there is a risk of uh, muscle injury. Right, yeah. Mohan? Yeah, yeah. So once you are started, so from one angle to other, I do open. Uh, Doctor Amol, I mean, any preference on type of snares we should use for uh, hybrid versus a standard stock polypectomy? Usually, you need snares which are which listen to you. That is what. Huh. And so, you know, some of the snares are too floppy, and then you can't press them down on the lesion. So you need snares which are a little bit stiff. so that you can press down onto the lesion open. and ensnare the lesion open yeah monofilament sometimes can become too stiff that also is a problem so this is an n phase lesion so a monofilament may not Close. actually get that no, no. bend also and no. that can be a problem no this is small sir so well, what are the tips and tricks to avoid deep injury while doing hybrid emr Uh, if you catch a big chunk of uh, tissue is there all, uh, one has to do a very good injection though we are now using more a cold snare also which does not require and or under water so in those two situations you may avoid 
doing uh, uh, some mucosal injection, but let me suck and then suction. Yeah, suction. Let suction happen, and then once suction that collapses, I'll ask him to close. Close. There's some. Okay. So I'll now expand and see. So then we'll cut. No. Yeah, yeah. So we'll keep on working on this. You can see now a big chunk over there open. Yeah. Now I'll catch this, catch this, and catch this whole whole area like this. End of the cell. All, all almost has come. So I'll just jiggle to remove any muscle from behind and cut it. It's a problem. Which one? Still foam. The micro is. Are you getting the endo, Mukesh? Uh, Amol. Uh, Mohan, are you, are you guys listening to us? I don't know, Doctor Medhiv. Okay. Can you get the endoscopy? Yeah, we can see the endoscopy images, and we can see the most of the septum is gone. Yeah, so now this is the remaining part just there, which I'm going to finish that also. So actually, it's very difficult to decide where to stop when you are doing this procedure because you start cutting the esophageal wall also then. So this is like going deeper and deeper and deeper because this was as it is not a very long septum. So I think this should be sufficient, huh? This should make the patient asymptomatic. So this is actually a easier way of doing it. I'll tell you what. Here, what? Now we have made the opening directly on the septum. Here. But in Z poem, classic Z poem, you have to make the opening behind here in the pharynx. And after doing that opening, when you go inside, sometimes what happens? Number one, you can find a lot of blood vessels. And number two, when you go in, you may tend to miss the septum. Either your scope goes towards the left, towards the pharynx, the diverticulum, or it may go to. And with that, this patient will become asymptomatic. However, if the mucosal ledge continues to give some trouble, then afterwards we can go in and cut the mucosal ledge. So now we will close this. If you want, you can go to that uh, other procedure. So, I mean, sir, before we go to other procedure, can you explain this procedure we service uh, Z poem? What? Now, because we are going to uh, have a clip closer of the incision ah. site. Yeah. So even if we end up uh, doing some amount of, if they, even if there is some perforation, we are still safe, right, sir? Yeah, that will be all closed. Esophagus lumen is open. You see the esophagus lumen is open on the right side? Yes, yes sir. sir. Ah. <clears throat> Just flip side, really. And we'll need a little long clips here. Yes, yes. In this, we are not making a submucosal tunnel. Normally, in Z poem, we are going to make a four, three, four centimeter mucosal tunnel. The scope is going to go inside the tunnel. Then it goes on both the sides of the uh, ledge. And then you go and cut open the muscle. And you come out and you place clips in the post recoid area. Now, what sir has done that he has opened right. the septum only. He went both sides in. The scope didn't go. He was standing outside. Only the TTG knife or whichever accessory he was using was dissecting. So he bared it open the muscle and then he has cut open the muscle. Now, even if he cuts open the muscle, more than required if there is a perforation, but then again we have the mucosa closer which will work as a Barrier to complete perforation. Yeah. Yeah, I know that. I am talking already. We have already started closing the mucosal incision. This is entry point and myotomy and closer. 
One year, one year. Okay. No. Yeah. Is this is the septum, and uh, he has pushed in lot of uh, saline, methylene blue saline both sides. So there is a cushion this side, there is a cushion this side. So he is buried it open. I mean, done that, only the muscle was standing. And mucosa this side and mucosa this side. And the submucosal area has already already been cut open. Now what he did, he just removed the muscle. It will be flat. But you have the muscle still, you will just close it. Now what he's doing now. So, so even if he, I mean, by chance, even if he goes deeper and if he perforates, this closer will give us a barrier for full thickness perforation. And when they're doing a septotomy, when you are doing a septotomy, short you can still short, do it. Short clips, no? But then there is always a risk because you cannot place a clip at the end of it then. So residual what happens, I'll tell you what. These clips are a little long. Septotomy, they will be there. I can catch better tissue. So within three clips, everything is over. If you put short, you'll have put multiple. Thank you, moderators, Dr. Kalla, Dr. Chavan, and Dr. Harwani. I now welcome our third set of moderators, Dr. Rinkesh, Dr. Shesht Mehta, Dr. Chalapati, and Dr. Kapil Sharma. Uh -huh. Thank you, Dr. I think they have already shifted. But I can show them. I'm still online. I'm still online. Yes, sir. Sure. You're still online. They just turned behind. So Lumen is open now. You are online, sir. Yeah, so what I'm going to say is now after doing this, now you can see that the lumen is open and my scope is easily going inside the esophagus. So when I began the procedure, you, you, you could see that it was a slit. The esophageal lumen could not be entered so easily. And see, this is what is left of the diverticulum now. The septum's, septum is completely cut. This one clip has rotated on the other side, but it will be okay. It will turn back. I can put one more clip. I can put one more clip just to be on safer side. Any clip is okay. okay. And later, if required. Okay. Huh? Hmm. Okay. Apply. Yeah, now it is done. The procedure is done. So, this is the modified procedure called pose. Yes, yes, sir. 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 Yes, Yes, sir. 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 Yes, no problem. So I am uh, in between. There was a big uh, chunk which came, but it has left uh, some muscular defect, though we are not seeing the peritoneum. So what we are planning to do is we are just completing this resection like this. Close. So you can see over here on the right side and around five o'clock. So now it's completely done. And we'll remove this first open and we'll just clip it off. Yeah. Open. Close. Flush. Mm -hmm. 
This is a small tiny fragment. Open. Close. No, open. Are you guys seeing? Yes, we can see. Yeah. Oh, you are going to close this defect. That's what. That we'll do that. So that's a part and parcel of this type of procedures. So now we are done with this. Yes. Plus, plus. Yeah. Plus. And this is the target sign that you can see. Actually, can you see the white edge over there, which is the muscle defect? Yes. Yes. So that is called the target sign. And on the specimen, so you can see the reverse target sign. So we are. Yeah. So we'll now we'll close this. Okay. Can I have the clips, please? What clips are you going to use? Are you going to use larger clips? Yeah, larger clips. So you can see now the specimen is completely gone, but there is a small defect there which can be easily closed. So I'm using this Medora clips, which are made in India. So you prefer to clip at the widest part of the clip? No, like a zipper, a zipper, like uh, we do in poem. So, are you going to treat the edges also? Uh, the evolution, yes, of course, we'll do that. Soft coagulation, open. Yes. Yeah, so now next five minutes we have to close as. He... Are there some residual uh, islands of tissue there? I think they are more at two o'clock. It's, they are resected, but they are just stuck over Touching, there. Touching, yeah. So that that's okay. not they're they're not in. actually you know unresected specimen. It's more of. Okay. Uh, so I'll start from here. So we start from some. Yeah, like this. Yeah. Close. Yeah. Apply. 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 So this is the first clip which has approximated that area now. So now it's very easy for us to close. Now you can see that with the first clip that Mohan has applied, the edges have come together. So subsequent clips become easier to apply. And this is still at around 10, 15 centimeters. So we are above the peritoneal fold, but we have not gone into the peritoneal cavity. The patient's abdomen is soft. I can see over here I'm palpating. Open. So there is nothing. Hey, Gunshoda, sir. What would you have done if you are treating this test rather than putting a needle? Anything different? Uh, no. I think we are using carbon dioxide. So that is going to settle down very easily. Hey, so I'll catch. Pakra. So I'll suck here. Suck. 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 Close. Close. Yes. Very good. Apply. Yeah. Very, very nice. nice. Yeah. So now with this close, we are almost closed. Yeah. Yeah. Though we will need one in between. Yeah. So I'll remove this clip by this cap. And we'll apply here. Why not we close this whole defect by endo loop? Endo loop can be used, but this this defect was not really very big. And uh, as you can see, it uh, we have been able to close it with clips. So using an endo loop and clip. Is a little bit more time consuming also. So I'm just using my cap to know the perfect place where I have to apply. So that is the place where we have to apply between this clip and that clip. Open. So I'll just try to remove this like this. So ideally, okay, so I'm okay here. One of the issues with, you know, some of these larger clips is that the tails are very long. Yeah. 
and that space. makes you need more space you need sometimes clips with shorter let me takes. suck let me suck apply yeah apply hmm. now you can see major kuch ye nahi hai may be one or two small areas but there is no major bleeding usko bahar nikal lete hain pieces ko apply so you can see now this right. is all closed this is all closed now you can apply any any number of clips but i think these three clips are what are is actually holding together mm-hmm. you don't need multiple clips to actually do the same job water so that's a water see that 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 was the tissue which was like just hanging there yeah i think radhika was asking that question right radhika you can see that you were not lying <laughs> so we had taken out that tissue right <laughs> yeah okay so i'll apply one more yeah what are the specification of these clip these clip from button these clip from which company or what yes, what is the style of medora, medora. Actually, you know, what we prefer to use is sometimes we use longer clips at the edges and once the edges have been approximated we use smaller olympus clips basically because you don't need that wide and also the tails of the olympus clips are shorter so you can apply okay. them more effectively but of course you no, need the longer no, bus, clips bus. to in order to no no approximate wapas the... wapas karo rotate ulta karo wapas off spin karo off spin <laughs> off spin that's a good next spin off spin that is the right yeah. apply ah <laughs> okay blocked you can see here that was that's the end so huh? moving on to our next case moving on to our next case now we have a 53 year old gentleman who presented to us with epigastric discomforts in 6 months endoscopy showed a sessile polyp of about 1 into 1.5 cm along the lesser curvature another sessile polyp of around 1 cm was noted and two other nodules biopsy was suggestive of neuroendocrine tumor grade 1 this is the endoscopic image we are planning an eftr are we audible o- over to dr zahir so yeah. dr zahir and dr zahir is going to show the fdrd i think he is the first person in the india who has done the upper gi fdrd we have done lower gi but upper gi is done by him so i will request him to show about the device till the accessories are getting aligned so you can talk about that sure sure hi uh, good evening everybody uh, i hope i am audible yeah zahir audible so uh, first will uh, like to show you the device uh, which is a dedicated uh, device for uh, upper gi lesions maybe they are uh, epithelial or sub epithelial lesions so if you see uh, this upper gi ftrd device this is also called gastroduodenal ftrd device and uh, this is the complete set uh, and it's also from ovesco uh, the difference between this and colonic uh, uh, full thickness resection device is uh, first the diameter the diameter of this uh, device the outer diameter is 19.5 mm as compared to the colonic device which is uh, 21 mm so that is the reason that uh, uh, it was really difficult to push the colonic uh, ftr device through the crico pharynx it was very difficult so ovesco has come up with uh, upper gi uh, dedicated upper gi device and uh, it has a complete set if you see here it has uh, uh, the marking ftr marking probe if you see so uh, the first step in resecting the lesion is you mark the lesions the circumferentially with this ftr probe you can use the setting of force coag effect of 1 and uh, uh, watts of 20 so the second is you have a dedicated balloon with the device because often what happens is if the lesion is in duodenum uh, it's mandatory that you dilate the pyro- pyloric channel first and uh, to insert across the crico pharynx also you sometimes need a balloon so what we usually do is if the patient is well built we go straight away with the device over the wire if the patient is thin or if we are not uh, uh, successful in negotiating the device across the crico pharynx 
we use the balloon now how to use the balloon we inflate the balloon so half of the balloon is inside the cap ftr cap and half of the balloon is outside across the cricopharynx and uh, together as a combined unit we push the device so the balloon and the device we push it together balloon is over the wire so there are minimum chances of perforation so this is uh, you get a complete set uh, there is a guide wire also which is available with the device and uh, there is a grasper also available it's a wide grasper so uh, it's it's uh, very handy to grasp the lesion the submucosal lesion uh, uh, to pull the lesion inside the cap and finally uh, you fire the cap and resect it so this is a grasper it's a, it has a wide opening diameter so you can uh, grasp uh, 1 to 1.5 cm subepithelial lesions as well so what we usually do is uh, a combination of a gentle section you should not apply too much suction because uh, there is a risk of entrapment of nearby organs uh, so you apply gentle section and use this grasper to pull the lesion inside the cap now here we have mounted the device the mounting is more or less the similar uh, similar to uh, the ovesco uh, clip which you must have applied the only difference is it has a pre mounted snare inside so you can see this outer diameter is 19.5 so we have to be really gentle while we are negotiating uh, this device across cricopharynx and you get a snare uh, along with it this snare is pre mounted inside the cap so once you fire the clip you instruct your assistant to close the snare and finally you uh, cut the lesion and the cut uh, cut uh, settings to cut the lesion are very high this is a very thin monofilament snare so it sharply cuts the lesion unlike the typical settings that you use for emr or esd so here the settings if you are using a vio3 the settings are uh, high cut 4 if you are using vio 300d it may be 100 watts effect of 4 this is for vio 300d for vio 3 it's high cut 4 so this is what you have to remember the settings are completely different the settings are very very high because you are cutting the lesion full thickness so uh, coming to the first step of the process uh, what we'll do now is we'll uh, do a scopy see the position of the lesion and uh, i uh, finally mark it with the ftrd probe so zahir it, it is mounted on the double channel scope so it's a therapeutic channel scope uh, which yeah so it has a 3.7 working channel it's compatible with scopes uh, varying from 10.5 to 12 mm so uh, a wide uh, variety of scopes can be used along with this how to select the lesion for eftr versus emr how to select the lesion which we should go eftr we should go esd emr okay so this is a sub epithelial lesion this is a sub mucosal lesion so uh, uh, it's it's it may not be a, a a good option to do an emr if it were a epithelial lesion and it lifts well you can do it the second uh, uh, reason why we are uh, doing uh, Uh, this ftr uh, in this patient is that uh, this what uh, what i have been told is this patient is uh, known to have itp and uh, so uh, there may be an excess risk of bleeding in this case and that is another reason why uh, we chose ftr suppose the patient is having coagulopathy and all this may be a, a safer alternative although the company says that you should avoid it in patients with coagulopathy uh, but then it may be a safer alternative to Uh, other options like emr or esd in these cases so uh, the selection of cases also depends on the size so uh, uh, if you ask me about the sub epithelial lesions i think uh, 1.5 to 2 cm is the upper limit uh, you should not go for higher uh, size bigger size sub epithelial uh, lesions it will be really difficult especially in stomach in contrast in colorectum you can uh, resect bigger lesions the colorectal device uh, the cap is 21 mm and it can uh, take care of uh, bigger lesions so mm. you can see uh, there are uh, there are two lesions here this seems to be uh, the bigger one i i don't think uh, this is the lesion with uh, so there are multiple uh, sub epithelial lesions if you see here there are multiple lesions you need a us evaluation before performing eftr you can go directly with eftr uh, uh, i'm US sorry evaluation. i didn't get the question endoscopic ultrasound evaluation of lesion is required 
I, I I think so, but if you if you see uh, this case, uh, uh, I don't have much doubt in saying that this is a case of type one gastric NET. There are uh, multiple lesions here. I can see some atrophy in antrum. So I believe this is uh, uh, type one gastric uh, uh, NET. Uh, majority of the cases with type one gastric NETs, they are not invasive. They are benign. Uh, if the size is more, you can opt to resect them, but then uh, uh, if the lesions are very small, you can opt to uh, not to resect them and then just follow them. So uh, if, if you ask me that uh, if, if this is a good lesion for FTR, I, 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 I'll say no as of now, uh, that the reason being the lesion looks a bit bigger to me, right? Yeah. But the one which you are showing in forward view and retro, retrograde view, both are both look different. For right? FTR? No, no. The one which you are showing is different from I the one which you showed in the forward view. The cap. This is different. So let's see. We'll we'll give it a try. Yeah, yeah. So I'll I'll need some uh, this uh, dimol, simethicon, clean cleaning. Yeah, this is different. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. This is on the lesser curve. This, this is the bigger one. Hmm. Both both. Uh, I... Where you find difficulty in performing F tire, which site in the stomach? What are the difficult sites? Uh -huh. So we'll mark uh, now, we'll go with the marking step. We'll mark two lesions and we'll see uh, how it goes. If, if we can uh, take uh, the bigger lesion also inside the cap, we can, uh, we'll try to do both. Otherwise, we'll choose the smaller one at least. Uh, the basic intent is to show the technique of uh, FTRD because there are situations when uh, the lesion is infiltrating uh, deeper into deep submucosa where uh, even ESD may be challenging and the risk of perforation may be high. So I'm marking the lesion. This is the FTRD probe. Uh, if you are using a YO 300 D, you can use the settings of uh, effect of one and forced coag uh, 20 Watts. Otherwise uh, the standard setting for soft coagulation may also be used. You can also use an APC, but then this, this is the whole set uh, that comes with the uh, FTRD uh, device set. So, so now I have marked the lesion. This marking is important because once you are there uh, with the cap, uh, with the FTRD device, the problem which occurs is that uh, the, the field of vision is limited. And when you are grasping the lesion with your uh, uh, grasper, sometimes there is bleed and it's difficult to locate the lesion as well. So this is a uh, first lesion that I have marked. Uh, there are other smaller ones, but I don't think uh, uh, that requires to be resected with the uh, and you, you can see this is here, there is a bigger lesion. So you are planning to remove the bigger lesion or the smaller lesion? So uh, there are there are two two things that I like to tell. One is uh, the, uh, if I see the bigger lesion, I can I can focus it only in the retro, retroflexion, the retroflexion uh, position. Can we try in the forward wing? Can you just inflate in, in, and see? In, in uh, the forward view position? Yeah, this is the position. Can so, you see here? Yeah. Yes. Just yes, at yes. the entry. Yes, yes, yes. yes, yes. So the, the problem uh, where when we uh, get such lesions along the lesser curve is the other side of the uh, lesion is difficult to grasp, especially if the lesion is bigger, but definitely we can, we can give it a try. You can see the lesion is uh, according to my experience, it's bigger than the uh, size of the cap uh, that is uh, so that available. So that is roughly around two centimeters. Yes, yes, yes. But yes. we can remove two centimeter lesion. Yes, but they shouldn't be invading submucosa. I yeah. believe this. So lesion, we can lift it and we can see. Uh, it's, it it uh, we won't be able to lift this lesion. This I I'm very sure because this is a sort of uh, uh, extra luminally. Now you see uh, you have got a good space too. Once you yes, have distended the stomach. Yes. yes so there is yes. a good area. 
yes yes we can definitely give it a try i think uh, we can no... give the try yes yes why not uh so we'll we'll give it a try as well the only worry is when i'm there with my cap inside so you can see the other half of the legion it's very difficult to ensure whether you have angled the entire your marking is going to tell that you are inside the legion or not uh yes to some extent but then even if i mark now uh, i have you connected the cautery yeah, have you connected the cautery but it's not because marking is the only thing in the colon the marking give the idea as well as in a stomach it is very difficult to see with the margin of the lesion are you in yes, or not yes yes so uh, i if if the same lesion would have been in this location yeah, I agree. in this location i would have seen all the marks for example right if i see this lesion i know i have engulfed all the marks now if yeah, this really. is the lesion i i am not sure about the distal uh, marks it's uh, uh, to give it a try you can try on any lesion but the the, the chances of success come down so uh, if you choose it for the right indication then, uh, then you will find that this de device is really handy and so you have to be really selective uh, to begin with i think uh, in future if if uh, there are further improvisations in the device uh, uh, we may overcome the limitations that we may be able to do the procedures in retroflex as of now uh, it's it's very difficult to do the uh, these cases in a retroflex position the other thing that can be done in these lesion is a hybrid ftrd so hybrid ftrd means you resect the lesion you uh, separate it from the surrounding mucosa and then finally uh, do it the the other challenge is why do don't we want to do that is uh, what i have been told is he's having itp uh, and uh, so that is one of the main reasons that we instead of doing uh, a, a conventional resection we we are proceeding with the so i think this is uh, this is not we'll we'll use a, a knife if we have the knife because ftrd probe i guess there are some issues So this FTRD probe is with some kind of snare, loop, or a needle. What is it like? So what FTRD is it like? probe, it's just a, a sort of knife that uh, uh, that you can use just for marking. There's no other purpose of this uh, uh, probe. It's, it, it just uh, provides you with energy to mark. So you can see that. So how much margin do you take? It is 2 mm, 5 mm, or how is it like? I I'm very close because the lesion is big and it's a submucosal lesion. If there, it's a mucosal lesion or an early gastric cancer, I, I'll take a bigger margin. I, I'll take like uh, five mm at least. But if if it's a submucosal lesion, I I, I don't uh, believe in taking much margins because it's not it's not going to be uh, beneficial. So there are challenges at multiple steps when you are using first the FTRD device. The first and foremost challenge is. Uh, we'll use the yes we have a yes yes we have a proof cap in fact we can use it uh, right now to see whether we we engulf this lesion or not if i if you see in retroflex position you have a very nice feeling that this lesion will come into the cap but this won't be the scene when we are when i insert the ftrd device the the position will be like this so this will be the position of the lesion when i i insert the ftrd device we are uh, definitely going to give it a try uh, right hmm? web grasper yeah. marking here moving to our next case over to over to the next room we have a 59 year old female who presented with complaints of anal discomfort and urgency to pass tools the sigmoidoscopy revealed a large sessile polyp of around 5 cm 
एम आर आई शोड आई रेगुलर मास लीजन अराइजिंग फ्रॉम द एंटीरियर वॉल ऑफ द रेक्टम फोर सेंटीमीटर फ्रॉम द एनोरेक्टल जंक्शन विद इंटरमीडिएट सिग्नल ऑन टी वन एंड टी टू वेटेड इमेजेस शोइंग नो डिफ्यूजन रेस्ट्रिक्शन द साइज इज अप्रोक्सीमेटली सेवनटीन पॉइंट सिक्स इंटू ट्वेल्व पॉइंट फोर इंटू एट पॉइंट फाइव मिलीमीटर्स दिस इज द एंडोस्कोपिक इमेज द पेशेंट इज प्लान फॉर एंडोसाइटोस्कोपी विद हाइब्रिड ई एस डी ओवर टू डॉक्टर अमोल बापाई हेलो हाय सर यू आर ऑन हाय एम आई ऑन कैन यू सी मी यस यस मोर इंपोर्टेंटली कैन यू सी द एंडोस्कोपी इमेज यस यस एंडोस्कोपी इमेज सो आई हैव मोहन विद मी एंड आई थिंक नीला वाज आल्सो अराउंड आई थिंक ही जस्ट गॉन आउट सो दिस इज अ लीजन जस्ट अबाउट 2 और 3 सेंटीमीटर फ्रॉम द एनल वर्ज जस्ट यू कैन सी द एनल वर्ज ओवर हियर सो बेरली 2 सेंटीमीटर इनसाइड एंड इट्स अबाउट 3 3 एंड 1/2 सेंटीमीटर इन लेंथ and uh, it is kind of sessile over here so mohan what do you think this looks like a type 2a yeah yeah gene yes. type 2a no, adenoma yes you just put some nbi now yeah. oh, okay this is okay, so i'll so put this is txi amol yeah uh, is this uh, involving the muscularis propria no 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 no, no. this, this doesn't is... seem to be a malignant lesion at all and it's actually 2a it's not even 2b in fact mri mein bol raha hai yeah mri uh, i think on mri they said it's involved uh, mri i think that can sometimes be a little bit misleading and over it may it can over diagnose mm-hmm. that can happen would you do an endoscopic ultrasound to confirm uh, no. we can do but the but N- nbi and, is and, more, and the, more and more and the way it is mobile Uh, it doesn't look like to be yeah. any infiltrated technically in a in rectum you can do an endoscopic ultrasound but most often nowadays it's not required so that is how it is now i would as i am waiting for the knives to come in i would just like to show you one technique when we don't have endoscopy or you know magnification sometimes just water immersion actually gives you very good images Yes. See? Yes, yes. So you get very excellent images where you can see the bit pattern and the villus pattern very do, well. You uh, can do yeah, dual, dual, focus, dual, dual focus, dual focus, dual focus now. Now this is the dual. Ah, that see that now you can now see the dual focus. Micro vessels also. Micro excellent. vessels, you can see it very well, right? Excellent. Right. Yes, yes. So, are we ready with the needle and the knife? Okay, so needle. So you can do underwater ESD also. Yeah. It looks benign. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's it's. With so the... what I'm going to do is I'm going to inject this lesion, and then we'll try and go from the uh, the anal side, and mm. then see how to take it forward. So you make a tunnel, or you do only from distal would, to proximal. I would do this as a distal to proximal. this lesion is a little bit too small to do a tunnel that is what i feel yeah, yeah. but we will try and do something like a pocket over here yeah and then if we can get out on the other side then it makes things a little bit faster yeah so, and what about the gravity how will you say uh, where will you keep the polyp or patient so presently the polyp is at 6 o'clock and the water is also going at 6 so, o'clock so so that's very important you can see whatever water we are putting that is grounding the polyp that means the polyp is right on the gravity gravity is so right even if you, 5 o'clock the yeah. attachment is at around 5 o'clock so if you cut the mucosa you will not get the separation so, so we might have to change the position position later on once you get a incision yeah to right lateral we right have to do it because we want the lesion to come up on top so we always try to shift the position of patient so that the water should be against the polyp so that as soon as you cut the mucosa by the gravity weight of the polyp there we will start seeing the separation between mucosa and muscle so give me the needle huh? i'll just show the injection so see the injection is important i will ask my assistant to start injecting and you have to in- start injecting and now i penetrate with a jab and start injecting and as i as he injects i pull the needle back so that we find the submucosal plane and you can see that the lesion is lifted up well 
हो गया ना कमजोर ओके कुछ इन ईएसडी ट्राई एंड इंजेक्ट विथ मिनिमम नंबर ऑफ पंक्चर बैक नीडल बैक लीजन अप कम्प्लीटली बिकॉज इट्स I am still not that fast with my ESD, so I prefer to use gelofusin as far as possible. Needle, needle. So, Dr. Amol, do you inject distal margin first or the proximal margin first? Inject. So no. the question is, by Chalapati, is uh, whether yeah. you want to inject Normally distal. Normally, I would or... inject the distal, the oral margin first. But here, since the lesion is small, it really doesn't matter much because we can see the lesion, and it's in the rectum. But if it is in the colon, I would probably inject the, the oral margin first because otherwise the polyp can just go around the fold. And already you are seeing water disturbing us a lot. Yes. And the, when it is blood, then the things become more problematic. more problematic. So that's why it's important to change the position Need of the, the needle? patient. Needle. Ah, inject. Keep injecting. Keep injecting. Keep injecting. Okay. Yeah. 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 We'll shift there. Till then, we'll put the patient on in the right lateral position. Till then, Zaire will just uh, show that case, and then we'll come back over here. So I'm just straightening the scope now. Even supine is okay. Supine might be better actually. Supine, करते थे बेशक. Supine. Yeah, Dr. Zahir, you are on. Okay, so we are uh, attempting the bigger one, which is uh, close to G junction. You can see I have focused. Screen, please. Uh, yeah, and can you see the endoscopy picture? Yeah. So uh, if you see, we have focused the the lesion here, and uh, we also uh, uh, did it uh, uh, test with the proof cap, which is available again with the uh, Wisco. and uh, with that cap you can ensure that whether the lesion is going to come uh, within this ftrd uh, device cap or not so that's a handy thing so you don't have to um, uh, this uh, assess uh, or you can don't have to uh, completely assemble this uh, device you can check first with the proof cap and then you can you can finally decide whether you are going to resect it with the same device or not so now you can see the lesion is in in focus um uh, ideally the the you should use a, a grasper and you should pull the lesion inside but as you can see that it's very friable and even on touch it's bleeding so what i'm going to do is i have focused the marking here so dr jahir yes the concept is you should not do suction so uh, i'll i agree with you so it 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 uh, it includes the word vigorous along with suction you shouldn't do vigorous suction so if i apply gentle suction and if the lesion is coming inside that is good enough suppose and the stomach wall is thick i think that is not a problem in colon enough. there is a thin wall and there is a yes, possibility yes, yes. this is more intraluminal so more intraluminal fine. exactly yeah. so what i'm going to do right now is i'm going to suck this lesion gently inside in between i'm going to leave uh, the suction so that if there is uh, any extra uh, luminal uh, organ or uh, structure is coming uh, along with the suction it will get detached and then i'll finally fire the clip this step is very crucial and it's very important that your uh, assistant is uh, exactly noting when you close the clip i have to notify him that i have closed the clip he'll immediately remove this lock this lock is there along with the snare and if you read carefully the word two is written here means this is the second step first step is uh, as written on this first step is i fire the clip second step is uh, we remove the lock third step is He closes close. the snare and the final step is I press yellow paddle. No blue. There's an endo cut cue. Endo cut. So it's a high cut mode that we are using here. So we'll proceed here with the with the procedure. I have uh, I I believe I have taken the lesion. Endoscopy view, please. Yeah. Yeah. So I fire the clip. Yes. He closes the snare. And here we cut the lesion. Right. you so, can take out the entire specimen and we can go with the yes 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 okay. we can go with the diagnostic scope 
So the snare is already open within the clip, right? Before deployment. So we'll show, show you the specimen, also. the full thickness got specimen that okay. we have got here, uh, including all uh, the layers of uh, stomach. Yeah. Can you show the gauge piece, Perako? Right. So what we are going to do is uh, we are going to disassemble this device. We are going to go inside with a scope and see. And if you see here, uh, all the layers of all the layers of stomach can be seen here. Please you see here, including the serosal layer, you can, can you has been this? included. Focus this. Yeah. Focus this. Yeah. Yes. Can you bigger, make it bigger? Or nasdik lao? Or nasdik lao? Or bada karo? Or yes. bada karo? Yes. Can you see it? Yes, yes. We appreciate all the layers of stomach uh, in this lesion. So this is the beauty of uh, this. What you can achieve. Hato, hato. Aage se hato. Ek minute kaun hai? Hitesh. Hitesh hato. Ha. Can you see the white is white is tumor? Yes, yes. Is visible? Yes, sir. You have a big normal margin along, which suggests that it should be an end block resection, unless the pathologist is angry with you. So uh, we will just recheck it in a one minute time and then we will shift to the mole rooms. Vertical uh, is uh, in this is uh, very less, sir. In, um, in, in with the FTRD is quite less. So the only thing is here you have sucked the lesion in the colon. You don't suck. You just push your scope in and hold it with the grasper and pull it inside. And then there is a simultaneous movement. I, I have one question. How would you decide this lesion should go for ESD or EFTR? Yeah, the thing, I think this is my thought process. In the duty number, if this lesion is there and the risk of perforation is high, it is better to go with this device. That will be better. ESD can be done in any reason, either small or the bigger. But EFDRD can only be done with a lesion of less than two. And the like second part of the duodenum or in the duodenal bulb, risk of perforation is there. Then you can go with the EFDRD. This is and my thought. Are process. you worried about clip remaining in D1? Most of the times you get carcinoids in D1, right? So are you worried about clip being there all the time, entire life? Yeah. So now I think if I'm not wrong, the company is coming up with a period of the time they are going to remove the clips also. PC they are developing the device, come up, in fact, which they have, better. which they have. So you can, in yeah. fact, uh, So Jahir, you have one more minute to see, and then we will shift to the other room. Uh, if you can show it and can you show the retroflex? Yeah, yeah. Why not? Hand over you, please. Yeah. Endoscopy view, please. Can we show the endoscopic view? Yes. So uh, I am just, the just take, take, yeah. taking a while to fix the endoscopic view. Yeah, this so is the... can, Yes, yes, yes. So here you can see uh, this is the clip deployed. This is you can see. And there is a the still area. small tissue is there, but I think this will going to be necrosed. Yeah, we no, can shift to the other room. This is unlike. This is not a tumor. Yeah, this is the tumor. If you see, this is a carcinoid remaining. Where in the just yeah in the base of the clip. No, no, no. This no, is no, no, no. Yeah. this is not carcinoid. This is not carcinoid. We can take the biopsies and we can prove it. You can inverted margin. Yeah, that is that is uh the serosal margin of the but I still feel this is my feeling, but uh, the biopsy can prove it. Definitely it's not tumor. Uh, the so can, part is can we shift to the other room now? Can we shift to the other room now? Yeah, Dr. Amol, sir. Normal you're on. They're on. Okay. So we injected and we turned the patient supine in case you have the view of the room. And now you can see that the polyp is on top. And when I irrigate, the fluid is going to the at six o'clock. And my polyp is on the at 12 o'clock. So now that is a good position because now I can the, the polyp is hanging down. And now we can start the dissection and the mucosal incision. So I'm using the dual knife with a jet function, dual J from Olympus, the colonic dual J, which has a tip length of around 1.5 millimeters. And uh, I'm using the Herbi Bio 3 workstation with, uh, and I'll be using the precise sec for the submucosal uh, dissection also. So now I'm going to make a mucosal incision. Yeah. What is happening? 
आई डोंट वॉन्ट है नहीं लगा दो बोलो या सो डॉक्टर अमोल सो द क्वेश्चन इज एनी एडवांटेज इज देयर ऑफ वन नाइफ ओवर द अदर लाइक ड्यूएल जे वर्सेस हाइब्रिड लाइक दैट सी द ड्यूएल नाइफ हैज द एडवांटेज दैट इट इज अ वेरी सॉफ्ट नाइफ सो इट इज मैन्युअरेबल द हाइब्रिड नाइफ हैज एन एडवांटेज दैट इट इज यू कैन इंजेक्ट एंड कट बट इट इज अ लिटिल बिट स्टिफ so when you are using in a straight direction the hybrid knife is good but in elg sometimes you have to go very you can reduce the effect effect a little bit there is too much of coagulation i can't figure out why why you endocut q it should be endocut i or you will find in but the setting is inject kar liye sir 223 223 kar de inject is too much of chari can we have dr amol sir room view only the endoscopy view is available my nice. are kya ho kyun gir raha hai laga the it ek one pot sir mai jab kar raha hu tab hi hoga रेट्रोफ्लेक्सिशन इन फोर्सेशन काला हो रहा है लॉट ऑफ चारिंग डे Hmm. So, is there any role of marking before this incision? So, for colonic lesions, it's not required to be marked because the differentiation between polypoidal lesion and normal mucosa is very obvious in colon. While uh, it is important to mark in stomach or esophagus. Right. right. the important thing is the distal rectum sometimes there is quite a bit of fibrosis that you will see yeah because the polyphagy is prolapsing. prolapsing that is the reason so we can see a fair bit of fibrosis over here inject here and maybe i will use a needle to inject because otherwise it's not lifting that well inject karo सेटिंग का कुछ तो लग रहा है यार इधर टू मच ऑफ स्पार्किंग है प्रेसाइज सेट नो नो वी आर स्टार्टिंग एज अ पॉकेट ईएसडी या आई विल ट्राई टू डू अ पॉकेट ए नीडल आई विल इंजेक्ट अ लिटिल बिट मोर यूजिंग अ नीडल बिकॉज़ समटाइम्स if there is too much of fibrosis the pressure that is exerted with the dual knife is not adequate now in this kind of a situation the hybrid knife injection is much better but for the dissection uh, capabilities and handling of the knife i am going to continue with the dual knife but i am going to use a needle to inject and when i use a needle give me the needle 
I will inject through the mucosa. Inject. Keep injecting. Okay. Okay. Back. Then needle. Inject. So probably that's why MRI was showing some uh, infiltration. Yes, this is not infiltration per se, but it is fibrosis. Because yeah. of that, MRI can sometimes, there is a submucosa that you can now. So the you. submucosa is very opaque and that uh, 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 according to the degree of submucosal fibrosis, though we cannot see through that, uh, it looks very thick fibers. You can see the very, very thick fibers. Very thick fiber. Yeah. yeah. So you can see how easy the polyp was looking, but it is very complex here. There is no differentiation between muscle and mucosa and the submucosal fibrosis. But a good thing is it is in the distal rectum. So even if we go slightly deep, the shape there is no of the problem. muscle yeah. industry, it should not matter. Yeah. Huh? Uh, areola tissue is hardly. Uh, so, but this polyp was initially lifting with the submucosal injection. Yeah, but that does not completely rule out fibrosis. So, mm -hmm. even if though the degree of fibrosis is not that severe, but still uh, the differentiation between muscle and submucosa is not very clear right. because the fluid is not staying for long there. Yes. That is another thing which happens in the distal rectum because it is highly vascular. The fluid dissipates much more rapidly. So the only technique is to close, remain as close to the mucosa as possible. Yeah, and there are subtle things which I can see, I can tell you. Now these bands which are visible, I'm just lifting them up and kind of twisting my scope around and doing it. Would you, in such situation, change your uh, technique while going, coming from the retrograde and I reaching might here? I do that, but it's a little bit too distal in the rectum. Too distal, yeah. So it's very difficult to retroflex when the polyp see, is too distal. I can see a vessel over here. Now yeah, that is yeah. that means it is submucosa. This is yeah. submucosa. So yeah. now I will hook over here. <laughs> Polyp karunga, I'm going to do a poem. I'm going to do a poem. Kaku ko, haa. Poem. Polyp is very big, it's a lot of time. I'm going to do it. 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 Let's try going from the retroflexion on. Let's see if we can it can we can get a plane because here we're not getting a plane. Yeah, that's a good one. But I'll need the patient a little bit quiet because what will happen is patient will not be able to retain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. 
जो कुछ भी दिखाएगा दिखाओगे तो दिखा दिखा देगा रीजन बी that they prolapse needle back level no? they prolapse with the patient straining for stool and they will invariably cause some fibrosis that is what happens needle out inject inject keep injecting keep injecting okay here also mm. see that it's it's not a very good lift kya Are on that side, but it's not spreading on the proximal side at all. Why do I take the incision? Because no, no, I take it there. But I would have preferred to go a little bit wider so that I get a better. Yeah. yeah. Getting it. Getting it. Getting it. दे दे मेरे को जब तक नीला दिख रहा तब तक काटते क्या पार्शली बबलिंग हो रहा है आई फाउट यस रेक्टम है ना रेक्टम है कभी कभी मिल जाता है फाइब्रोसिस कोशिश कर रहे हैं पेशेंट को शांत रखें इतना कुछ कर दे रहेगा so they encountered lot of fibrosis in the towards the anal margin so yeah. they... the, the same story continues in oral margin i think if the shared better man i would not want to complain too much rajesh is a good friend <laughs> but uh, let us see other thing is that this is a hq scope so the retroflexion is not that tight i'd have preferred to use a h scope here because then i would get a inject inject or okay bas bas thank you
I think we've got the margin, but I think there may be some misunderstanding which I have shared. Yeah, now we are seeing. Now I am seeing something. Yeah, yeah. So once we get through this one centimeter, I think then it's okay. Yeah. बॉर्डर में पानी है कि नहीं फिर वाटर आता है पानी आता है कि नहीं Now I will try to retract the flap here, and this is the submersible. I need knife. Piece it. That's the muscle. Yeah. Just करने के लिए तैयार है जो knife. Piece it. लेने यार. सुनो मैं जब भी बताता हूँ ना तभी मुझे कुछ करना जरूरी है. हाँ दोबारा बताने की जरूरत नहीं पड़े knife. Piece it नहीं है. अभी भी. अच्छा. Okay. Just करो. इसमें भी एफ टी आर डी लगा वॉट इफ देर इज अ मसल ब्रिज वॉट विल हैपन नथिंग डिस्टली डिस्टल रेक्टम नथिंग दैट्स वॉट आई एम सेंग विल कीप ऑन डूइंग दैट्स वॉट दे सर्जन डू इन टेम्स Yeah. They don't bother about. Okay. Would you prefer to use hook knife here? We can if they've got the hook with injection. Hmm. Because that becomes sharper decision. Yeah. Ah. Chair the. Acha. Kya karna? ठीक है तो किसी और को बैठा दो. किसी और को बैठा दो. Can you see over here? Now we are seeing a little bit of the submucosal fiber. We can identify. This side is the muscle, and these are the the tented ones are the submucosal fiber. टू पॉइंट एट नहीं थ्री पॉइंट टू करो प्रिसाइस थ्री पॉइंट टू टूक ने यूज किया भैया कभी कभी यूज किया है क्या यूज किया है कभी तो करने अलम्बस का कोई है 
हुक्म नहीं जी है क्या तेरे पास लेकिन Okay, they don't use here. So, what is the advantage uh, you are anticipating with hook knife? See, hook knife the dissection is a little bit sharper because it is cut sharper. So, when there is fibrosis, sometimes it is easier to cut through the fibrosis using the hook knife. Only thing is because it cuts faster, risk of muscle injury is higher. Now, here we are. Really, relatively safe because we are in the distal rectum, so we we need not worry. So I am going to probably try doing it with a hook knife. But here you can see. Can you see these vessels over here? Yes. Oh, and if we can yeah. point out, but I, I don't mean, know whether don't, that can't be transmitted there. No, no pointer there. I mean, we don't know. So the, is my injection here? I'll just show you some principles. Injection hota kahan hai? इंजेक्शन वाला है ना सी दिस व्हाइट बैंड विच इज इन फ्रंट ऑफ मी ओवर इयर ब्लू इश थिंग दैट इज अब्यूकोजल फाइब्रोसिस ऑन राइट साइड ओवर इयर दिस इज अब्यूकोजा इट बीट On the left side, also there is some submucosa. What about you are cutting the mucosa more so that now pocket technique is out. So we are uh, totally depending on gravity Back to left. fall down. Back left. So we can cut the more more mucosa. But one one issue with cutting more mucosa is the fluid will dissipate even faster. Yeah, like but that. now there is no fluid even. Uh, there is no fluid at all. Yeah, so it's going to be either way like this. Nice. Nice, David. So, any uh, particular method how to use hook knife? Come on. See, the tip should be facing away from the muscle. Nice. Now I use it not as a hooking, but sometimes I use it as a hooking, but not always. This is now you are facing towards muscle. Yeah. Now so turn, turn, to yeah, turn, turn to six o'clock. Turn to six o'clock. Is it okay? Hmm. It's okay. No, this hooking. Hey, yeah. are shuru hai theer. Yeah. Then, can I go? Amul, can you explain the advantage of using a hook knife here? The hook knife is a little bit sharper to use. That's all. So you can cut through the fiber. This is a little bit better. You can do fiber by fiber dissection also. Yeah. Nice. But there is a flip side that it can cause more perforation. Yes. Uh, should we use sleeping bag in this proportion? But the problem with sleeping bag, Nila, is I am not getting a mucosal flap on. Once I have a mucosal flap, then I can consider using a sleeping bag. Till then, even a sleeping bag will not be effective. If you apply a snare, Rajesh, over here, you are going to catch the muscle. That is for sure, hundred and ten percent. No, we may Master. not need to close it. That is muscle. Yeah. This is mucosa. This is the muscle. Yeah. Inject it over here. Nothing goes in. See? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, that that is enough. Yeah. Or dal, or dal. Either jacket dal. See, I'll tell you. I'll show you. There is some muscle on top on that. So is the mucosal side. We are shaving. We are yeah. in the intramuscular side. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
But the amount is the choice of which one or not uh, the rights we have done the uh, MDI in spite of the we are facing the problem. No, it's 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 not like a cancer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what happened in this case if I'm not wrong? Somebody has tried to reject ISIS. Maybe why? Somebody has tried to reject because I saw the bad data. That is also good. This is very important information. Yes. Yes. Now, yeah, now this is the point Dr. Rajesh is telling me. And that the, in this patient, somebody had tried to inject before referring this patient over here. Now that can be one of the reasons why we are getting so much of fibrosis. Let me just suction out. This is end of tunnel or? No, no, no. It's not end of tunnel. It's, it's probably a muscle injury. It's in fact muscle injury. No, no, I don't think it's a muscle it's a injury. Muscle. Yeah. Is that is that a small poke? Yeah. Yeah, it's a muscle injury. Because here, here we've gone through and through the muscle. See? Yeah, that's a muscle injury. Yes. That's a muscle injury. You so can see the our, muscle over here. Some mucosa is down yes. here. See the difference? Yeah. That's what I was trying to say. You know, when we uh, injected, yeah. that was in the intermuscular plane. Mm -hmm. Anyway, let's just control the bleeding and then we go. No, no, no. Hold it. Just. So the small vessels we can kind of coagulate with the knife tip only itself. Back. Now, I will extend the mucosal incision, but I'm not sure whether we are going to get any elevation there. Inject needle out, knife out. It won't inject, so you have to cut. No? How it can inject? You have to go into the pocket and inject. Yeah. I'm just going to. Back. Back, yeah. Look. Okay. Mm. <coughs> I'm not sure this kind of fibrosis can be caused by whether we should check whether this patient had an attempt at EMR or something earlier because this kind of fibrosis is really very unexpected. What do you think, Mohan? Yeah, yeah, I think. But the way the polyp was looking, it was untouched polyp. And uh, this right. is very surprising to see such submucosal fibrosis in a not attempted or uh, prior resection attempt, uh, unlikely to be. Back lele. Na back bolu to back lele na. Ha. Dubara remind mat karne den. De. De de ya. Lag time bahut hai chera. Arbi ke quarter se bhi zada lag time. So actually, that's a very important message. Like we should not inject or do some kind of biopsy because that will hinder the future resection. You cannot remove because the polyp completely. Yeah. Just don't touch it. And if you don't have expertise, just refer. If you plan to take out the polyp, take it out completely. I mean, I'm not saying necessarily end block, but at least completely. That is very important. I that. that. 
यहाँ पे इंजेक्टर थोड़ा कर रहे ओके बाय should we see what's happening now where are we no what i'm going to do is i'm just going to separate this muscle from this side so that then there there hi okay are right. it's getting chemoflaged Let's see now what we have done. Let me just suction out, clean up. I think it's almost done now. No man, I think it's. I think if still, you no. Still a reasonable. If you cut from the mucosa or now angle, it will no, fall down. No, it will fall down. No, I just wanted to separate that muscle defect area. Let's go up. See now, patient is not able to hold too much of air, CO two. So I'll just go a little bit more proximally, suck out the air. Uh, I mean CO two, and then come back again. Otherwise, what happens is patient starts pushing and makes procedure more difficult. Okay. जे करने के लिए तैयार हो जाए पीछे ले जाए जे करना यू कैन सी दैट देर इज नथिंग विच इज गोइंग इन साइड एट ऑल बस Right. Yeah. So, does hook knife give a good injection facility? Ah, uh, it does give you a similar injection facility as the dual knife. So now he's cutting the mucosa. So with the weight of the polyp, we'll have a broader uh, entry point. You can see that. The thing is, it is so stuck to the muscle layer that it is not yeah. falling down. Otherwise, yeah. in a normal circumstance, just now it would have fallen yeah. down considerably. So you can see the longitudinal muscle there. Yeah. I think there is also another one. Yeah. So it's almost impossible to separate right. muc mucosa right. from muscle. Turn, 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 turn towards turn your right. Towards six o'clock or towards three o'clock. Ha, Muscle is very thin in this area. Yeah. Huh? Muscle is thin. Yes, you are right. But the important thing is there is no separation. There is no plane to work in. And there is no third space. So I think this case was not good for third space. <laughs> there are only two spaces. <laughs> Outside and inside. <laughs> Injector. Okay, boss. Nice. It's a notes Is procedure. Nice? So, do you want to consider something like a clip and traction technique to pull the polyp down more? The problem is here. 
you know the adherence is to the muscle and it is too distal okay we can try a clip and line not that we cannot but sometimes what will happen is in this kind of a situation even a clip and line may not work basically because the clip is not strong enough to pull on the muscle that becomes a problem okay yeah yeah, yeah. Under it, rather than then, yeah. But yeah, so we are coming to the end. Audience want to know whether it's for fibrosis or is by infiltration of the tumor. How you'll differentiate? Because on MRI it was reported something like infiltration of MRI muscle. MRI shows the infiltration of the muscle. See, uh, infiltration is very different. You will see tumor extending inside. Very distinctly you see that. This is still, I will say, fibrosis. I will not still call it infiltration. The other thing, other reason why I will not call it infiltration is because the NBI pattern definitely does not suggest that it is uh, neoplastic, meaning malignant. This is what I will say. What do you say, Mohan? I totally agree with you that uh, NBI pattern was absolutely benign and it is the mechanical uh, rubbing or prolapse of polyp Every time he defecates, has caused uh, friction over there and caused uh, traumatic fibrosis. Uh, rather than either any, there is no history of any intervention, and there is no NBI pattern and MRI uh, may be working on uh, submucosal fat or some. There is no submucosa, so that might have overstaged the tumor. But still, I think we'll uh, dissect it almost like a full thickness and send for histopathology uh, that will be like uh, more informative ultimately. So can you see I'm finding a, a sub, less than a millimeter space of submucosa, which I feel that that is submucosa. I'm not sure about that, but. We are dissecting this fibrous end on dissection of submucosal fibrosis. What we are doing here? Pardon? and on dissection of submucosal fibrosis that we are doing over here. I mean, this is a superficial layer of muscle, I think. There is no submucosa at all. You can see we are seeing the longitudinal fiber behind and uh, uh, the superficial circular layer is being dissected along with the submucosa. Yeah, yeah. Yes. But I think it's okay. ऐसा कुछ नहीं लग रहे तो होना चाहिए I think it's almost
देखो थोड़ा इंजेक्ट करने के लिए मैं नाइफ पीछे ले ले See on the left hand side, I am almost at the edge of the polyp now. Yes. Inject करो. Okay. ये तो वहाँ start करो क्या ये तो हमें. करो. करो करो. Doctor Reddy का lecture है ना? है ना. I think ना. बाद में दिखाएँ. और और मैजिक पर Reddy का lecture है. I think possible. It will. Can we use a clutch cutter to dissect this last margin? Clutch cutter. Ah, that's what we end up. Yeah. That's what we do. Clutch cutter. Can we use clutch cutter to dissect this last margin? Clutch cutter can be, but I don't think there is a distinct advantage of using a clutch cutter over here. Because clutch cutter also, you need to see the submucosal fiber. We are not seeing the submucosal fiber. Hello. Ah, we are going to show you the end of the last margin. Show it. Show it. No, show it. Show it. Then it will be closed. आप क्या दोगे? Because we are getting data here. Okay. आप एक बार इसके बारे में बोलते हैं। No problem. ये जस्ट इन ऑर्डर टू शो। Okay. हाँ? Not a problem. Yeah, surely. आप क्या दोगे? So anyway, I think we are running out of time. So we will continue over here. And I, if you all can notice and if you can appreciate this, we are almost at the end of the polyp uh, resection on the left side. Yes. Very well done. On the right side, we still have a little bit more to go. It will take another 15-20 minutes, I guess, unless we are bleeding. But before we sign off, we actually wanted to show you one more case using this device. Now, this is an endocuff. It comes from Olympus. And this fits to the distal tip of the colonoscope. And what this does is, you see these prongs over here? Yes. These prongs open up the fold, the, col the colonic mucosal folds, because of which polyp detection is enhanced. So this is a new development now, and this we have it in India. It was available in the West even earlier, last few years, but now Olympus is uh, giving it in India also, and I'm sure that we will all be able to detect polyps much more easily if we use this device. We wanted to show, demonstrate a case, but because of lack of time, we have not been able to demonstrate the case. Can but uh, bigger screen, can we take it the endocuff on the bigger screen? Can we show on the bigger screen endocuff? Um, Dr. Amul, you can show this. Can we make the Dr. Amul hand bigger? Yes, we are able to see that endocuff. Yeah. So this right. is Dr. Amul now. Yeah. So this is how it is, and it fits on the distal tip of the scope. And what is the beauty of it is it fits completely back to back. So the vision is not compromised. Like you see in the ESD cap, there is a little bit of rim of the vision which gets compromised sometimes, but this fits completely behind the lens. So the vision does not get compromised. Okay. And the prongs are also very soft. So any question regarding the endocuff? Because then we are signing off here and we were starting the rest of the program from there. So any question regarding the endocuff you can ask. Yeah, or maybe we can take it up during the lectures also. We can do yeah. that if yeah. And Dr. Amol Bapa is going to give the lecture from here, and I will request Dr. Sud and Dr. Jubin to start the proceeding from there, and we are signing off from here. So we can close the camera. And okay. We Thank you. There. We will just clean up the scope and go in and finish off whatever we left. Just okay, scope clean. Yeah. Nice demonstration, Dr. Amol. Thank you. Thank you. Wish we could have shown you something better and more clear but uh, unfortunately there was a lot of fibrosis so we had to struggle but, no, but that probably is very later in the evening we can show you the picture of the final outcome and uh, i'll ask rajesh to take a picture and then we'll 
Sure, sure. Yeah, sure. Okay, right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. We now kickstart our second component of the day, a series of state-of-the-art sure. lectures by our national speakers. I request our moderators to join us on stage, Dr. A. S. Puri, Dr. Monica Jain, Dr. Naresh Bhatt, and Dr. Mukesh Kalla. The moderators also kindly introduce our speakers. Thank you. It is my proud privilege to introduce Dr. Nagi, who, re who really requires no introduction. I think everybody is well aware of his stature in India and in abroad. And uh, of course, needless to say that he heads AIG, which is the beacon of endoscopic, GI endoscopy in India. Uh, one of the, perhaps the largest center offering all the services under one roof and his team is remarkable and people are, uh, they are setting new standards, raising the bar every time, which becomes very difficult for the others to follow. I, I could go on and on about Dr. Nagi Reddy, about the wonderful person that he is, but for one, as it is, we are running short of time. So Dr. Nagi, sir, please. Thank you, Amrinda, for the kind introduction. Rajesh has asked me to talk on setting up third space endoscopy unit training in future directions in this area. So what I'll do over the next 10-15 uh, minutes is to give my vision. I put down a few random thoughts of how we should set up third space training and uh, what is required for this. So before we start, how many are doing third space endoscopy here? Five. And how many want to get trained in this? Everybody else. That's why you're here, actually. Yeah. Okay. So now let, let us go through. So I, I said some random thoughts. The outline, what I'll do is why we should have more third space training in our country, who should be trained, and uh, how should this training go on? Now, after this talk, I'm sure some of you will drop out from third space, but that is natural. Eh? That's the purpose of this talk, not to discourage you, but to give a setting so that you should know who should go. Now, about a decade back in our country, when this poem started, third space started, there were only a few centers which were doing uh, third space. And very soon, poem was so common, Ecclesia was so common in our country, there were at one stage over 100 centers which are believed to be either doing, trying to do poem and so on. So the question comes that if you look now at centers doing quality third space endoscopy, there may be about say 10, 20 in our country, but do we need more centers? We require more centers for several reasons. One is that there's been a shift now in endoscopy. We went through upper GI, colon, um, you know, endos ultrasound, and then pancreatic biliary endoscopy to towards third space endoscopy. So we require to shift the, to increase the horizon. Uh, in general, third space endoscopy learning curves you look at in literature are relatively easy compared to, say, pancreatic biliary endoscopy. Uh, because the number of what you do as procedures are very fixed, you know, certain things only like you create a third space, you dissect through third space, 
you should know how to control bleeding, you should know how to close perforation. Once these three, four things you do, you can do third space very comfortably. So it's not a complicated stuff, much easier than pancreatic bleeding. That's why it's relatively easier for new people to pick it up. And there are, of course, a career new pathway that is creating. So there are now third space endoscopies who are specifically concentrating only on that and doing. So it's creating that. So we require more centers for that. And of course, uh, there is uh, a potential future development. In fact, this is the most exciting. What's going to happen in third space is that what you're, what we are doing is very small. Just you know, poems or doing um, uh, a tunneling type of EST and so on. What is going to happen in future? Third space is going to become the future of how G endoscopies are going to deliver therapy for a variety of disorders, including, for example, uh, GI motility disorders like diaphragmatic pacing. We're going to do pacing in the colon, pacing in the, for example, in gastroparesis, you put pacing uh, uh, leads into the fundus of the stomach. So a lot of new things are going to come up in third space, and this is going to be the future. And that's the reason why... Uh, for youngsters who want to go into this area, this is very exciting, not just because of poem and so on. Because, um, But it's also important to remember that uh, this is an area which you have to contemplate, think, do you want to go into this at all? The spectrum is increasing. And also, um, when you see somebody like Amit doing it on the screen, it looks so nice, easy, and then immediately you want to go and do this third space because Amit is one of the best in the world in these procedures. So it looks like that. But again, I said, start thinking of, with my lecture, start thinking about what you want to do. Because I want to first raise this question of who should be trained. Unfortunately, our society doesn't have guidelines, but I have some strong feelings. May hurt some of you, but I think I'll like to say that first, I think somebody should be post DM or DNB in gastroenterology before thinking of third space. In other words, a general practitioner or a physician should not go into third space. It's, I don't think it's the right area for him. Second, surgical endoscopies. I gave you an example of Amit and then we have Amol. There are some excellent surgical endoscopies who have a career in endoscopy who, of course, the young surgical endoscopies could be trained if they want to get away from surgery into endoscopy. And more important, I think third space should be taken up by those who have a certain age group. Normally, it's between 35 to 45. If you are after 45, don't think of third space because that's not a career for you. So that eliminates some of you, I think, small number of you in this hall. But uh, this should be for those people who are between, in my opinion, between 35 to 45. That is, you pass your uh, DM or DNB or do your MS or MCH and then want take endoscopy. So very early in the career, they should be trained uh, as a... Now, who shouldn't be trained? Very important. This is again important. So, Naresh has also joined us. So, Naresh is talking about young gastroenterologists who should be trained in that space. So, that no <laughs> so who should not be trained? This is very important. You know, I, don't, I think center should not be wasting their time. A casual endoscopy. We, we get many people in our center who say, uh, come for a week and say, I want to learn third space endoscopy. I'm already doing colonoscopy, ERCP endoscopy. This is not for casual endoscopies. Because although, as I said, it's relatively easy procedures, uh, most people who are good at upper J or colon or something can take it up to do because learning curves are not very high. But this is not good because you won't proceed further beyond a certain stage. And again, single practitioners who are having solo clinic, you know, you are somewhere in um, uh, a, a small town and you're a single practitioner. This is not good for you. Not for, not only for because you won't develop in this area, but also because you have several other things to do. You have gastroenterology as a career, which is more important than doing concentrating on a single procedure like this. In my opinion, it should not be done in non-institutional setups. I think uh, we should train people who are going to go back to the institutions or a part of the institution only they should train. Uh, I think um, Amrinder will agree with me that this shouldn't be only uh, trained for people who are in the institution. And you should, you should not train people who don't have the infrastructure to go back and do these procedures. So these are people who should not be trained. And uh, again, as I said, there's some strong opinion. Maybe some of you disagree. We can discuss it a little later, but this is my opinion. In general, there are two types of endoscopies. They are the thinker endoscopies who think of procedures, and they are the doers, the cowboys. So again, who should be trained? 
So this is a clear example. You know, the whole concept of third space endoscopy was thought by Pankaj, Pankaj Parishan, yes, but he never does it, which is okay. And uh, it was, uh, you know, you saw his idea and started doing it. So there, in endoscopy, what you have to sit down and reflect is, are you the thinker type or the doer type? If you are the thinker type, keep thinking, create some new techniques and all that, but you don't necessarily have to go into that. You can, you can contribute a lot by just uh, adding to the literature of how things can be done. It's a doers. So when, when I see young endoscopies, I sort of make out very clearly who are going to be the thinkers and who are doers. And I think it's the doers who should be trained. The second aspect of this is the trainers. This is very interesting. In fact, when I was in the W as a president, what we did is we went around the world taking small groups of people, 20, 20 endoscopies, training them in third space to see how it goes. Of course, it was successful. We had 20 youngsters in each country coming and learning. But what I learned in that thing is it's more than the trainers, the trainees also you have to look at very carefully who are training in this. So if you look at trainers, there are four groups. There are some people who are incompetent, but they don't know they're incompetent, unfortunately. So we have some examples of some uh, very senior endoscopists also, very incompetent, they don't know. There are some people who are incompetent, they know incompetent, so they don't go into unnecessary all these things, which is okay, safe. But the largest group of trainers we found were those who are very competent, but they didn't uh, they were very competent, but they couldn't explain why they were competent. You know, they're ex very good at doing, uh, you know, they'll dissect, they'll do the procedure, they'll, uh, but they don't. There is, this is a group of effective trainers who are, con who are competent, who are conscious about their competence, you know. Uh, if uh, today you saw, again, Amit demonstrating the Zenka's diverticulum very clearly because he knew all the steps, how to deconstruct a procedure and to give clear explanation of how. So these are the trainers. So those who are teaching third space endoscopy should fall into this category. And that is where those of you who want to learn should go to learn. Because otherwise there are some excellent people who do, but come into this category of um, unconscious competence and you can't learn from them. So if you know the procedure, then of course you can teach. So we come to the third aspect of this, that is uh, how in most endoscopy procedures, we would want a structured training to be done, you know, like, uh, first of all, this is important for third space also that you do a cognitive recognition training. For example, you saw uh, Mohan demonstrating um, endocytology, you know, how you should recognize patterns, how you should know how this pattern uh, represents a pre-malignant lesion or potential malignancy. So cognitive training is an extremely important part of uh, um, third space endoscopy to recognize patterns. And of course, we have Naresh also an expert here. And then the second thing is biosimulators. Third space endoscopy, you can't learn with simulators. You have to use a biomechanical simulators. And this is again, very important. Uh, I don't think any gastroenterologist go into third space without working on a few animal tissue, at least to get the feel. Of course, then you go and observe experts doing this procedure, like what you're doing now, you're coming and you're observing all the experts doing. And then the first 10 cases should be supervised hands-on. You call somebody to come to your center or you do in a particular center where you are supervised. So this is how the training should be set up. Because not only do we, part of the training is how things are set up, you know, where in your endoscopy room, you should have your cautery with endoscopy and monitor. All these are extremely important to make it easier for you to get into this space. And of course, most of the endoscopy rooms where this is done should have facility for endotracheal intubation because majority of the procedures are done this way. So the requirements of optimal endoscopic training are the appropriate environment, equipment should be there sufficient. And this is again, very important. Uh, unfortunately, most people I've seen starting at least in some of the other countries also, they don't have water jet endoscopy. They want to do third space. You can never do third space endoscopy without having a water jet endoscope. You're compromising. So this type of thing should be there. And of course, there are a huge amount of axillaries now that are available. And of course, you must have, as I said, high quality trainers. How long should, it, should you have this training? And this is a very variable question. Uh, again, those who are already in, you know, in your practices or institution can't spend long, but 
my feeling is anybody who wants to go seriously into third phase should spend at least three months. We don't have advanced endoscopy training like you have in Western countries of one year after your DM or DNB. We don't have that system, unfortunately. If you have, that would be ideal. But I would suggest that minimum period should be at least three months. Keep that uh, until that, that time, you should not go in. And then, as I said, the learning curve is not very difficult. In fact, there are various estimations here, and this is a study which came from Kasab's unit, which showed that. For example, in the poem, by 15 cases, you become very good at mucosal opening. By another 15 cases, some mucosal dissection, and another 15 cases for doing muscle. There was, again, a very good study in Japan. Minami's unit showed that to become comfortable, you require to have 15 cases. To become very comfortable, to do it routinely, 45 cases. To become an expert, you require 70 cases. So this is the learning curve, 15, 45, 70. So again, in India, volumes are very large. Most centers get this, so it's not difficult to get to this volume. So this is how we should do. And of course, again, this is, I want to emphasize that we should get trained in animal tissue. Should, um, there are, again, several places all over the country where you can have this. And I think tomorrow you're having this training here also, where you practice on animal tissue. Get a third. So you don't get the real feel with this, but I think uh, you tend to or get uh, at least uh, some amount of feel of how the third space is. And without this, you should not go into... Because if you look at airline industry, no pilot ever flies a plane without having training in simulation. But here we are doing third space directly onto the patient, which is not, I think, right. So you have to have. And finally, again, I want to emphasize this very strongly. Again, may discourage some of you that I think training in endoscopy is not training technicians. Third space endoscopy has become such a technical job. There are many people who just don't see the patients um, as a whole. It's very important that it should be a part of our approach to a patient in gastroenterology. And, and when you approach the patient as a whole, and this becomes a training becomes a part of it, then you get adequately trained. Again, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for the... But your talk has discouraged many of so us. We'll ask now, how many want to continue <laughs> third space training? Little discouraged. 10% have dropped out. Yeah. So the, uh, actually, the structured animal training should also be a part yeah. of our curriculum. In our DM uh, studies, when uh, we are taking training... You can even leave it alone. No, I, there's a little... Sorry, I, I want... No, I, you can I even leave it alone. Disagreement. In sure. DM training... Sure. 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 Post DM, sir. Post DM and DNB right. training is only to make a good clinical gastroenterology. Okay. It's the wrong concept. See, the that issue is the fibrosis. Because of that... It we is, should not. It should be an average endoscopy, endoscopy, colonoscopy, maybe in side wing scope. That's all for DNA. Should never a DM DNB student during his DM DNB course should not enter into animal lab. That's my opinion. Again, many people won't agree with me or get upset, but that's my opinion. Post DNB. I don't know what about Amari. What what is your view? So are we audible there? Are we audible? Uh, you are uh, more than audible, audible but uh, we are just talking? going to take two minutes. Uh, Amol okay. has completed the ESD and he will just say a few words. Hello, hi. So, are you getting the endoscopy image? Yes, yes, yes we are getting. So, we finally managed to get this lesion out. It was more like a shaving up from the muco muscle layer, and we all also created a defect over here where we had to completely uh, shave it off. Because there was significant fibrosis because of which this was there. We believe that this fibrosis was may, may more inflammatory rather than neoplastic because the pit pattern and the entire other uh, characteristics of, of the polyp were not actually in favor of malignant infiltration. Somebody has tried injecting yeah, this. Yeah, somebody has tried injecting this and probably they might have even tried doing some kind of a EMR procedure or something. Now, we are, although this is very distal and we may not, we may get away without, you know, even applying the, uh, applying a clip and closing this defect, we will try closing it. Uh, I have applied one clip to the apex, but now I am going to use the resolution 360 from Boston 
So can we shift to there? Yeah, sir? we can shift there. So in the last, I will just like to thank the all anesthesia team, Dr. Pooja, Dr. Ayushama, Dr. Surukanta and Dr. Rishita for helping us, my entire team and the faculty as well as nursing staff who has helped for the live demonstration. I think we can switch over there. Thank you. <clears throat> I think you've already mentioned the point, sir. I just like to reiterate that the, it, it, it's all a question of numbers and volume. So the person who is doing it has to be convinced that he will have enough volume at his center. Only then it makes sense to go somewhere, pick up the technique and coming. If you're doing solo practice, as you mentioned, it's not a, it's a, it's not golf. It's it's football. I mean, you really need the whole team to be there in your institution. And if you're a golfer, then you're going to be in trouble. That's the way I look at it. Uh, as we are running short of time, and I have been getting messages from the organizers. Thank you very much, sir. That sure, was thanks. very very enlightening. And yeah, sir, I wanted to add two more points to your uh, talk. One anesthetist anesthetists for endoscopy have become tremendously important part of our team. So in anybody who contemplates doing third space endoscopy should have a competent anesthetist with him. And some amount of learning on anesthesia machine, mean, mean airway pressures in ETCO2, we should know. <laughs> and one thing came as a surprise to me, sir, that uh, in our country, we do not even have simulators. For prior, primary endoscopy training, I was talking to Olympus senior people about US simulators. I saw them lay way back 10 years back at uh, AIG, but presently the whole country doesn't even have a single simulator. So simulation should be there for us as well. I don't think that's quite true. A lot of medical colleges, which according to the MCI, have to have a simulation back. A lot of them have, but they're not using it. Yeah. Even in Bangalore, there are at least one medical college I know has got excellent simulators, but they don't use it. Uh, now we invite uh, Dr. Amit Nadev for his talk on endoscopic suturing and stapling, the future in third space. I think uh, we had seen uh, Sir doing uh, suturing uh, for five years ago. I think uh, that was the first center which came with, with the suturing device. I request Dr. Uh, Medev to talk about that. Thank you so much. So it was a fantastic lecture, Nagi. You gave a very nice perspective on about third space because this is what is the topic of discussion of the last decade. So I'm going to talk to you something, something related to it, and that is endoscopic suturing and stapling and touch upon what is likely to happen in the future. As all of us know, uh, interventional endoscopy has grown in this fashion. And it's in the last decade or so that we have entered into a completely new horizon, uh, which is also can be called as flexible endoscopic surgery. Why? Because if you were to see what is happening to endoscopic interventional endoscopy in 2022, endoscopists have gone towards starting doing endoscopic dissection and resection. And procedures like endoscopic mucosal resection, endoscopic submucosal dissection, or endoscopic full thickness resection have now started increasing. Now, because of this, what is happening? We are creating defects in the wall of the GI tract and sometimes through and through the GI tract. In addition to that, some newer modalities are evolving and endoscopists are being called to also treat uh, uh, refractory GERD or PPI dependent GERD and also the endoscopic treatment for obesity. So therefore, the time has now come that we do need some better instrumentation, which was lacking for so many years. So what is the need for endoscopic suturing, stapling and closure devices? In today's scenario for interventional endoscopy, number one is to close defects, which we cause by EMR, ESD, or EFTR. Today, during the live demonstration, we saw a couple of procedures where there were some defects which happened, which could not be avoided, 
So the endoscopist has to be prepared and to know how to close these defects. Otherwise, it will become like a full thickness perforation. Second, as far as GERD is concerned, with the existing instrumentation, endoscopist cannot effectively remodel the esophagogastric junction and prevent GERD. So we need better instrumentation. Third, how to reduce the size of the stomach in obesity? Again, not by just putting clips. We need better instrumentation. Then another indication is outlet reduction for a gastrojejunal anastomosis post bariatric surgery. If the GJ has enlarged and the patient has regained weight. And of course, we also need endoscopic suturing for fixing implants like stents, which are likely to migrate. And finally, of course, closure of iatrogenically created perforations or sometimes even fistulae. Well, closure of a defect. Traditionally, we have been using by using this technique, which is called as the loop and the clip technique. And as you can see here, this is what we do. And by loop and the clip technique, this is a iatrogenic perforation, which happened in our own department a few years back while doing a colonoscopy. You can see there's a full thickness perforation of the colon in the sigmoid, rectosigmoid area. And what do we do? Do we send this patient to the surgeon? The first thing we do is to switch uh, in case you are in supplating air, we switch to carbon dioxide. But nowadays, most of our colonoscopies we do with CO2 in supplation. But a loop and a clip technique was something which was described some time back and which is traditionally used where we either put a loop like this through a double channel scope through one of the channels, or we can use a single channel scope and carry the loop by the side of the scope. And this is a loop which can be carried or it can be a detachable loop. And this loop is attached to the edge of the defect by a series of clips. And once you do that, all that we have to do is to close that loop after you have attached the loop to the edge. And then by closing the loop, this is how the defect can be completely closed. So this is now we have done the clipping of the loop to the edge. And now by closing the loop, you see here that entire defect can be closed. Now, this is something which is that which can be done by a routine interventional endoscopist. But I'll tell you, this is it looks like that simple, but it is not so simple, not so easy because the loop keeps on moving and it's not very easy to clip the, uh, the loop to the edge of the defect. Well, another device, which is a uh, over the scope device, a device which is attached to the endoscope. This is a padlock clip, but this is basically it can be used only for a small defect. For example, you see here, there is a, a ESD which was done for a neuroendocrine tumor and there's a small full thickness defect. And this is how the padlock clip can be applied. But this is applicable only to small size defects or fistulae. But if you have a big tear, you can't use a padlock clip because it will not cover the entire defect. And there's no point in putting it on only a part of the defect. So this is how it looks after putting the padlock clip. So this is also a possibility. But the actual advance which took place was the idea that we should try to suture inside the GI tract. And the first suturing machine you see here was described by Paul Swain. This was uh, way back in 1997, the first publication on endoscopic sewing. But you see here the device which he described, this had a little bit inlet by the side. So, which is attached to the tip of the scope, you go there and then you suck it inside. And this way, it was hoped, we, we hoped that we could suck the full thickness wall of the GI tract inside the device, and then we could suture it. In fact, there was a device called EndoSinch, which was introduced into the market, which some of us used that time, many years back. And then we realized very soon that by doing this sucking technique, all that we could suck was the mucosa, and the full thickness wall of the gut could not be sucked. Therefore, that suture never held in place, and it always gave way because the mucosa just a mucosal suturing did not hold true. But today in 2022, we have got various types of endoscopic suturing stapling devices. First and foremost is the main device, endoscopic suturing device, which is also called as the overstitch, which is uh, made by the Apollo endosurgery. Then we have got various stapling devices, full thickness stapling devices, like the Gerdex, the Muse, the esophagosic, And of course, the latest device in the market, which is extremely user friendly, which is still not available in our country, is the tacking device, which I'm going to show you now. 
Now this Apollo suturing device, this was the group, uh, original idea from Sidney Chung from Hong Kong. He came up with this device, which was also called as the Eagle Claw. He drew it on a paper. And then this group of physicians from the entire world, predominantly from United States, you see here from the Mayo Clinic, Chris Gostout, and from Texas, Pankaj Pasricha, along with Sidney Chung, they came up with this uh, suturing device called Overstitch. And then it was taken away. They formed a company called Apollo Endo Surgery. And today, this is the final uh, Overstitch device, which is available, which can be used with a double channel or a single channel scope. And you see here, this is how the technique is actually performed, where you have got a needle driver on this side. There are two arms for this device. And this needle is attached to this needle driver. And then once the suture is loaded, then you can go near the defect. And by using this screw type of a device, we pull the wall in between the two arms. And by this, once you pull the wall in between the two arms, you just close this needle driver so that the suture goes through and through the wall on the other side. Once it comes on the other side, you pull the needle back. And once you have pulled the needle back, the first suture is done. This is how it is done. So this way you can take a series of uh, continuous suturing of any defect for that matter. And then finally you release the needle like this. And then you cinch it by using another type of a device. And by cinching, such type of a defect can be very securely and nicely closed. Well, presently, the main indication of using the overstitch is for doing a procedure which is called as endoscopic sleeve gastroplasty for obesity. And this is how we actually perform the procedure where we can actually do a full thickness plication of the stomach along the greater curvature, starting just proximal to the incisor angularis. And by using this suturing device, you see here, we are now loading this needle on this needle driver. Uh, this is the 2-0 proline uh, where the needle is attached. And by starting over here, we keep on taking the sutures. So we have to pull the wall of the stomach in between the two arms for which we are using this screw type of device, which is also called as a helix. By rotating this, we are going in the wall. You have to stay a little away from the wall so that we can pull the wall completely inside. If you, are go if you are too close, then only the mucosa will come. So we should be a little bit away, decompress the stomach, take out the air, and then we, end we are going to pull the wall inside. The first suture is done. And this way, we can keep on taking a continuous suture along the greater curvature of the stomach. You can see how this suture line is being formed. And thereby, loop by loop, we can completely suture the stomach and reduce the size of the stomach as well as the length of the stomach by almost 50% or more. And thereby, it has provided a good alternative to, to a laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy in uh, mild to moderate obesity patients who have a BMI. Uh, less than 40, uh, anywhere between 32 to 38. And by doing this, we can achieve a reasonably good weight loss of approximately 15% of the total body weight loss at the end of six months to one year. A second indication where such type of suturing is routinely now performed is, I told you, a procedure called TOR, transoral outlet reduction in patients who undergone a Ruawai gastrectomy, sleeve uh, uh, Ruawai surgery for obesity, type 2 diabetes. And now this anastomosis has expanded. It has enlarged. Patient has regained weight. So what we do, just if you suture it, it's not going to remain in place. So we are going to make this a uh, little bit raw by doing pulsed argon plasma coagulation. And after doing pulsed APC, we are going to suture and reduce this outlet. And thereby, we can achieve a good and a sustained weight loss in these patients who have regained weight. Third procedure where suturing is very useful again is this procedure called EDGE. In patients who have also gone a bariatric surgery, you see a bypass stomach. This is the bypass stomach, and this is the stomach remnant over here. And this patient has got a biliary pathology like a CBD stone. We can't perform an ERCP here because going through the Ruawai loop is not going to be easy. So we want to enter into this excluded stomach. So therefore, under US guidance, you can put a lumen opposing metal stent. And once you have put a lumen opposing metal stent from the remnant stomach to the excluded stomach, if you pass an ERCP scope through this stent, this stent is going to dislocate. So once we place this lumen opposing metal stent, we go inside and do suturing of that stent to the wall of the remnant stomach. And once the stent is fixed, then we can pass an ERCP scope through the stent and then perform the ERCP in this patient like this, who has undergone a Ruawai bypass because of bariatric surgery. 
the most important indication of suturing is of course where you have done a iatrogenic perforation here you can see on the left side one of our own cases where we did a endoscopic mucosal resection of a lateral spreading tumor in the duodenum there was a full thickness defect in the second part of the duodenum and here by using this suturing device we are doing complete suturing of that defect in the second part of the duodenum now this patient would have otherwise gone for a emergency surgery because you have done a full thickness perforation in the duodenum but by doing such type of a suturing by using this suturing device we can close this defect very securely similarly on the right side you see here another patient where we performed a esd in a patient who had a tumor in the lower end of the esophagus and after doing that esd there was a full thickness defect in the esophagus we can see the mediastinum outside but this defect also we could close very easily by using the suturing device so this is as far as, far as the suturing device is concerned what about the stapling and this is the stapling device which uh, sort of revolutionized the method of stapling now this was a device which was published by this uh, german physician you see here this is the gerdex device uh, which was uh, brought out by the g surge company from germany and one of the main indications of performing this gerdex device is for patients who have got a ppi dependent gerd this is how it looks so what we can do nowadays we can actually remodel the esophago gastric junction in patients who have got ppi dependent gerd and this is how that gerdex device is passed inside the stomach you can see here the two arms are opened we are taking a u turn now this device through this device itself there's a channel through which we can pass a baby scope ultra thin scope and then again similarly this also has got a spiral cinch uh, a spiral helix by which we can pull the full thickness area of the stomach this is the lesser curvature of the stomach that the greater curvature so we are pulling it inside and then once it is pulled inside we are going to put a full thickness staple and if you were to see here what happens after the after the stapling it almost looks as if we have performed an uh, a laparoscopic fundoplication you see here this is how nice it looks pre and post procedure uh, this is before this is after so after doing the stapling this is what we can do finally this is the extract device which is a series of helix uh, such type of a helix stack there are four types of four helix which can be put at one time and by using this device a single channel endoscope extremely user friendly we can close defects like emr either in the colon or in the duodenum like this you just put these helix stacks on the side and then cinch it and by this we can close the defect but if you are to ask me what is going to happen in the future in third space endoscopy after all these devices even though they can be used now and a variety of indications have opened up the horizon has opened up uh, the learning curve can be a little bit difficult especially for the overstitch other devices a little bit easier but they can be cumbersome but what is going to change the future is this and that is the the multi arm robotic endoscope you see here by using this we have got double arms and by putting this robotic endoscope inside we can actually lift and cut and we can actually use a needle and we will be able to perform not only third space procedures but perhaps possibly fourth and fifth space in the future and enter inside the peritoneum or enter inside the mediastinum and probably perform procedures on various organs thanks for your attention uh, the, quite a interesting and enlightening uh, talk as usual by dr madev and i have been seeing him since last uh, two decades of my gi practice and we learned so many things by seeing you sir thank you so much and if there are questions we have 2 uh, minutes to complete because we are running short of time are there questions in the house sir i mean uh, the esg device which became so popular and there are data also suggesting that uh, i mean sleeve it's like competing with sleeve gastrectomy laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy what do you think is the future for this esg i will not say it is competing with sleeve gastrectomy because uh, all said and done after doing a endoscopic sleeve gastroplasty the results are not as durable as a laparoscopic gastrectomy what happens is because stomach is a very mobile organ every time the stomach moves the sutures are under tension so after 7 or 8 months there is a possibility that the sutures become little loose and the patient 
can start regaining a little weight. So nowadays, after endoscopic sleeve gastroplasty, we routinely tell the patients that after seven, eight months, or maybe after a year, we go in again and put a few more sutures to make the procedure a little bit more durable and always supplement them with some oral medications to suppress their appetite. Right, sir. Sir, this pose device, which is another uh, anti-obesity equipment which is coming in, you think this will also have uh, some future for uh, endosuturing and closing the defects? Yes, it is the similar thing, similar principle as the gastroplasty like overstitch. Right. But the pose device is likely to be much, much more expensive than the simple overstitch device. Because the number of uh, applications which we need to do with the pose to achieve the same results are too much as compared to the ESG. With right. only four sutures, we can do in the gastroplasty. Right. Thank you so much, sir. Yes, Naresh. If you are an investor and not an endoscopist, where would you put your money? Because we've seen from 1990, we've seen so many devices. Where would you put your money now? My money I'll put on the robotic flexible multi armed endoscope, for sure. And we have done human trials on that scope uh, in the initial stages. And definitely, it is a success. In fact, we could pass the scope inside up to the almost till the antrum of the stomach. It was too thick just now presently, but now it's undergoing development, but I'm quite sure that in the next one year, the same scope will come where we will have multiple arms inside. So whether you pass it from the colon or you go it from the esophagus, we will actually have multiple arms by which we can hold, lift, cut, dissect, and suture. Everything we can do. And otherwise, second is that x stack device. That is also very good. For the time being, all the devices which I showed you, is worth putting your money on. Uh, thank you so much. So we'll have Dr. Amol Bapai, who will be uh, who's the next speaker, and he's going to talk on difficult poems when we are in no man's land. So he probably is going to talk about the complications and when not to do a poem procedure. Amol Bapai is one of uh, most experienced and seasoned and uh, most renowned endoscopist of our country and we are really proud that Amol is here today because as we all know that this frame procedure was first time performed by Dr. Amol Bapai and he has been a leader in third space endoscopy and uh, he is really doing wonders and uh, been putting in a lot of literature in scientific journals to enhance our knowledge on uh, third space endoscopy. Dr. Amol, screen is for you. Am I audible there, Dr. Amul? Hello. Hello, Dr. Kalla? Uh, we can't listen to you, Amul. Hello. And your slides are also not visible here. Hello. Yeah. Dr. Kalla, am I audible there now? Hello. Hello. Hello, Dr. Kalla. I think in no time, Amul will be with us. So in the meantime, uh, yeah, he's there. Hello, Dr. Kalla. Amul, are you listening? Because we can't, yeah. we do not have your voice here. I can hear you, but can you hear me? Hello? Can you hear me? No, sorry. Voice is still not. Okay. I think the voice is going from here, this side. Maybe at the hall end, they have to check the audio over there. Hello? Hello? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Please go ahead. Yeah. Now, is my voice there? Okay. Uh, the voice please give my slides. And, uh, yes. Now, we have his slides here. Yeah, my slides. So, thank yeah, you, Dr. Voice Kalla. is not there again. Voice is there or not there? Dr. Kalla? 
जूम पे ना उन्होंने स्क्रीन शेयर में ऑडियो शेयरिंग दिया नहीं होगी नहीं वहां पे जो शेयरिंग हो रहा है ना उसमें शायद हेलो चेक चेक हेलो हेलो चेक कौन सो हेलो मैक टेस्टिंग हेलो आ गया चेक हेलो हेलो चेक हेलो हेलो सन चेक चेक हेलो हेलो जल्दी करो चेक हेलो हेलो चेक हेलो हेलो चेक हेलो चेक हेलो हेलो एक काम करो ना मोबाइल पे करो चेक हेलो चेक हेलो 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 ये यस अमोल या sorry about the uh, the delay i think no no there's okay. some technical issue yeah, yeah clear clear doctor. voice now please go ahead yeah so at the outset let me thank dr rajesh and the entire medanta team for dr sood as well uh, for this uh, wonderful gathering and uh, for inviting me to be part of this uh, fantastic meeting uh, we've seen a lot of difficult procedures during the day during the afternoon we saw a difficult esd and now it is my it is time to talk about difficult poem so before i begin you know let us think about this in perspective thomas fuller said that all things are difficult before they get easy and i think this is true for any new procedure which uh, has evolved and uh, over a period of time and uh, we all know that as we get better with the procedure things which were difficult earlier start becoming more easier and easier so let us look at what makes poem difficult so we can have patient factors we can have the operator factors and we can have other factors which are not patient or operator directly related to that and let us look at some of the common difficulties during poem now uh, rajesh wanted me to talk about difficult poem now there are certain situations where poem does get difficult which we know that when there is submucosal fibrosis when it's a sigmoid achalasia it's a long standing achalasia all these things we know that but rather than focusing on only those cases what i would like to demonstrate and what i would like to talk about is the common difficulties that we encounter during poem and how we can circumvent that so difficulties can be in the submucosal elevation or while enter, entering into the submucosal tunnel identification of tissue planes can be a problem hemostasis can be challenging the direction of dissection can be a issue sometimes particularly in sigmoid achalasia and dissection, dissection at the gastroesophageal junction many of the you know, people who start a poem afresh have a challenge and also up to the on to the gastric side and sometimes there can be challenges with closure so let us look at some of these situations so before i begin as we saw in the last esd case also in any kind of a third space procedure submucosal fibrosis is the achilles heel which can actually you know make the most you know experienced endoscopist also really you know by dust and it can really test the humility of the person and we have to be very humble with the submucosa because despite the best of instruments and techniques that we may have but if the submucosa decides to behave you know difficult then we can encounter difficulties so what does submucosal fibrosis do first thing is that we don't get a good elevation and therefore there is hardly any space in the submucosa to dissect that can also lead to difficulty in, to enter into the tunnel and also to identify layers for precise dissection usually fibrosis is accompanied with neovascularization so there is an increased risk of bleeding and also increased risk of mucosal injury and this also leads to increased procedure time therefore patients can become more prone for gas related adverse events and also this can sometimes pose difficulty in closure so let us look at some of these situations in greater depth now we can see over here this is the standard technique for submucosal elevation and we can see that 
we can uh, you know once we start injecting and pull the needle back we get a good elevation over here now this is the standard but let us look at what happens on this side so we try to inject there is hardly any elevation you just get a little bit of a pocket over here we inject further we still get only a linear kind of a thing and uh, the mucosa is not lifting very well so what do we do in this kind of a situation change the direction very often you will encounter that posteriorly because the patient is lying down and the fluid and the secretions pool in the, the posterior aspect you will encounter more fibrosis posteriorly than anteriorly and anteriorly you can get a better elevation so in these situations if you convert from a posterior to an anterior poem i think the problem could be resolved so you here you can see that there is a good elevation and we can go ahead with the mucosal incision without much problems second thing is entering into the tunnel there are two important things that we have to do when entering into the tunnel after the mucosal incision we need to undermine and uh, the edges and create a ledge so that the scope can go inside as uh, you you saw in the poem procedure earlier when rajesh was demonstrating that and unless we create a ledge it is very difficult to enter inside so see how we are creating a ledge over here and once the ledge is created on both sides and also at the apex then things become much easier and we can enter very easily now many of the endoscopists who start who embark on poem they are kind of in a, in a hurry to enter into the submucosal tunnel but they forget that you know undermining is very important so as to get entry into the tunnel so now we have got inside the second important point is if the esophagus is very dilated sometimes when we are doing a posterior you know, poem entry can become difficult because the down movement of the scope is only 90 degrees whereas the up up is 210 degrees in these situations we can just turn the scope around as you can see over here and then you can make the entry and then of course you can turn the scope back once you are inside the tunnel and uh, so that the muscle is posterior at 6 o'clock once we are within the tunnel the direction of dissection should be perpendicular to the circular muscle fibers and it should be uniform in all the directions there is a tendency because very often the instrument comes out at around 7 o'clock instead of 6 o'clock to tunnel more either on the left or right or to the left because the direction of instrument is towards that direction but we have to correct that before you know proceeding ahead otherwise the tunnel can get twisted and uh, that can lead to difficulty in identifying uh, you know the landmarks now submucosal fibrosis as i mentioned that is the achilles heel and this is a patient with significantly fi significant fibrosis in the submucosal tunnel you can see dense fibrosis and few pointers what we have to do is first thing is one has to be very patient with the dissection go fiber by fiber injection has to be copious it has to be repeated and one cannot expect that one injection will do the job so we have to keep injecting in small alicos because the fluid is not going to re retain in the tissues and it is going to seep out and we have to keep injecting again layer separation is very important where we can see that there is the muscle layer and the blue submucosa is very important to differentiate between the uh, the muscle and the submucosal layer and optimal retraction using the, the cap but at the same time one should not push indiscriminately because that can lead to laceration of the mucosal incision as well as of the muscle as well we should always dissect from a normal looking area so here you can see that once we inject we see a little bit of blue so use that as a guide and start dissecting over there and then go to the other side the knife tip should always be visible and if in doubt one should pull back and reorient so i am not going to go through the entire video for want of time now coming to hemostasis when how and how much 
So hemostasis on the mucosal aspect, always pro pre-coagulate whenever possible. So grasp the vessels using a coagrasper. We have found that using the colonic small caliber coagrasper is usually more effective because it grasps less tissue and can grasp the vessel very precisely. Also remember to pull back before you start coagulating so that you avoid a mucosal injury. Bleeding can also occur during myotomy. We can see over here that there is bleeding occurring. And what is important to note is one should not panic, irrigate the field. And a small bleeding like that can very often be coagulated with the knife tip itself. So patience, irrigation and precision are all important in this. And just a tap with the coagulation and it should stop. There you can see. Sometimes bleeding can be torrential as you will see in this patient. This patient had extensive submucosal fibrosis with neovascularization. And you can see a brisk bleeding over here. Very brisk and the field gets disturbed in no time. So first thing what we do is we inject in this area before taking out the knife. We know that we are going to need to use a coagrasper, but we inject first because that will lead to some tamponade. Further, we can push with the cap and uh, create more tamponade. But what is important is irrigate continuously. This is like glue injection. Don't try to suck because it will obscure your field uh, further. So just keep irrigating until you exchange your in instrument to a coagrasper and then go ahead, grasp with the coagrasper. Take your time, be patient. Don't be in a hurry and don't panic. Make sure you grasp and then once the bleeding has stopped, then coagulate because otherwise it can lead to indiscriminate coagulation. Coming to the gastroesophageal junction, which is again another Achilles heel and uh, not Achilles heel, but that is the bottleneck for most patients. How do we identify? So we all know that these are the identifying landmarks. It is a narrow space which uh, opens up with a giveaway feel and then there is an open area on the other side, on the gastric side. You can see the palisading vessels and the spindle-shaped vessels. There is a blue staining on the uh, uh, on retroflexion that we can see on the fundus side. The distance from incisors and we also reported that we have to adjust for the esophageal diameter because otherwise one can miscalculate the distance. Double scope trans elimination can also be used. It has been shown to be one of the most efficient techniques. And presence of the penetrating vessels, particularly when we are doing a posterior poem, helps in a uh, definitely to identify the G junction. However, one thing that we have to remember is that G junction is cramped for space. So we have to be very gentle and very meticulous in this place. And the layer separation has to be meticulous. So gentle retraction with the cap again, and we again need to keep injecting. And what is important is we need to pay attention to these corners because these corners are what actually holds the scope back here. See, it's a flimsy little semicircular valve kind of a thing of the submucosa, but it holds your scope back and it prevents advancement of the scope. So open it up completely and then we go ahead. We can advance the scope much more efficiently. Do not push indiscriminately because that will only lead to further buckling and coiling of the scope. And always look, uh, keep watching for the landmarks. In very tight G junctions, when we it is impossible to go across, sometimes we can do a little bit of pre-cut myotomy where the uh, muscle spasm is really reduced and then we can go ahead. Use of amyl nitrate has also been reported, although I have no personal experience with that but that is how we can do. One important thing at the G junction that we have to be to safeguard against is that the muscle can split, particularly when there is fibrosis and in a recurrent achalasia post Hellers or post balloon dilation. So here you can see that the dissection has actually gone inside the muscle layers and we have actually gone outside the muscle layer over here. And the dissection plane is actually over here on top over here at around 10, 11 o'clock. 
So we have to correct and orient the direction. Again, we have to inject in that space, and then we have to perform the myotomy because otherwise the myotomy will remain incomplete, and the patient will not get benefit of the procedure. Some pertinent issues with the myotomy: we must begin with a layer by layer, and we should go full depth. either circular circular selective circular all full thickness whatever we want, we wish to do but we should go to the to the entire depth that the desired depth and then pick it pick up the muscle fibers and start the myotomy so here we are doing a full thickness myotomy so we you can see over here once we have gone deep enough then we pick up the fibers and we go we divide the muscles so for posterior we go from 6 o'clock towards 12 o'clock for anterior we go from 12 o'clock to 6 o'clock what is important is go deep to superficial direction that should be the direction except at the gastroesophageal junction where to prevent an inadvertent mucosal injury one can do a superficial to a deep approach another important point is we have to we have to avoid going close to the mucosa and engage the knife just under the muscle and not include the surrounding tissues that is important coming to closure how do we close and sometimes your yeah, our incision may not be the cleanest of the incisions and if that happens then closure can become a little bit challenging here you can see that there is a little bit of a overhang on the left hand side edge now we have to start correcting it so how do we do that so using the a combination of the cap and the clip flange we actually go ahead Yeah, apply the clip the apicular clip obviously is the most important you apply the clips the second clip and as we go ahead here you will see that the edges that discrepancy in the length of the edges is getting corrected what is important is if it's an unequal we take a larger bite on the depressed edge and a smaller bite on the elevated edge so that the depressed edge also gets everted do we always use large clips well not necessarily because if the mucosa is very thickened then probably larger clips have an advantage but otherwise if we use very large clips uh, you uh, uh, routinely sometimes there is a tendency for the mucosal edges to get inverted rather than everted and we should have an everted edge of the mucosa for a uh, you know uh, edge to edge closure what is important is that we should use clips with a short tail so that applying subsequent clips becomes easier a point a word about mucosal injuries so here you can see that there is a mucosal laceration also proximally and there there is mucosal laceration over here because of diathermy injury through the tunnel because of fibrosis and these areas need to be clipped all these areas should be clipped one has to be very careful because the mucosa is papery thin over here and where you apply the clip it can again cut through so one has to be very careful this is another very severely fibrotic achalasia where we had a large rent at the gastroesophageal junction this is a slightly longish video after the myotomy we could not approximate the edges using the clip and uh, only the clip so we used an endo loop plus clip technique to close the entire defect so this is something that may be required at times here you can see we have applied the fix the clip to the edges of the mucosal defect and now we are closing the endo loop this is the detachable kind of an endo loop coming uh, which comes from leomed it it can be used through a single channel scope and makes things very easy so that is how the defect can be closed coming to other patient factors duration of achalasia and diameter of the esophagus and degree of tortuosity and sigmoidization is important condition of the esophageal mucosa particularly if you see bad esophagitis like this with a lot of food residue do not take up these patients directly for poem presence of food residue and this kind of esophagitis place an esophagastric tube occasionally we've also placed peg tubes Before, so that this esophagitis heals before we take up these patients for poem issues with sigmoid what all can happen usually this is long standing 
and if the fibrosis is severe therefore terminal entry is difficult and the direction of dissection can be very confusing what is the you know, what is heartening to note is it has been proven that a short myotomy is usually adequate and what is important to note is that we must follow the basic principles and the basic direction of be remaining perpendicular to the circular muscle fibers coming to operator factors one has to be very well conversant with the technique of dissection hemostasis identification of tissue planes and tissue handling and understanding the nuances of the technique as well as the technology and the instruments that one is using without which it is difficult and one can get into trouble and can have uh, difficulties and i have put these factors as other factors patient comorbidities can make procedures difficult your anesthetist should be part of the team and they have to be familiar with this gas related issues so that they can circumvent them well and they can alert you at the right time coming to endoscopist experience and i think dr reddy has uh, mentioned about this in in great detail in his talk the learning curve is very important and do not take the poem lightly or any of the third phase procedures lightly 20 to 40 procedures are required before one can become uh, an expert and not only the endoscopist experience but the experience and the involvement of the entire team the technician as well as the other people in the room is equally important and also familiarity of the surroundings so be sure that you do it in a place where you, where you are familiar with the entire surroundings a word about gas related issues anticipate and identify and treat if i say promptly anesthetist needs to be sensitized and riding rising the uh, entitled carbon dioxide of more than 50 can be an alarm signal capnoperitoneum requires needle paracentesis and sub subcutaneous emphysema and needs only hyperventilation what is important is if the patient has high entitled uh, carbon dioxide just take a break pull out your scope ask the anesthetist to hyperventilate for 10 to 15 minutes everything will get normalized and then you can proceed with the procedure few take home points i am sure that it is impossible to cover everything related to a difficult poem in 15 minutes but what is important to note is that any procedure can be made simple or difficult based on several factors as we have noticed simple poems are those with type 2 achalasia with a short history a clean esophagus with mini and uh, which is minimally dilated however what is important to note is anticipate the difficulty that is more than half the job done one should have a plan and one should stick to the plan so even in the most simplest of poems go in with a plan how you are going to tackle the problem and remember however that despite the best planning one may be one may encounter unexpected scenarios which one has to handle what is most important is do not panic if there is a perforation if there is bleeding and i'm sure it, with you know with optimum training you can take care of these situations and always have a plan b ready in case your plan a does not work friends poem is a surgical procedure we need to remember that and therefore we need to follow surgical principles anticipation in order to prevent is always superior to avoiding fire fighting when we encounter a difficult situation or a complication and what is most important is everything difficult can be made simple by proper training and by, by proper planning but however if training and planning is lacking even the most simplest of things can also turn difficult therefore our approach matters for more information do join us in july 1st 2nd and 3rd to pune, at pune for our annual third space meeting thank you so much thanks rajesh once more and congratulations on a great event uh, that was quite a comprehensive uh, coverage of uh, poem its problems and difficulties and how to solve it we are already running late so i am sure you will have multiple questions from dr amol so you can have those questions during dinner time because we have more exciting things happening beyond this session thank you moderators for our next session which is a new technological launch event i would request our chairpersons to be seated comfortably on the sofas itself for this session the chairpersons are dr amit medeo 
डॉक्टर अमोल बापाय डॉक्टर ए एस पुरी डॉक्टर निलय मेहता डॉक्टर नरेश भट्ट डॉक्टर मुकेश कला एन आई इनवाइट डॉक्टर रणधीर सूद सर आर चेयरपर्सन है पैटोबिल इंस्टीट्यूट में दानता एन आर कोर्स चेयरपर्सन टू बिगिन इज एक्साइटिंग टॉक ऑन न्यू वाइट लाइट थैंक यू good evening i think after seeing all those procedures and exciting talks uh, we have come from colored light to white light well uh, you know in gi the colorectal cancer is number 1 and gastric cancer is number 2 and early detection is all that matters because that saves lives and 1.8 million cases worldwide uh, uh, of colorectal cancers uh, happen every year with almost 86 lakh people dying out of it and 1% increase in adenoma detection saves 3% decreases the mortality by 3% so this is a very important if you can detect adenomas uh, early you can save lives and miss rate of flat depressed and pale lesions is high because it is difficult to detect them with the present day technology because the subtle differences in the morphology a uh, weighed uh, detection and uh, one can easily overlook them the image enhanced endoscopy with optical image enhancement techniques like nvi fis i scan etc are in use to circumvent this particular problem have been successful to some extent but nvi improves the adenoma detection rate better than white light but fails to improve the early gastric cancer detection so there is a, a, a need for uh, doing something more and early detection diagnosis and treatment remains the main pillar of endoscopic uh, management of these patients apart from what i told you subtle morphological uh, and color changes escape detection curvature and tubular structure of the gi tract is another challenge because it has it causes differential lighting uh, lighting of the lumen there is more light in the uh, near vicinity and there is uh, the uh, the far areas are uh, dark and this becomes the major reason for missing these and image enhanced uh, endoscopy is trying to improve on that but uh, uh, you know let's look at what are the endoscopic uh, advancements which have happened till date which can help us uh, achieve this there are two basic areas in which the advancements have happened one is a wide field of view that uh, you know you li like to see the entire lumen as much as possible in one go and in this there is a high definition uh, end endoscopes and now the 4k endoscopy and continuous focus or dual focus endoscopes or the contrast enhancement like virtual chromo endoscopy or uh, 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 which is post processing or pre processing or combined pre processing and post processing i'll not go into the details then fluorescence endoscopy of various types uh, you know uh, which can help us in early detection then of course we have got endos uh, you know um, uh, endoscopic microscopy uh, which is uh, uh, endocytoscopy or cone focal laser endoscopy and uh, which can be either uh, you know uh, integrated or uh, probe based or uh, you know endoscope based and these all basic aim is to improve our ability to detect lesions early there are you know five uh, components for producing that uh, uh, detectable image one is that your endoscope should have characteristics which will include field of view depth of uh, uh, you know focus lens quality image sensor and it should be providing adequate overall brightness and light distribution then your processor light source should be able to give enough illumination and type of light which can be adjusted according to the lumen and image processor technologies which can reduce that uh, you know image noise that is the distortions in the image and brightness control and uh, it should the color reproduction should uh, should be very accurate it's not that transmitting this image to what you see on the monitor is the work of these cables these cables are essential for uh, you know conveying this image of high quality to the monitor and then of the last is the display uh, on a monitor which can actually reproduce the image acquired by the endoscope advanced endoscopy system in the same fidelity as it was uh, captured by the endoscope 
So this, these are important factors. So when we talk of image, we, I talked of these points and that's how these all factors need to be integrated into endoscopy system today to achieve this. You know, the most important one factor I told you was the light source. This was the daylight. This is the daylight. Everybody is familiar with the Vibgur. Then halogen had this spectrum of light and the xenon came very close to the daylight. But now we don't use xenon and, uh, you know, the, the, the human eye perceives this uh, range of wavelength, the maximum. But our LED lights have predominant blue light. With the, uh, with the spectrum of uh, eye perception, light. And so you need something to be done with LEDs first so that we do not have inter uh, you know, uh, interference with the blue wave, uh, uh, wavelength of the light. Second, if you look at it, if you move from white light, now, uh, this is the fidelity of the, this screen, which may not give you the exact uh, replication, but the white light, the colors are smudged. As you move to warmer light, the colors become more prominent. And that's what happens uh, in the new system where uh, the LED has, uh, amber LED has been added to the three LEDs which are already there. So, so that this color fidelity becomes better perceived. Apart from this, over a period of time, we have moved from the uh, standard uh, you know, TV system, both in the chip as well as the display to high definition TV systems with the significant improvement, the improvement in the image, but we need to even have a better quality image capturing. These developments have resulted in improved detection and the society guidelines have you know, endorsed it that high definition endoscopy is recommended for endoscopic surveillance of Barrett's. And ESG says that high definition endoscopy and dye or virtual chroma endoscopy uh, can be used for average patients and definitely for patients of Lynch syndrome. Similarly, high magnification is also a very important com component, and uh, this, these are the recommendations uh, of ESGE in uh, uh, NBI in, uh, uh, with magnification for uh, uh, determining the layers which are likely to be invasive. And similarly, magnification is of use when there is uh, uh, either the uh, nice type three lesions or nice one and two with the demarcated area. Apart from, uh, you know, this is an example of uh, what magnification can do to your image quality. Now we talk of differential focus. You see that this is a, a instance of where the near focus is not there, but the distant uh, view is very clearly focused. Here the near near field is focused, but the distant field is lost. So this is this type of uh, image in and on endoscopy is problematic because you have a tendency to uh, miss the lesions. So there are certain unmet needs. One is the true color reproduction. Magnification with the regular endoscope is low and not enough for clear characterization. And non-uniform focus of the GI lumen happens, which is again uh, leads to missed lesions and magnification possible only of limited area under view. Then this is uh, the new white light, which uh, Olympus uh, is very proud of presenting. And uh, the, the, these couple of slides are courtesy Olympus. And this is this aims at texture and color enhancement imaging. That's what is TXI. The TXI actually enhances three white, uh, white light image characteristics. Texture, brightness, and color. This is based on retinax theory. Human retina also splits the image into two layers. One is the, uh, you know, the, the image acquired by the rods uh, and the image superimposed by the cones to give you a, a colored image, what you get. And this also, these scopes split the image into two layers, base layer and the detail layer. And these layers are separately processed and then fused to form a uniform illumination. And color, then there is a third, third aspect that is a color image enhancement correction according to the multi-scale retinex theory, which actually enhances certain colors to give you better perception of uh, the, the image you are viewing. And this is in principle what happens that RGB input splits that into two layers, base layer and detail layer. 
and th this is you adjust the brightness of the base layer tone mapping of the base layer and in detail layer you adjust the text uh, texture enhancement this is all done by the processor and the uh, the the the, uh, the scope uh, chip and the image stacking happens in the processor and this leads to txi uh, uh, you know two mode image and if you do color enhancement that is tx1 image and uh, these are high quality images uh, on endoscopy available today this is the same only thing is that even when you are not using txi mode this this system has brightness adjustment imaging and it, uh, it maintains the contrast and which they call uh, bai mac and this is what for all of you who have x1 system that uh, the, if you are not using uh, the, you know txi mode then it has still the brightness uh, uh, adjusted image with the uh, contrast uh, adjustment and only when the when there is the texture enhancement there is the mode 2 when there is color enhancement added this is mode 1 just to give you some examples this is the image without TXI enhancement on the same scope, and this is by TX, TXI uh, uh, the image, and you can see the difference in the image quality. And similarly, when you do uh, TX, uh, you know, uh, uh, one mode. Uh, You see the, uh, the lesion here, and with the color enhancement, it becomes very obvious. So demarcation of the lesion becomes much easier. The another uh, quality is the extended depth of field, the, uh, you know, which gives you an advantage. And why, how does it happen? There's a beam uh, splitter in the, integrated in the scope. And uh, you know, these are two fields. You can see the, this is the, the near field is uh, you know, no, a blur. And the distant field is uh, seen, and here the, the, this, the near field is seen better, and the distant field is blurred. <coughs> but once you, uh, in this DOF scopes, you infuse these two images. And so you have a uniform illumination and detailing of the entire field under view. And this gives you a very clear uh, luminal view, and which is very essential for. Uh, you know, luminal imaging because it may not be for the flat surfaces. So it is easy to focus and no learning curve required and, and everybody can use it. Magnetic fashion is there and improved depth of field is there. So this adds a lot of value in your endoscopic examination. The last component is the 4K endoscopy. You can see the image quality here and the image quality here. There is a significant difference. Why it happens? Because there is a four times more pixels than the full HD. This is the full HD image and this is the 4K image because uh, the number of pixels uh, in, the, in the both the, the axes are double and in each image there is four times uh, better uh, density of the uh, you know, pixels. You, we are shortly moving from 4K to 8K and this will enhance the image quality further because you need a, uh, you know, a, a display system that's your monitor which is capable of displaying the image which your very advanced endoscope has produced. And uh, that is very important. And today, to sum it up, enhancement, uh, you know, TXI has potential clinical advantage. We have still no proof of it. We don't have literature to support it. But looking at what, what, how the images are, enhancement of visibility of suspicious areas based on white light imaging, and let me tell you, it's not only white light imaging, you can, uh, we st can still integrate NBI with it. So there's no deficiency in it. It can improve the visibility of potential lesions by enhancing color and texture. And this will reduce the miss rates. So I think this will help us in better diagnosis. <coughs> Whether it can match the human eye or surpass it. And I, our ability to see and interpret the image may become tomorrow the only limiting factor because you can keep advancing from 8K to 16K, but can our eye interpret that image equally will remain a question. Thank you. Yeah.
cost not better than what we were in 1985 cost and uh, you know we, we like do you know all the functions of your cell phone no because we we don't uh, learn uh, our endoscopes what all they can do so we whenever we buy new scopes also we ultimately end up using the same way as the older scopes only the uh, the charm of having a new endoscope so i think we need to learn what all our endoscopes can do and for that industry and people like you have to spend a lot of time thank you so uh, before dr nageshwar reddy talk because i think he is going for the airport <laughs> And Dr. Sudh is also planning to go. So Olympus, because this is the launch of the Olympus course, so 30 seconds they are running the video. And then I will invite Dr. Nageshwar ready to deliver his talk in advances in the GI bleed management technique and the beyond. Thank you, Rajesh, for this kind invitation. I think my slides come on. So, uh, Rajesh asked me to talk on advances in GI bleed, tech and beyond. So, most advances in endoscopy occur because of advances in technology or techniques, and so too with uh, treating GI bleeds. But GI bleed treatment has become an essential part of our uh, armamentarium. And you saw so many procedures today. A bleed is no longer considered an adverse event. It's considered as a part of the procedure. And like surgery, we'll have to think of how to tackle this. And you don't talk about GI bleed as um, bleed as a complication, but how many ml of blood was lost? Was it a bottle of blood so you had to replace and so on? So I'm not going to talk about techniques today because it's going to be in technology and I have about 15 minutes on two aspects of technology. One is the endoscopy aspect, what is happening new in endoscopy in terms of treating bleeds and second is the tools. If I have time, I'll go into the axillaries of the tools, but predominantly my concentration is going to be on endoscopy. Now we've already heard about this uh, new endoscopy system, it's called the X1. Uh, it actually it's X, I, or Z, you know, because that sounds like the Chinese premier. We, they are very particular about calling it X1. Now, X1 uh, is a new technology, which again, I have a disclosure here. I think other companies like Fuji or Pentax have equivalent scopes. I'm not sure because we have been using only this for, for a long time now. We've been using X1 uh, for maybe a year now, and we've had a lot of experience with this. And also, we published a lot in this area. So, my concentration is going to be biased on this. And already Randi talked to you about the TXI. There are two important modes you must know on this, the TXI mode and the RDA mode. What I'm going to concentrate is the RDA mode, so-called red dichromatic image, which becomes very important. I'll show you why it's so important. And before I start, how many are using X1 in this room? Nobody. I think what's happening to Olympus, sir? They're not sold it to anybody here? No, no. Oh, that's uh, so that means I'll have to talk a little slowly in this area. Naresh? So I'll be. Uh -huh. <laughs> so I think uh, we'll, we'll go a little slowly on this area. Uh, so I won't then talk about access. I'll talk only about endoscope because it becomes important. So the new functions, which I think again um, uh, he told you about uh, Randir. I'm going to concentrate only on red diachromatic image. In fact, when it was first introduced in Japan, 
it is called the dual red imaging because two red images were there. Uh, these dual red images were actually amber and red because the wavelengths of amber and red are 600 and 630. They go deep into the tissue, get absorbed by the blood. So that's why it's called the dual red image. You can visualize deep blood vessels with this. And of course, in acute bleeding, it's very useful. And I'll show you examples. Again, EDOF was explained by Randir a lot, so I don't go into this. But this is a very important factor. People don't realize this. But if you have an extended depth of field, you don't have to zoom. The earlier zoom endoscope side, you have to go in. When you're very close, you used to zoom. Now you don't require to do that. Automatically, it adjusts. So this is the advantage of having an EDOF. So you can forget about what it means, what it does. It just means that whether you're far away or whether you're near, your image is going to be very clean. So now coming to this actual endoscope, RDI, red dichromatic imaging, the red and amber are important. Green, they put it because you want to see the superficial part also, but basically you're worried about the red light and the amber light. So there's a difference here. What happens is the amber light, the orange light, it's called amber for the orange light, gets absorbed into the blood. The red light is not absorbed. So the ultimate image which comes is red, which comes out very well. And if there is active bleeding, the orange just to get absorbed in that area to give a little yellowish image you'll see here. This is very interesting and that's the reason why this technology has become important. So you see the penetration depends upon the wavelength of the light. If 600, like the amber or the orange light, it gets absorbed by the blood but goes deep. 630 red light doesn't get absorbed, it reflects. So you see the blood vessels very well in depth. So this is important. So you can see this here that bleeding is occurring. And uh, when we switch on to the dichromatic, red dichromatic imaging, you can see the bleeding point very well. How many are convinced about this? No? Only a few. Okay. So I'll show you better examples later. You're right. You're not very convinced. So uh, in, in RDI, there are two very interesting modes. Mode, when you put the RDI on mode 2, you see deep vessels. It's not useful for bleeding, deep vessels. And I'll show you the utility in a poem case. But when it's actually bleeding, you go into mode 1. Mode 1 is where the amber light gets absorbed in the bleeding area and you see it very clearly. I'll show you these examples very clearly. The other thing that uh, this RDI does it, when you're dissecting, you thought today so many planes had to be seen, the submucosal plane, the muscular plane. The, all these planes are very well defined. The reason why they become well defined is because the blood vessels become well defined. So you see, the submucosal blood vessels are very nicely defined here. And you can see the thick mucosal vessel here, submucosal on the muscle plane. So the muscle plane, the submucosa, the mucosa, very clearly defined because the vessels become prominent. When vessels become prominent when you're dissecting in this mode, then it's extremely useful. So this is another important concept here. And you can see the clear demarcation between the mucosa and the muscular layer because of the thick vessels that are there that can be demarcated. So this is a large series of ESDs, which are helped by using this published from our unit by Zahid. And uh, what he has clearly shown in this large series of cases when you're doing ESDs, compared to what was happening earlier to now, he could stop the bleed much faster. That is the hemostatic time was shorter. The definition of the planes were much, much clearer. And when uh, a problem occurred in terms of a mucosal insertion, you can define it very clearly. So these three points very clearly you could define using uh, this technique. And this is published uh, this year. Uh, another, another report that we published was using this for POEM. So what we did was we asked one of our um, early learners uh, which started doing POEM because what happens with POEM is probably if somebody if expert is doing a poem procedure, then it doesn't make a difference, whatever. You can, you can even do it blindly because it's not a very difficult procedure. But somebody new is starting, then this system makes a lot of difference. So this is Anudeep from our unit who published this. Whereas we compared red dichromatic imaging and white light. And we'll, I'll show you two very nice videos here, which again is published and showing that uh, how it's useful in this case. For example, there's a bleeding point here, which is much more easily made out, but I'll show you in the video here. 
see that uh, there's a deep vessel here which you, we can't see with the white light but when we did um, when we went into this is rdi mode 2 when we went to rdi mode 2 you can see the vessel so what we do is instead of after you inject you see the vessel deep down so instead of cutting on that area we cut beside it so that this uh, see white light doesn't show the vessel but when we go into rdi mode you can see the vessel nicely here so then you make an incision so that it doesn't bleed when you so this is the usefulness of rdi mode 2 whenever you want to give mucosal incision we do rdi 2 we can see the deeper vessels and then we can cut exactly away from this vessel see this vessel there you won't see it with white light but with this we can see and then uh, we can cut away from the vessel. So this is the importance. And you can see the incision here is being made away. And there's absolutely no bleed with this. The second importance of this is this bleed. So whenever we do a myotomy, very often you can get bleed. Like you can't see it very clearly here now. Now we switched on. Now you can see. Now you agree with me that when we switch to RDI mode, this is RDI mode one. You can see very nicely where. So this people agree they can see clearly. Yeah. So Naresh yes, yes, and many hands here. Yeah. So RDA one and RDA two are extremely useful. RDA two for before going a mucosal incision to see the deep results, and RDA one like this. See again, you can see very nice when you go into the RDI mode. You can see the bleeding vessels. It becomes a little yellowish. It's not red. And this is very interesting because um, I was a uh, professor Yagi's unit in Japan. And they were testing out the system. And what they were doing is they were using the system, attaching some electrodes to the endoscopist to see what is the stress level. Whenever they're using white light, the stress levels, whenever they see blood was high. But when they switched on to RDI mode, the stress levels very low. So not only for the patient, but for endoscopist also, probably it uh, saves a few years of life. Because we go on doing this uh, third space procedures after some time, you know, coronary stenosis and those things also come up. So probably. To save the endoscope is also with this. And this was very interesting. So I don't know whether I have time quickly for some. Rajesh? Yeah. Oh, five minutes. Okay. So the tools part, you know, I told, talked to you about the endoscope, but the two parts quickly because I think they form an important component of our armamentarium. And what has happened in this area is the dramatic advances that have occurred in stent technology. So many stents here. I just put them here for you in the tabular form uh, to show you what. Uh, when they open and how much and all. But very interesting thing is that different clips, they're available from different companies. They have different resolutions and so on, how they are. So basically you have to decide about the cost of the clip, whether the clip is can be reopened and closed, whether it can be rotated. These are the three important factors. If you want to use a clip which is cheap, which, which does not require reopening, like closing, poem, this is the best clip to use. But if you want a clip which you want to be very sure that your place, for example, for a bleed, then you have to use the clip like this, which can be reopened and closed. So the cost factor, of course, is about almost five times the cost of this. So you have to decide based on that. Similarly, depending on where, if you want to put a clip in a very fibrotic, also fibrotic area, then you have to use the clip which is uh, useful for that. But if you want to use a clip which you want to use in a deodinoscope retroflex, then you have. So all these clips have a separate uh, uh, indications where they can be used. But again, there are very specific clips that are coming out. For example, this is a Locado clip, which is designed by Cristiano in Germany. And this is very, very specific for difficult bleeds. If you have a difficult bleed, nothing else is controlling, use this Locado clip and you can very, very often control the bleed. So there's... Similarly, I think um, we have uh, we have been using these Medora clips also quite a lot, which is quite effective. So there are uh, several varieties of clips. So my suggestion is, um, if you have taken pictures, of this, you can actually go back and look at what clips to use when. Get familiarized the clip. Get your technician to get familiarized and just put everything together in this for you. What these different clips mean and uh, um, the rotation, this thing and all that. So if you can have a look at this when you go back. You can, um, you know, see what clips that you should use based upon this. But clips have a limitation. If any named vessel, a clip cannot catch because it's more than two millimeters. So if you have name for a blood vessel, you can't catch it with the clip. So left gastric artery or gastroduodenal artery, you can't catch with the clip because they're more than two millimeters. And here, 
the Vesco clip comes in, and I think um, Amit again showed some examples of this, but now very often used in uh, bleeds, uh, GI bleeds like this, we're using it quite a lot and very effective. So get used to the phenomena that you might have to use this over the scope clip for bleeds. And here, padlock clip is not useful, only Ovesco is useful. But, uh, you can see that it's quite effective. And I'll show you another example where we use the standard clips. We couldn't control the bleed with this. And then when once you use the Ovesco clip, it controls the bleed. So this is the clip which are, which are using a lot. In fact, there are now some recommendations from some, some of the societies to use Ovesco as the first choice, but the problem for us is of cost. It costs 40, 50,000, you can't use it in all the patients. But this is some of the recommendation based on this study. Very interesting study. Patients with peptic ulcer bleeds were randomized uh, to Ovesco versus standard therapy. You see 57% of them had recurrent bleeds, whereas very small with Ovesco. And those who had recurrent bleeds were converted into over the scope clip and they could uh, close. So this is another important device for GI bleeds. The third important device, again, everybody must know about this. If you're going to do third space endoscopy, kindly know about this. This is Co-op Graspers, which is available for Molumpus now. This is, without this device, you can't do your third space endoscopy. If you're doing that, and get familiar with the two types, the upper GI type and the lower GI type. Uh, because what we normally use in esophagus is the lower GI type also. The upper GI is usually for gastric lesions. They have same French strength, but the sheath length is different and the opening is different. You can see here there's only four, mill four millimeters opening. Both are rotatable. The lower GI is more rotatable and smaller. That's the reason why we use it more often in all our poems and so on. So this is, this is the one you must have with you. You must keep with you, use it as much. The other companies are coming up with clutch cutter, and just I'll show you a picture of all these four varieties. This is the co-op grasper, which you commonly use. Uh, there are three others which are available, SP knife. Now it's not easy to get it. Clutch clutter is another one that's also available. So among this, of course, we have more experience with this, and this is something you must get used to. Because let me show you an example. You cut in a poem, myotomy, you get. So cap is one important axillary. You Your cap is... Uh, going to the bleeding area, you stop the bleed, and then put water jet, and then co-op grasper. So, so three important components, water jet endoscope, cap, and co-op grasper. You have this, you can control all the bleeds. That's very important. And this is again, very shortly, just show you one small clip. And this is again uh, from Zahir, my colleague, who has actually made it up that you can see that if you have, when you're doing an EST, a small vessel less than two millimeters, use the same device as you're doing the EST. You can uh, use an IT knife, you can use a TT knife or whatever you're using, same device with a setting of 50 watts, swift co you can stop the bleed. But if you have a larger vessels, more than two millimeters, always go to co-op co grasper or coagulation forceps. There you use a little higher wattage, 80 watts. So these settings, again, very easy. Familiarize yourself, it becomes easy. So this is just to show you newer devices like Dopplers and all are coming. But I think it's very important that you have all this technology, all these techniques, but one must know how to use this. But again, the emphasis is that uh, it all depends on the endoscopist and the environment. That uh, all of you are planning to go into third space endoscopies, get familiar with all these devices, but also get familiar with how to use them in what circumstances. Thank you. So thank you, Dr. Reddy, sir. And I think we are on time. We are 10 minutes delayed because my lecture is for 10 minutes. Our plan was to close this meeting by 8.30 and just bear with me for 10 minutes and then we'll open for the dinner. Yeah, so your, everything is there. So I'm going to talk about endocytoscopy. And... Uh, the agenda of my talk is what is endocytoscopy, how to do endocytoscopy, and how to interpret the endocytoscopy. So endocytoscopy is a novel, ultra high magnification endoscope technique. It provides the in vivo histological diagnosis by using the intraprocedural stains. So you are using the intraprocedural stains, and with the help of endoscopy, you are giving the 
tissue diagnosis like a histopathological diagnosis. So they're the fourth generation of the endocytoscope started in 2003. And the fourth generation endocytoscope was launched in 2015, which we have demonstrated today. And the feature of this, it has an integrated single lens and you can do the zoom up to 525, 520 magnification. Now, the advantage of endocytoscope, you can do routine upper GI endoscopy. You can do, you can do the uh, NBI and you can do the endocytoscopy. So this one scope has features. It is same, the diameter of upper GI and the colon is also of the same diameter. So with that, you can do the routine endoscopy, you can do the NBI, and with the liver, you can do the histopathological diagnosis. Only thing you have to do the uh, stains, that is the dual stain, CM staining you have to do, and total procedure time is 15 to 20 minutes. What is the focus depth of endocytoscope? You know, there is an elevator we were showing and I'm going to show in the next diagram. It examined the histopathology up to 35 mu m. So interpretation of the endocytoscope give the structural as well as nuclear atypia. What are the changes in the superficial mucosa as well as in the nucleus, which we see during the biopsy? But if you use the NBI along with this, then it can give the idea about the depth of penetration. Otherwise, along with the only with the endocytoscope, you cannot give the depth of penetration, depth of invasion. You can only talk about is it malignant or it is non-malignant. So how to do endocytoscopy? I think it has been shown during the procedure. What you require is a black silicon soft cap and it should be around two millimeter between the lens and the cap. And it has shown in the studies that oblique cap is better in comparison to the uh, rounded black cap. And what are the CM solutions? CM means crystal violet and methylene blue. The crystal violet is in 0 0.05 crystal violet, which is around 10 ml and 1%, 1 ml methylene blue you combine in one jar and you take one cc and you make around 10, uh, 10 syringe of that. And the purpose of methylene blue is to stain the nuclei. It gives the pinkish color and the crystal violet stain the cytoplasm as well as both nuclei. So after making 11 solution, you make the 1, 1 ml of the syringe and each time you have to inject or you have to spray 1 ml of the CM dye. So this is, you see, what has been seen in the histopathology, that is the HE stain, and what we have seen with the CM stain, it is corresponding with the histopathology. So the purpose of CM stain is to obtain the similar image like histopathology. Crystal violet and methylene blue, they stain both cytoplasm as a nucleus. So what is the procedure? You do a standard endoscopy, locate the area of interest. Was one of the most important thing, wash with around 15 to 20 or 50 ml of the water, remove the mucus, and suck out that water. Because if you, with the water, if you uh, spray the stain, it is going to be diluted and spray the solution around one cc every time. So clean it. Once you clean it, then you suck out the remaining water and then you spray the CM solution. The important thing is each time you uh, inject around one cc and you can inject twice or thrice or you can spray rather than inject, you can spray uh, one cc or two to three times. So this entire procedure is going to take five to seven minutes. And once you have sprayed, so this is the methylene blue and the crystal violet, which we are spraying like this. And you wait for one to three minutes. Don't delay the examination time more than five to seven minutes. And once you have done the two important point, you just contact the scope with the disease portion and pull the liver up and you can see the examination. So this is a recently done case and you can see the enlarged nucleus, which is correspond with the adenoma. So this is the elevator, which I'm talking on the left side, the zoom is elevator is up, which is a normal a conventional endoscope. Once you do an NBI with the magnification, you make it up to middle and complete when you do it, give the 520 like a histopathology. So I think this is the simplest technique. If I talk about endoscopy, the problem is with the cost of the scope rather than the technique. You just have to take the scope or in touch and elevate it down and it gives the magnification. So it doesn't require any expertise or so. And how to interrupt, uh, interpret it? So just to say, you can see the nuclei in the center as well as the cytoplasm. So in the normal, you see the regularly arranged large rhomboid shaped cells 
and the nuclei are uniform. If there is an inflammation, this rhomboid shape converted into the oval shape sometime or they become rounded rather than rhomboid and the nuclei in the uniform form. But once you see the intraepithelial neoplasia, what happened is the density of the cellular density increase, elevates nuclei, either they become small or they are crowded or they become enlarged. And once you see the malignancy, the nuclear cytoplasmic ratio change, nuclei shifted to the top and the cytoplasm become more dense. So this is the classification EC1, AB and EC2 and EC3. So this is the changes. Density of the nucleus keep on increasing as the malignancy goes up. You can see the nuclei density goes up. The size of the nucleus goes up, increase the size of nucleus and the cell shape, which was rhomboid to the rounded and then you started seeing the crowding. So this is a very basic. And if you go to the histopathological department, which will give you the idea how it look like. Stomach, I think the endocytoscopy is not very great because it is difficult to stain. So I am also going to omit because of the time, but in the stomach, it is not a very good, but yes, for the colon, it is very useful. And what in the colon you have seen today, hyperplastic polyp, you have got a lumen is serrated. Can you see the lumen is serrated and you see the dense small granules, the nuclei upper like a granules. Once the adenoma happens, the serrated lumen becomes slit light, nuclei become elongated. If you see the video where the nuclei become elongated rather than the round, that is an adenoma. And once there is a carcinoma, the lumen is unclear. You cannot see nuclei enlarge and the cells are distorted. So the advantage of uh, endocytoscope, it can be used in the patient who is on antithrombotic because the age has gone up. So people who are elderly people on antithrombotic drug, it is difficult to take the biopsies. Unnecessary biopsy can be avoided, reducing the burden of pathologist and the time required to get the biopsy is there. In vivo histological diagnosis can be get in 15 minutes. But the limitation is the tissue diagnosis is still must in our country, both for the medical legal purpose as well as for the oncologist colleague. And the stomach has no absorption. Epithelium has difficult to stain. So to summarize, ladies and gentlemen, the endocytoscopy give the 520 times the staining gave us a pathological diagnosis in vivo in 15 minutes time. Single scope can be utilized for all purpose. That is for the conventional endoscopy, for the NBI, as well as pathological diagnosis. The procedure time is only increased by five to seven minutes. Although the data is available, we still need robust evidence as to effectiveness of endocytoscopy to replace the histology. Thank you for the patient's hearing. And if there's any question, I will be happy to reply. And after that, I think the drinks and the bar and the food is open. So if there is no question, I will say we can move on for the uh, dinner. And please join us for the dinner. Thank you. And tomorrow at 8.30 in the morning, the lecture will be started here and the hands-on training in the opposite hall where the, you will be given entire detail. So in the same hotel, uh, 8.30 in the morning, the lecture is going to be started. So my request to all of you, please do come. And I think if you come, it increases the speakers also. Thank you. Teacher said.